there was an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. As their personal objects are possessed by spirits. But that picture turned out to be very evil. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Story eight, take one, marker. We were looking for a house down around in the Taylor area, and we happened to drive by this particular house. And my husband says, now that's the house I'm gonna buy. And I thought, all righty. We had moved from upstate, and my parents had drove by the house and like fell in love with it, and it was for sale. I remember that. Um, the yard was really big. I remember being very excited because, you know, we're gonna have our own rooms. Gloria's husband sold the family business in order to buy the house. It was our dream home. Uh, it's what we've always wanted. It was so big and, you know, with all the oak and the, you know, decorations, it was just gorgeous, you know. You would expect a house to almost have a personality or feel welcoming, like, yay, we're home. But it was just open and cold. And do you know that feeling of you want to feel warm at home? It, it didn't feel like that. Shortly after moving in, Gloria became aware that the house was not quite the dream home they had hoped for. You know, I start noticing a lot of unusual stuff then, you know. There were so many little things that you pay no attention to, with doors slamming, pictures flying off the wall. I'd go outside to get the mail, which was out on the road, and I'd come back and my door would be locked. I would hear boxes being drug across the floor in the basement. That was scary. Clothes would just disappear. They're not gonna just disappear, but we would never find it again. You know, get undressed at night, lay your clothes on the bed, and get up in the morning, you're gonna wear the same outfit or something, and it would be, a piece of it would be gone. These small incidents proved to be the start of an escalating pattern. And this one incident, when we were in the living room watching TV. I remember very clearly that night watching Christmas cartoons in the living room. And we had a large dog. And she was as calm as could be. And she just started barking and ran to the kitchen door. All her hair was sticking up. She was growling. She was barking. She just kept barking. And I could hear footsteps coming up the steps. So you knew it had to be something. I kept saying, I know someone's out there. Don't come any closer. It, it, and it seemed to go on forever. The barking and the growling and the noises was horrifying. And my mom got my dad's gun. And they just got closer and closer. And you could hear something like squishing, like your feet moving on the bottom step. Like you could hear it, and then you could hear it come up. You could hear steps, you could hear movement. I seen the handle on the door turning. I was just petrified. I just said, I am going to shoot. And it just stopped. And the police came, but they came around to the back door. Guns drawn, opened the door, went up. There was nothing nowhere. And I said, I'm telling you, I, I know what I heard. And the kids heard it, you know. That was one of my worst experiences. This is all real, and you can't escape this. 
As one strange event happened after another, Gloria became more and more fearful. I always felt I was being watched. I always thought there was some somebody around. I started to get really afraid, and I just felt I was being watched all the time. The family continued to experience paranormal phenomena in their home. One of the um, scarier things that happened to me when I was a teenager was I was in my room doing my homework, and I was had my back to my, you know, to the door, and. I heard the most god-awful voice say my name. It was deep and it was guttural and I didn't know what to do. I froze because to get out of my bedroom, I knew there's my bedroom, there's the steps, but that thing was right outside my bedroom door and I had no choice but to run through it because I was trapped in that room, and it was horrifying. It was literally like ice that I had to run. And I ran downstairs, and I ran all the way through, and my mom was in the kitchen, and she's like, what, what happened? And I was just shaking, and I told her what happened, what I heard, and it, she just said, you know, calm down, it'll be okay, and she went back in the kitchen, and she could hear it upstairs laughing. It was horrifying. It was just one of the most scary moments that I remember having in that house. I told my husband, I just want to leave. It's getting, it's getting like you could feel suffocating. The kids are fighting, you know, stuff is being moved. I mean, but he said, you can't leave. I mean, we can't leave at your house. I mean, you can't just leave your house, you know. The family had no idea what was causing the terrifying events until some renovations unearthed a haunting picture. This discovery seemed to only make things worse. There was a really big glass porch on this house, and so we were gonna finally tear up the old linoleum that was on the porch and just have it the natural wood that was there. So we started tearing it up. I just remember her finding this picture and I remember hating it I mean it was horrible these people are it was an older couple and they just looked so angry and the feeling you got from the picture was just that they hated you spirits initially like the idea of being present whether it's to a, a painting that they've had they've owned something that they've liked so these spirits will make a connection and they'll stay with that photo they'll stay with that object my husband really liked the picture. So I, we were into antiques and everything, you know. So we got an old antique frame and framed it and put it in the dining room. And I just remember the feeling from that picture literally was like people were staring at you and not in a good way. They were angry. My cousin extremely hated it. He hated it. He never wanted to look at it. He never wanted to see it. It flew off the wall and hit him right in the arm. And, and it would have been about four to five feet. I mean, so it didn't fall off the nail. It actually flew and hit my nephew in the shoulder. In the basement, there was what they would call a root cellar. It had this really weird writing all over the walls. It was just so creepy in there. And I told my husband, I really am worried about that root cellar over there, you know, because the basement's big. So he would close it, and it would open up. So he said, well, maybe it's crooked on the hinge or something. So he nailed it shut. And then I said, I'm still scared down here. So we had a an old uh, car seat like a fo out of a Ford van or something. So he pushed that right up there real tight. He says, now no one's gonna move this. The next, you know, my mom go down there, do laundry, and it's standing open. At that point, you can't ignore it. There's something definitely going on in that house. So then 
on that on that seat, I, I would always, if I seen any cardboard, uh, you know, of a nice size that would be good for a back of a picture, I would stack it on that seat. So I had about maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 pieces of clear different size cardboards. And I was down there looking one day for to put on a picture, and lo and behold, there's a picture. It was a picture of a woman, and then on the another one, it was an picture of a baby's head, but I mean, it was obviously not a picture because it's in a weird angle. I mean, they're not pictures by any sense. It's a really odd uh, manifestation of spirit. And these were all clear the day before, the night before, the months before. The family became convinced that the picture itself was haunted and was the source of the problems in their home. I can remember Beth saying, um, she says, living here is like being in hell. Living in this house is like hell. And the minute she said it, the whole house smelled like earth, just like must and earth. The discovery of a haunted picture had escalated a series of paranormal events, terrifying the Kolashinsky family in their own home. As a teenager, I truly felt it was like living in hell. And the minute she said it, the whole house smelled like earth. Just like must and earth. I was thinking like a grave in my mind, you know, just that earthy, musty, nasty smell. It was everywhere in the closets, in the bathrooms. Just you could smell it. And and I says, take it back, take it back, take it back, take it back. Whatever you, she's, and she says, oh, fine, fine, you know. She says, I take it back, it's not like living in hell, you know, and immediately the smell went away and it was just a regular house again. This friend of mine said, why don't you come to ceramics class with me? It's a blessing I did, because whilst I was there, this one lady came forward and she said, she knows her friend is a, is a really good psychic. She deals with cleansing houses. That's what she does if it's really bad. And she said, well, I'll ask her if she would be interested. And um, then I talked to her on the phone at great lengths and just told her some of the stuff. And she said, there's no way you can go through all this on the phone. She said, you definitely need help. She said, oh my God, the life you're living is horrible. She made arrangements to come to the house. And on that particular day when she come to the house, we thought we heard something in the basement and the psychic wasn't there yet. And I told my nephew, go downstairs and see what's going on. So he went down to see. And he says, there's nothing down here. So I went down there with my daughter. Just like that, the entire basement filled with swirling and swirling smoke. I can't take anymore. I can't do this anymore. The psychic arrived and immediately started work. She came and cleansed the home. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other. One of the things the psychic told me when she was there at the cleansing, that the woman, that I always heard the dragging of the boxes, that was the previous owner. 
she was an older woman and she died out in our yard, out in the yard, but we didn't know, but she was out in her garden and she died. And she didn't want to leave her house. She had to tell her where to go to the other side that she was no longer alive and this was no longer her house. When a house is being purified, the sage prominently is a cleansing of energy, a cleansing of that spirit's mind to let it know everything's okay. And that incense, that smell, that burn helps to remove that negative energy out of the room in order for the spirit to move forward. And at the end of the cleansing, that picture that was hanging there, that chalk picture was in the dining room with us, which was black and white. The eyes on those people turned blue. And they weren't angry anymore. They just looked like people, like old people, you know, in a picture. And the whole house, after she blessed it and was getting ready to leave, you could just feel like a weight had been lifted. And the house just looked bigger and felt bigger. And our lives changed after that for the better. It's one thing for spirits to possess a creepy old photograph, but a high-performance automobile? Story seven, roll one. I grew up in, in Brooklyn, New York. I started working for um, Port Authority Police. And then after I retired, I moved to Homestead, Florida. I always wanted to live in a rural area, uh, you know, peace and quiet, the whole thing. And I've always wanted to get um, to get an IROC. I saw it on Craigslist. I actually saw that, that, that somebody in Port Charlotte had it. This is like kismet. I got to get my car. So I bought the car from him. The first thing I did was clean it. It was clean, but I said, you know what? It's not Henry clean. It makes you feel young, you know? It's like you feel like you felt when you were a kid. Henry's life was perfect. He had the home of his dreams and his most beloved possession, his car. But everything was about to change. The first time it happened, and I started like dozing off a little bit on and off. Then I started like hearing stuff outside. And at first I thought it might have been animals, but then I started like hearing like rattling, like something like I thought somebody was breaking into the car. So so I started getting panicky a couple of times I went outside with my gun. But I didn't see anything. This set off a chain of events for Henry. I kept on like hearing noises. I said, you know what? I'm not even gonna pay attention to this because it's gonna eventually go away. Actually, first I thought it might have been uh, might have been somebody that is on my property, like, but then I said it can't be because there is this a, a large separation between each property. So it's like it's no no way anybody could get into my in my property. So I, that that started making me more worried. I met Henry at a diner where close to our area that we live at. We just started talking, we clicked. Keep on talking out in the parking lot. Three hours later, we're still talking, and it took off from there. I took her to my house, and I showed it to her. I was like really proud of my car. And I showed it to her, and she liked it, because when she was young, she had a Camaro too, a white one. I remember we, uh, he had told me about it before I'd actually seen it. And even then, he was very excited about the car. He had said that he thought he was very lucky to have found it. Uh, he would always leave really, really early in the morning to the gym, like 6 a.m. And I would stay in his, uh, in the bedroom sleeping because I was like not gonna get up at six. And a couple of times, um, I thought I would hear him coming into the house, but through the back. As a matter of fact, it was kind of those noises that kind of woke me up in a way. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. <sighs> Henry.
Henry Pelliser had been experiencing mysterious incidents in his home, but had not yet shared them with his new girlfriend. A couple of times, um, I thought I would hear him coming into the house, but through the back. As a matter of fact, there's kind of those noises that kind of woke me up in a way. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. Nobody gets in. The whole yard is fenced, and the front, he's got a, a six foot concrete fence with iron gates. There's no access to the property unless somebody actually lets you into the property. The second time, you know, that that happened, about a week later, uh, that's when I said, OK, this is really unusual. I was embarrassed to tell her that I heard it before, too. I didn't want her to think that, that she, she got together with a loon, you know? Then actually, once, uh, about a month after we met, I went to his house, and it's very quiet. And I heard the dogs barking on this side of the house, which is adjacent to where the car was parked. And I look and, you know, like when you just woke up and you're like, I'm looking and looking around, I don't see anything. And then I'm like, you know, I'm thinking, did I just see something like move in the front? As you actually saw the outline of somebody in the front seat of the car. And I said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And I remember he looked at me like, yeah. And then I panicked. I said, oh, shit, somebody's stealing my car. <laughs> so I started getting panicky. And there was somebody actually from the car, like staring at me, like pissed, looking dead at me. It was all in black and like really long, dark hair, staring at me like it wanted to rip me apart. But it was one of those things that we both were looking at the same thing at the same time. So it wasn't like my imagination or hers. So now it actually validated it. I thought maybe somehow or other there's something paranormal tied into the experience. It was the first time they had witnessed something together, and things were only going to get worse. He had told me how he had purchased a particular sound system for the car. And took it to, to this place to have, it, uh, to have it all connected. I remember it was on a Saturday that we did that. And then the next morning, he gets up and he goes in the car. The wires were ripped out of the car. And we said, OK, let's take it back. Let's take it back to this place. And my mechanic, the guy that I took it to, when he was connecting it, he told me that he felt like it was somebody behind him. And he would talk, talk, you know, like y'all, the guy, thinking it was one of his guys, you know, to get away. And he would look, he told me that he would look back, was nobody there. And he would like feel like a like somebody pushing him. And then after that, he has fixed it. He told us, Henry, you're on your own. There's something weird about this car. People don't understand, you know, how can spirit hang on to something so tightly when, you know, they're just a breeze. Why, why can that happen? But it's an energy, it's a physical manifestation of energy that takes place. So far, whatever was haunting Henry's car had mostly stayed in the car. But that was about to change. It was gradually increasing from moving from the back into the house to distant noises, to thumps, to footsteps. Uh, it kept on ratcheting up. So it was kind of building up the intensity where, OK, this just not cannot be ignored. And it's just a creepy feeling you get. It was basically, what, nine months after he had bought the house, and there was nobody else in the house. I knew absolutely there was nobody else. 
right next to the back door is a small bathroom. This small bathroom has the only window to the backyard and the carport right there. And I remember I had fallen asleep and I just got up and the light was on in that hallway. So I go up and I open the door. Marlene and Henry had been dealing with an angry spirit haunting their car, but the entity had now started appearing to Marlene in the house. I remember I had fallen asleep, and I just got up, and the light was on in that hallway. So I go up, and I open the door, I couldn't get out that door fast enough. It was like one of those things that you could never forget it, even if you try. She saw something right through the window, like looking at her, intimidating, like, and it, and it looked exactly like what I saw before. That window's far, so far off the ground because of the way that the house sits, that he would have to be at least seven and a half feet or eight feet tall to actually his face to show through the window. <laughs> This is not good. This is not good at all. And I think at that point was when I said, we cannot let this go because this is gonna get much worse if we ignore it. Uh, it's not gonna go away by itself, on the contrary. The experience was so terrifying, Marlene stopped staying over at Henry's house. I started like, we're not even watching TV in the couch anymore. I, start, I started going to my bedroom, and, and I said, I because I have a large flat screen in my, in my bedroom. So I, I started watching TV with the door locked. I said, well, they come through that door, they're not gonna come out the same way. And, and I started like getting comfortable, and I went to put the remote control on the nightstand, and I looked, and there was somebody like staring at me over my bed. Part of my friend, I was freaking scared. And he was just like standing like right, right in front of me, like looking down, like intimidating. At first I thought it was me either like, you know, like something for like a horror movie that maybe you know, your imagination, but I had my eyes open, and I saw it right in front of me, like you're standing right in front of me, right in front of me. And it wasn't like what you normally see, like people say, they know that it's like you could see right through it. I said, no, no, no. That, you could see him. I think when we decided to see if we could get some more information as to who this entity might be. So I got in touch with a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, and I said, I want this person to come. Like, I don't work with nobody that knows me. A psych went over the house, and then he started like getting like this really weird feeling. He went straight to the car and he goes, there's something about this car, and I was like, you know, like, oh, yeah, well, it's an older car. And he, like, circled around it, and he basically, I, after a while, he says, you know, there's something really bad attached to this car. Marlene and Henry at last had confirmation that the entity possessing their car was real. He says, this is a very violent personality because this guy in life was a horrible person. And now after death, he's the same or worse. If that person is very belligerent, very mean, um, depending on what they've done in their life, they will keep that as part of who they are, as a power trip. They'll keep that part and inflict that on someone else because they have the opportunity to conflict more of what they used to do in this world. 
if they can do that in the physical world and leave and go into spirit and do the same thing, they're going to take advantage of it. They will take advantage of it, and they will make that person's life hell. He told me that the car looked like it was stolen, and that guy who took it might have been chased by cops. It could have been like somebody from a motorcycle gang, and then he might have been killed in this particular car. And that he has um, like, a, like a vengeful hold more towards me because I'm an ex-cop. This was just going to get worse if we didn't do anything about it. He did the major blessing on the house and car, anointing of oils, prayers, sage, you name it. Sometimes you, 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 you said, you know what? This is a lot of BS. Mm -mm. I saw it firsthand. This is freaking real. Henry and Marlene were relieved that the car had been cleansed, but the departing spirit had one last trick up its sleeve. Henry and Marlene had cleansed the evil spirit that possessed their car. But the ordeal was not quite over yet. And then sure enough, when I went to start the next day, it wouldn't start. The car would never start again. And no mechanic would ever be able to fix it. And I was like, are you kidding me? And now this car was starting just fine. And I said, are you kidding me? And he goes, it's dead. I, I'm nothing. I said, you sure? It's not working. The next car I get is going to be a 66 Lincoln with the suicide doors. And I'm going to have it cleansed before I take it out of the dealership. Henry Pelliser was tormented by a possessed car. When the Malone family faced demonic attack, a haunted motorbike would be the key to their salvation. Story 24, take one, marker. It was March of 1992, and my husband and I purchased our first home. We were excited to be starting out on our own. It was just a real nice place to, to have our kids grow up and, and, and raise kids and everything. My friends kept teasing, saying, new house, new baby. We said no, and lo and behold, son number three came along. Dave's health was pretty good when we moved in. I would say about a year or two after, it just went from marginal to really bad. Dave had struggled with asthma most of his life, but after the couple's third son was born, Dave's health deteriorated fast. And consequently, I was put on the list for a lung transplant, and I thought I was gonna die. But Dave's illness was not the only thing the family had to worry about. Their new home was holding secrets of its own. My health started to go downhill. I started to have the dreams, and they became more intense. It wasn't any dream. This was a recurring nightmare that Dave had as a child. Now it was haunting him as an adult. I'm not one who scares easy. It made me fear for my life. And it came through the door. It has an odor that's horrible, that's, that's beyond belief. And its breath would just make you want to choke and vomit. Its it, it, skin was all distorted like it was in a fire. It had pressed me down in the bed and tried to strangle me. I woke up really quick. I, I had to stop it. I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I knew what I was seeing. He was yelling in his sleep. He was fighting in his sleep. The demon was coming through from Dave's dreams into his reality. Their home was not a safe place anymore. He was pressed into the bed. 
It looked like a body had laid on top of him and it just weighted him down into the bed. Get out! After that night, we both knew that something sinister was attacking him. <laughs> the family tried to live a normal home life, but they couldn't escape their unwanted visitor. Then I started seeing things that made it crystal clear to me that there was something going on that was more than nightmares. kind of felt like a snake. That was terror. I have no idea how that's possible, but it happened. And I, if it was going to happen, happen to somebody, I didn't want it to happen to my wife, and I didn't want it to happen to my children. Dave got angry, and he decided he wasn't going to let this thing have power over him anymore, and he was going to fight it. When he went to sleep that night, I knew what was starting to happen. Cindy heard her husband fighting upstairs. Dave had come face to face with his demon, and he wasn't backing down. He wanted his home back. The thing on the other side of the door tended to do me harm. This thing had grabbed me. So I go running up the steps. Oh my God. And okay? I actually saw him go from being flat on our bed, and then he was airborne. I'm, I'm dreaming all this. This shouldn't materialize into some into reality. I should wake up, and I shouldn't have anything on me. It's a dream. Well, it wasn't. Later that night, Dave woke with pain searing through his upper body. bleeding like a stuck pig and everywhere. He had multiple scratches all over, and they were in threes. What did that to him? Now there was physical evidence of a demonic presence in their home, and Cindy was terrified. But Dave fighting back had an unexpected result. And it stopped. It stopped. There were no more physical attacks. The nightmare stopped. When that person fights and wants to get out of there and wants to get rid of that and, and has that intention of getting out of that situation, that's when the spirit loses its power. Dave's health, he seemed to stabilize. I don't want to say that I won because I don't think there's such a thing as winning. I survived. But it's, it, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning of another chapter that was not a good one. The Malone family had successfully rid their home of an evil entity and were finally living a normal life. But it's, it, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning of another chapter that was not a good one. In September of 2012, our middle son, Zach, passed away. Zach died tragically in their home at the age of 21. I always firmly believed that it was just merely an accident, that he was doing something that he shouldn't have done, but there was always a question out there, was, was he that unhappy that he, that he would have taken his life? While dealing with the loss of Zack, the entity that had lain dormant returned to the house, or so it seemed. Dave came downstairs. He's always been the first one to get up. He starts the coffee. He walked into the kitchen. All the doors were open. I mean, everything, the refrigerator, the, the oven, the boiler. And obviously, that's not a normal thing to walk into. And 
and it was almost like, come on, this can't be happening. We think something, like our minds are starting to play tricks on us or something. I was in the kitchen getting a bowl of cereal, and I went to the one cabinet on the left side of me, and I couldn't find a bowl big enough, so I went to a cabinet directly above me. I said, I don't know, I'm starting to go nuts here because this can't be happening. Oh, the breaking point for me was we came down one morning and all our dining room chairs were stacked on top of the stacked on top of the table. Whether these things were connected to uh, the, the entity from my past, I, I don't know. There was something very sinister going on. You know, even for a normal person, stacking them up like that took some effort. So if whatever this is has the power to do that, then what's it capable of? I did some research, and it led me to people, a group that was called Light Seekers Paranormal Resolutions. They call us, and we come in and try to help the family get their lives back to normal, move spirits on, cross human spirits over, and whatever we really need to do to give the family peace and quiet again in their home. Steve is one of my psychic mediums. Steve can see and talk to spirits. We knew right off the bat that something was definitely amiss here. He felt this deep desire to go over to this motorcycle. My son Zachary's motorcycle, it's a Harley. It was his joy. They didn't have any prior information as to, you know, as far as they knew, that could have been my motorcycle. He was attracted to it. He wasn't sure exactly why at the time. But he said that once he got over to it, he said he had this feeling and emotions coming through him. He kind of opened himself up to where Zachary kind of came to him. And that's when apparently Zachary had said to him to apologize to us about, you know, him doing what he did to leave us. Steve sensed that Zach's spirit had locked on to his beloved motorbike to keep him attached to the family's home. He started speaking, and the words that came out of his mouth were not his anymore. The words that came out of his mouth were sex. Part of me was relieved in the fact that, uh, you know, I, I knew all along that he didn't try to harm himself on purpose. And the only reason that we weren't harmed any more than we already had been was because Zach was the protector of his friends and his family. According to the psychic, the attacks on Dave had stopped because his dead son's spirit was protecting him and his family's home. Didn't want to have him to have to go through that. I wanted that, that bad thing and the evil thing to leave so he could be in peace, you know? He will comfort all our ways places, and he will make your wilderness like this. And that's when we decided it's time to remove this thing, time to get it out of here. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O oh, my mind. He that seeks the Lord. Look unto the rock once he are here. The evil spirit that was here was gone. After this entity has left, we had a cold blast of air 
come through. It was a, it was very, uh, it was a very touching moment, and one that you could physically feel, not just emotionally. When a spirit leaves the room, there'll be a sudden calmness. It's almost like there's no noise in the room. It's just deafening quiet. And I felt a kiss on my cheek. And that was him. That was the most powerful thing I'd ever felt in my life. I mean, I know my son's with me. He'll always be with me. But to know that even on the other side, that he's, he's still got us. I'm good. Haven't had a thing happen to uh, nothing. The only knocks on the door are, you know, kids from the neighborhood knocking on the door, and that's it. That's the way we want to keep it. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. Felt like I wasn't alone. Literally grabbed me and spun in a bang up on the wall. When ghosts are invited into their lives. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Take one. In 1988, I was living with my husband and my one and two year old daughters. We had just left a small basement apartment, so we were pretty excited to be able to move into a, a three bedroom split level house. It was um, kind of like a dream come true at the time. The young family was just settling into their new life when Kat was contacted by someone she hadn't heard from in over a year. Maria was a friend of mine. It just out of the blue, and there was no call display then. I just, the phone rang, and I answered it, and it, it was her. Huh? There was this hysterical person on the other end saying, I need your help. And what really got me was when she said, they're going to kill us. Well, she yeah. arrived on my doorstep with her son. She was a mess, she was disheveled, she was pale. And immediately she's going, I know you don't know me that well, but I always trusted you and I knew that you would help me. So I let her in. She began to open up to me about what had been happening. Maria and Kat sat down to catch up on the past 12 months. But every word that came out of Maria's mouth, Kat found horrifying. What's going on? She said, my husband joined a cult. When Maria got pregnant, her husband made an appalling confession. Halfway through the pregnancy, he said, we have to leave here. I've done something really bad. We have to go. She said, when I had an ultrasound and found out I was having a boy, he promised that boy to the cult as a sacrifice. It took me a while to even process what was being said to me. Maria told Kat she was scared, but didn't really believe she or her baby were in danger. All that changed at her husband's birthday party eight months earlier, just after the baby had been born. They had had a, a birthday party and then she said, I remember hearing my sister screaming, and I'm realizing I'm drugged. He's drugged us. She said, there were these people in my apartment, 
And she said, I remember robes. I remember these black robes. And there was a fight, a physical altercation. <laughs> she told me, I get up. Finally, I can walk, but I'm still really dopey. And she goes, there's this knife in my kitchen sink covered in blood. She goes, and I don't know why, I just started washing this knife. She goes, and then I look over, and my husband's in this industrial garbage bag, and I can see his arm is over, his head hanging out of the garbage bag. His throat had been cut from ear to ear, nearly decapitated him. And she said, I made it back to the couch and passed out. When she woke up, that garbage bag was gone. He was gone. And they found him in a field across from the apartment. She said, people at the funeral home, they're all trying to say, well, he committed suicide. No, he didn't. Maria's brutal tale did not finish with her husband's death. It was just the beginning. She began to tell me that shortly after the funeral, and actually someone called during the funeral and told her, it's not over. We're owed. That baby is ours. He was promised to us, and we want him. And I said, what have you? involved me in. Despite her reservations, Kat felt she had no other option but to invite Maria and her son to move in. It would turn out to be the worst decision of her life. I had no clue what was being brought or, or entering my life or my, my husband's life or most importantly, the lives of my children. Usually people, when they get into the occult, there are attachments that will attach themselves to those individuals. And that individual spirit can move and manifest to another individual. Because you have to remember there's a different level of energy that's playing here, a different mindset that's playing here. And the mindset that I want to take over, the mindset that I want to empower, the mindset that I want to control. And they'll take that opportunity and they'll cause havoc with that person. Shortly after Maria had arrived, um, really some strange things had started happening. Um, I would put the children's toys away before bed. My husband would get up in the morning and the toys would be all out of the chest. And he'd say, what are you doing? Like, why do you always put them away? Someone's gonna trip. And I said, but I did. I did put them away. Life had been completely normal before Maria arrived. Kat now became convinced the strange events were linked to her friend. She feared that by taking Maria in, she had also invited in the spirit of Maria's dead husband. I had hung pictures that I liked. Some of them were very old pictures, I should tell you, so I loved them, but they would be off of the wall. Some of them were smashed on the floor, like someone had just walked by and, and hit them and knocked them off. What was very painful, actually, was finding my wedding picture shredded. The glass was shattered, the picture is shredded. It was the last straw. Reluctantly, Kat told Maria she had to leave. But any hopes that the weird events would stop were soon dashed in brutal fashion. smell arrived in my house. I was in the kitchen between dishes, and I smelled this smell of rot, of decay. And all of a sudden, and I could feel my 
feet being pulled apart. This thing was going to have me. In inviting a troubled friend into her home, Kat Larston had also allowed a malevolent spirit to enter, and it was becoming increasingly violent. The smell arrived in my house. I was in the kitchen between dishes, and I smelled this smell of rot, of decay. And all of a sudden, I felt something against me. I couldn't move. And I could feel my feet being pulled apart. This thing was going to have me. I was trying to call for help, and I couldn't move. My husband saw my hips the next day, and I had bruises, just black. And he said, oh my god, like, did you fall, or what happened? And I said, no, I was, I said I was attacked. I just want to go have a bath. I just want to bathe. But for Kat, nowhere was safe. I feel this hand. It literally, the fingers were on either side of my, the tops of my ears, and it pushes me under the water. <laughs> I remember going, I have to get out of here. To tell him I have to get out, I have to get out. <laughs> I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die here. I remember thinking, oh. just kill me. Just kill me. <laughs> the attack stopped as suddenly as it started. Having just survived one of the most terrifying experiences of her life, Kat tried to block it out of her mind and move on. Hey, Sarge, we got another one here. Another one what here? Several nights later, I had put my children to bed, and I'm trying to watch TV, but I'm thinking about what happened. Kat was confronted by an enormous shadow figure. It literally filled the entire door. Black. This thing was massive. And I'm thinking, oh my god. Oh my god, because I could smell the rot. And it just charged at me. Once again, just as Kat thought she could take no more, the attack suddenly stopped. With her husband away, Kat was terrified of being in the house with just her young daughters. She asked her mother to come over. My mom was coming over. Hi. And so I had this um, big, floral picture I had put up, and I'm standing there talking to my mom, and it just flies off of the wall and smashes. And all of a sudden, 
something's got me. <laughs> Literally grabbed me and spun and then bang up on the wall. And my feet come up off the floor and the nail where the picture is hung, I'm slammed against the wall and it's pulling me down and the nail is gouging my back and my mom is screaming, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? And I said, it's gonna kill me. I was just sobbing, I just said, it's gonna kill me. You have to go, take the girls. I said, just go, just go, it's, it doesn't want you. It wants me. <laughs> and I called my husband at work and they said, I am done, I'm done, I'm done. I can't stay here, I can't live here anymore, I can't do this. I packed up my kids as much as I could grab in a quick amount of time and myself and I left. I went to my mom's. I did call Maria's dad and I said, I need to talk to her. There's more to this, I need to talk to her. And her dad goes, so, you know, this is it. I mean, after today, don't come back. If you come back, what's been happening to you will get worse. When that individual finds out the person that it came from, where the initial um, entry point came in their lives, when they confront that person, they're technically confronting the entity at the same time because that attachment is feeding off them. I don't even recognize the face on this girl, and she's wringing her hands. They said, I'll always love you, but I can't ever see you again. They said, please, before he kills one of my kids, please. This is your problem. I said, you know, you should have never brought this to my home, to me. And I'm thinking maybe it was just a warning to me. Maybe it's over. It was over for Kat. After seeing Maria that final time, the attack stopped, and Kat's family went on to live a normal life. I buried this for nearly 30 years. We don't even talk about it, my husband and I. He was really afraid that I might trigger something by talking to you. Invitations to entities from the dark side are not easily revoked. Once a door is opened, the spirit world has a habit of sticking around. Story 19, take one, marker. After struggling with some health issues, Dustin Terry had been looking for a new and cheaper apartment for him and his son Austin to move into. What attracted me to the building was the location. It was listed and it was fairly cheap in the paper, so I decided to call and check on it. The building looked like your older classic uh, brick building with the old iron gate that still had the old wood that used to be the outside of the um, siding. You know, it's kind of like stepping back in history almost. I did not take my son with me to see the place at all. He actually just kind of got a surprise one day. He thought it was cool because it was so close to grandma, my mom. Yeah, it's less than a five minute walk for him in a nice area. 
I was hoping in this new place for a fresh start, basically. I was downstairs doing a little bit of laundry. The feeling I felt was just like you were being watched. I just blew it off as no big thing. I know there's something there as to what, I don't know. Dustin Terry had just moved into his new apartment when he started feeling like he was not alone. I was downstairs doing a little bit of laundry. The feeling I felt was just like you were being watched. I was actually in the back part of my house. Uh, I was folding my clothes, and it sounded like someone opened my door and started walking into my house. and seeing no one there, it was mainly confused. There's just no way to explain it, really. I did not think about wanting to tell my son anything. I didn't want to bring that to his attention at that young of an age. Dustin had started to feel increasingly paranoid in his home. He didn't want to tell his son Austin about his experiences for fear of frightening him, but the unwanted visitor left him with no choice. I was at home. We were sitting down in the living room, and one can out of the middle fell off. And I'm like, OK, it's nothing. Nothing at all. I pick it up, I put it back up there, I start watching TV, and within 15 minutes again, the same can that I just picked off the floor falls down again. I was still confused. I still didn't want to admit it because I was still along the lines of these are older apartments. I was like, no, it's got to be something that's very explainable. It's, it just has to be. When uh, spirits do things like pushing cans off the shelf repeatedly the same thing or open a door the same thing, it's their sense of letting them know, letting the physical people know I'm still here, I still exist, and that their process is I still can do these things. Dustin put the events out of his mind and tried to get on with his life. His girlfriend of six months started staying over at his apartment. My girlfriend would come over uh, usually once a weekend. I was watching TV. She said that someone just walked in and someone just touched me on my back. So now it's starting to get physical, and now I know I have a major problem on my hands. Worried about a possible intruder, Dustin started searching the rest of the apartment.
She said it was just kind of eerie odd. She just felt a presence, like someone was standing behind her, and she didn't seem too comfortable at that point in time. I know there's something there as to what, I don't know. Dustin decided the strange incidents were putting his son and his girlfriend at risk, and he needed help. I needed to look for someone to come in and do something, so I called in a priest from the Catholic Church in St. Joe. Like, well, I think that a house blessing will help you, and I think we should start one. So I said, okay. So without him knowing about it right away, I grabbed my cell phone and turned on voice record, and I put it in my back pocket just to see. He starts with a couple of prayers, and he's reading from the scriptures as he walks through, and he does the holy water routine in every room. We get back towards the back area, and I noticed when he got back there, he was a little bit hesitant. I kind of monitored when they did leave that they were still pretty much looking around quite a bit. It wasn't like I had his 100% attention. It's like something else had his attention on the side. Dustin was not convinced the blessing had worked. After the priest had left, I decided to take the audio and transfer it over to my laptop. Terry and his young son, Austin, had moved into a new apartment, but so far, it had not been a happy home. <laughs> Dustin felt that someone or something was sharing their space, and he had called in a priest to do a blessing. After the priest had left, I decided to take the audio and transfer it over to my laptop. was talking, it was pretty quiet. You didn't hear anything. But whenever the priest would seem to want to start talking from the scriptures or do any kind of a blessing, when he would stop, there's this very specific And when he starts, it stops. And the minute he stops, it starts back up again. In the name of the Father. Something's talking back to him and doesn't want him here. The Son and the Holy Ghost. After I heard the recording, you know, I I was in a predicament as, do I stay or go? I'm very tired of not feeling comfortable, uh, tired of not knowing if my kid's going to be all right in the middle of the night, or if he has seen more and he's just not telling me because I don't think that's a very good environment for a 12-year-old. It didn't take long for Dustin's doubts about the blessing to be proved correct. One day, me and my son were coming up out of the basement from the laundry room. You hear a whisper again. You know, you can hear some footsteps. And we made it to the stop step. And we stepped onto the carpeting, and there was clearly ch -ch 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 coming up. I didn't want to tell him anything. I just said, let's go.
when you can't see something and you can hear the noise obviously going on, it's very, one of the most scariest things I think I've ever actually really been through. After the footsteps and everything going on, I knew I needed to look for someone to come in and do something. So I reached out to Lori to the Paranormal Society. I could tell in his voice that he was scared, and it, it was a very disturbing experience that he had been having. But the more people that I talked to and found out that I'm not the only one that was having these experiences. Lori and her team started an investigation into the apartment building and spoke with Dustin's neighbors. A lot of these older buildings, like the one Dustin lives in, were motels, and they were converted into, nowadays, apartments. So whatever happened in the motels, you're going to get what is called residual entities that are still there. You're going to get residual feelings, emotions in the building, and it, it's like glue to a wall. A lot of people who cross over are afraid to cross over, and they'll stay here. They'll stay with that opportunity in order to, to fulfill that sensation that they're still alive somehow. I had heard other stories from other people in the building. I figured back in the 1930s and 40s, somebody had opened a portal in there via a Ouija board and brought this thing through it and they did not close off the Ouija board and now these poor people that are in Dustin's building, not only him, have to deal with us. When I first moved in and had these suspicions, I didn't think it'd get this bad, but as it progressed, it got worse and worse. Things like these are tied to the property. It's really, it's hard to get rid of. My best suggestion to Dustin was move when it was financially possible for him to do so, because it'll just stay with the property. The following night, things got even worse. It was well after midnight. I decided to go to bed early. My girlfriend was going to stay up, and uh, she said she gets the weird feeling of someone standing over you being watched. She kind of glances over a little bit, and she says standing behind the curtains is a black mass that's standing there. And she looks down, and she sees dress shoes. That was about the last time she stayed the night. That manipulation of energy is all fear-based. And the more fear that that entity can create, the better it is the chancing of it surviving. It makes me wonder, you know, what is it doing at nighttime when I'm sleeping in bed? Is it standing there watching me? If you're scared, that's energy for them. They take that energy and they feed off of it and they grow on it and they create more havoc. Two days later, I could hear the sound again of somebody walk through, but this time I'm able to, to see that direction. And I can hear someone walk through my house, walk through my living room, and walk into my bathroom, and it walks back out. And instead of hearing a normal close of a door, it's like someone slammed the door. <laughs> Previous occupants of Dustin Terry's home had opened a portal to the spirit world and invited evil into his apartment block. Now he had to deal with the terrifying consequences. I can hear someone walk through my house, walk through my living room, and walk into my bathroom, and it walks back out. And instead of hearing a normal close of a door, it's like someone slammed the door. I was done. I was literally done. I got up. It must have been 12, 31 o'clock. I grabbed my wallet, my cell phone, 
and I took off walking for the next five hours that night. Now I don't stay at home unless either my son comes over or my girlfriend comes over. I refuse to stay the night in my house alone. For now, Dustin Terry is stuck in his haunted apartment, but can't wait to move out. I spend a lot of my waking moments every day trying to find a different apartment, a different place. Whether spirits are invited into a property through people meddling with the occult or by simple accident, the results can be equally devastating and can affect the victims for years afterwards. Story 9A, take one. I had just moved to Lansing. I transferred from, for work, I transferred from our Detroit office. Nathan was my boss, and uh, we just clicked very well. We started dating just a couple months after we met. A month later, I ended up pregnant. Surprise! He ended up very quickly moving out to Lansing with me. We got the house together, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, so it's important for me to find a house that I feel comfortable in. The house was, it was cute, small house. Four bedrooms, perfect for myself, Nathan, and, you know, Adam, who's one. He liked the house because he had the room to run around, and, you know, he had a pretty good-sized yard for him. Lillian is a practicing Wiccan, and she saged her new home to cleanse it of any negative energy. Being a Wiccan and being a witch, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your family. She would go around the house with it kind of smoldering, and she would have a prayer that she would say. When someone cleanses their house with sage, they're going from room to room to sweeping out the rooms to removing the cobwebs of negative energy. That intention is very powerful, very strong. She knew I came from a Christian background. I was, I guess you would say, typical, closed-minded, you know, about those types of things. And it just always seemed real cheesy to me. Adam started seeing um, a little boy. Him up. You know, he started complaining about it, like, you know, he's just out there and he's watching me. I was playing with Adam, and, and he had brought up the little boy being outside. I knew it wasn't a little boy because our neighbors didn't have little boy children, and our house was kind of far off of the road, so there was really no way. I knew it was a ghost. I knew, I, I right away. And I had asked him, you know, is he scary? Does he, you know, does he frighten you? Does he make you uncomfortable? And he said no, so I told him, I said, well, tell him to come in and play with you. And right away, he said, come on in and, and play. He shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it started creating some really bad problems. When a child invites someone that's their, their play children, you know, that's outside, they're playing in there, they're coming to the house, that spirit will manifest itself into a little boy, a little girl, a little friend. And sooner or later, this, that entity will start ostracizing against the mother and the father. We would play music for Adam when he was going to sleep, and it was always on really soft, and it was up on the dresser where he couldn't reach the, the iPod and the, the little radio it was connected to. We were just laying in bed. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. We were watching TV, and uh, I heard music, and it was like really loud. We had a certain playlist for him, and it would jump off of the playlist, 
into the song, into the artists, go down to a specific artist and play a certain song. It got to the point where it was almost a daily occurrence. I was afraid that it had something to do with, you know, in me inviting the, the ghost or whatever it was in, inside the house. And having been invited in, this entity was only going to get worse. When a negative spirit enters your house, it feeds off of the negativity, not just fear, but off negativity. So it makes people fight inside their homes. There was an incident where we were arguing. Wait! What about you? Hey, Your boy! Nathan Tegardine had inadvertently invited a ghost child into his family's home. His wife Lillian knew immediately that he had made a huge mistake. I started to feel really uneasy. Just about the, the atmosphere of the house had shifted. It went from being a comfortable home um, just to a real uneasy feeling all the time. When a negative spirit enters your house, it feeds off of the negativity, not just fear, but off negativity. So it makes people fight inside their homes. There was an incident where we were arguing. Wait, what about you? Hey, stop. Your boy. It's just something that, again, you can't explain. There was nobody in that direction where the mirror even came from and neither of us owned that mirror. I had never even seen it before, and I had no clue where it came from. She didn't know where it came from. It wasn't anything good. When spirits support things, they take things from their timeline and they manifest it into this world. There is objects that they can manifest, like spoons from 1912, um, forks from shoes to different objects to let you know that they have the ability to move those objects. What do you do in a situation like that? The frightening events were putting an increasing strain on Lillian and Nathan's relationship. We were laying down watching TV and I felt a knock from underneath the bed. And at first, I, I thought it was my imagination because it was a pretty hard hit. At the very end of the bed, she looked down and saw. It had no eyebrows, and his eyes were just completely black. And it's just staring at me. I knew it wasn't good. I knew it wasn't something positive. I knew it was something that couldn't have the best intentions. Causing harm was, was something I was afraid of. I was afraid of that's where it was escalating to. It was getting to the point where it either could cause harm or was going to try to cause harm to somebody. Looking to escape their troubled home, the family decided to relocate. So we ended up moving into a house in Eaton Rapids with another addition to our family, our uh, second son, Caden. It was beautiful. My aunt actually owned it, and we were renting from her. And this was a house that Lily had talked about wanting to live in since we got together. Five bedroom, fenced in backyard, perfect for the kids. So I was really excited. I was pretty confident that that it hadn't followed us. Whatever, whatever it was, was staying, you know, staying put. Nathan could not have been more wrong. Having been invited to join their family, the evil that had been plaguing them started up again. 
Almost immediately after we moved in, I started to experience things. We wanted our younger son, you know, closest to us. His bedroom was right across from ours on the, on the upper level. I think he was crying pretty dramatically, and we went, we went up into the bedroom, and his crib was pulled away from the wall. All the way next to the edge of the closet door. and it didn't matter where I put his crib in the room, it would be dragged towards the closet door. At that point, I would get a really negative feeling being in that room, and I wanted to get out of there. Fearing for the safety of their new baby, Lillian and Nathan decided enough was enough and moved house again. Within a week, I found a house, I put a down payment. We were, we were set to move. It really was hard to have to move out because I, I really did want that house. Since all of that happened, I'm not skeptical at all when it comes to paranormal experiences. When it comes down to it, Nathan's mental well-being is more important than my comfort. I was very happy to, to be away from such a, a negative feeling. Nathan has learned his lesson not to mess around with the spirit world, and so far, their new home has been paranormal free. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. When ghost children come out to play. <laughs> that picture turned out to be very evil. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. purchased our property in 1998, and we tore down the old home place and built ours in September of 99. I quit my job as a draftsman that I had been working for almost 11 years and uh, quit to stay at home and raise my little man. Jeremy was about two years old when he could really start articulating his words. I'd go back and I said, what are you doing, bub? And he said, playing with EY. And I said, who's EY? My friend. And I said, oh, OK. And so I had been told by many friends that had children that they have imaginary friends. I'd be like, OK, what's Eli look like? He has the same color hair as Aunt Tam, which is a natural blonde. My sister's a very blonde blonde. He has eyes your color, so blue eyes, I would assume. He said, and he wears belts on his shoulders. I said. That's pretty descriptive, you know? And he's like, he's my friend. I thought it was a normal result of a only child. But Mandy was about to discover there was nothing ordinary about Eli. That day, my son was at school, and I was home alone, cleaning house, doing my normal mommy chores. <laughs> And I heard this just little laugh. It was plain as day. <laughs> and I 
with, uh, and you know, I'm like, did I just hear that? <laughs> Of course, nothing's there. I didn't know if it was paranormal or if it was my brain. And Mandy's doubts would be tested again just a few nights later. It was a normal weeknight. Uh, my husband was in bed next to me. He was already asleep. My son was in bed. Right in my right ear, on this side of the bed, it would sound like a small child saying, Mommy. I was terrified. And I was just like, what's my son doing up? What's Jeremy doing up? You know, I do the whole, what are you doing awake? And he's not there. I did downplay a lot of it because I just figured that, hey, unless I have concrete evidence, unless I have it in front of me, it doesn't exist. Mandy became more worried when she started to hear adult voices too. On several occasions when I would be at home alone, uh, I would hear what sounded like muffled conversations between a male and a female, almost as in an argument. And I'd hear footsteps down the hallway. Something in my son's room. He had this little toy piano. I would hear her playing music. I felt like I was losing my mind. My husband would come home from work. I would tell him these things and he'd just, you know, roll the eyes and be like, you know what, your son's at school all day, you're alone, your brain's creating these noises. I said, you're probably right. an old German wooden music box. And I'd hear it play. And I'd go in and the lid would be open on my dresser. I know that that lid can't open on its own. You have to open the hinge of the music box to get it to play. Nobody was believing me. My husband just thought I was a nut job. And, um, you know, my son quit having experiences. He was already at the age of where nothing was really happening to him anymore. And I thought, why am I still hearing this stuff? So I was grasping at straws. I was looking for any way to get rid of it. <laughs> Just flashed out one day. Show yourself! Show yourself! There stood a boy, about four or five years old exactly what my son described. I just saw the kid that my son described as Eli. It, 
it just, I'm thinking, there is this possible? Is this even possible? And I, I was so torn with it. I was so scared. So many questions unanswered. Um, I need to know who this kid is. I need to know why he's here and how did he die? Started looking up deed records for the property. The family that lived there in the 1860s and 1870s was in fact the Derenberger family. They had came here from Germany. They had 13 children. Notice five of the children had died on the property from being beat. They had neck and head trauma. Started going through the children's names. Elijah Derenberger. Went by Eli Derenberger. I was floored. I had, um, you know, concrete evidence in front of me of what had actually happened on my property. Child spirits are more likely to stay earthbound after traumatic death, such as a murder, because they're not really sure where they are at the time of death, and it's really difficult for them to cross over. They're not really sure of the process needed. Basically, child spirits are also still looking for their parents. They're looking for their loved ones, and when they cross over um, after a traumatic death like that, they're unable to find their family. So oftentimes, they're wandering and looking for an answer or a solution on where their family is. Dealing with the spirit of little Eli had been traumatic enough for Mandy, but nothing could have prepared her for what happened next. My husband had went to work, son was at school, and I go into the bathroom to get a shower. Joyce had uncovered historical documents that appeared to prove the existence of her son's imaginary friend. Show yourself! But things were about to get worse. I go into the bathroom to get a shower. Spirits knocking stuff off the bathroom shelves. And I just kept getting more fear. Just, I was so scared. I kept, I was praying. I, I was praying to God. I was like, God, just get me through this. And there stands the silhouette of this man. He had a big, tall hat, but he was all black. I throw my hair up in a towel, I throw on some pajama bottoms, and he drove me out of my house that day. When somebody leaves a home or abandons their house because there's a haunting going on, it's possible that the spirit kind of gains power from that situation. Um, at least psychologically, they feel that they've won in that scenario. It's believed that the best thing to do when you have a haunting is to stay in the home, not to surrender your property and your life to the spirit, but to confront that and perform a house blessing and remove the haunting. I went to my friend's house and uh, I was scared. I cried all the way into town. And she said, you need to cleanse. She said, get a hold of Jackie, you need to cleanse ASAP. When I go into a place, sometimes like pictures pop into my head and I just would see like certain things whenever I'd walk through her house. The, the energy just hit you. It was so heavy, and just you could tell that there was 
there was something, you always felt like something was watching you or if you walked around a corner, something was gonna pop out at you. She told me that there was a man. You know, you could tell that that man was not nice. The father was not a good person. That was very stern and ruled with an iron fist. She smudged with the smoke. We went to every room, every corner of the house. And as we moved through the house, it just got heavier and heavier, the energy. And once we moved from the upstairs to the downstairs, I could feel him there. I knew he was down there. And once we got down there, I just wanted to warn him, let him know this is what's, this is what's happening. He's, he's somewhere around here, and he's not happy that he's pissed that we're doing this. I saw this black, the same black wispy mist that I saw in this figure in my bathroom. And the whole time I'm, I'm just saying the Lord's Prayer. I'm saying a prayer over my home. I'm saying a prayer over my son and my husband. I saw it lunge out, like as a hand. I had her help me to yell at it, tell it it's leaving now. And then finally it just... It's like a bubble pops and it just lifts. Everything lifts and it's very light and everything is just gone and quiet. I learned that spirits are very real, that not all spirits are nice. I learned that if you think it's there, you're not crazy. It may be hard to believe, but Mandy got away lightly. At least the ghost of a murdered child in her home did not physically harm Mandy or her family. Frank Madrid cannot say the same of his experience. Sticks. because my dad was in the Navy. We ended up in uh, National City. National City is uh, a city that's close to San Diego, kind of like Victorian houses, but small. And, um, you know, everything there, I remember, was just old. It had a good creep factor to it. One day I was riding my bike, and I saw this little boy of this house that was on the corner. So I just rode over there and said hi to him, and we started talking, and he was kind of lonely and scared. He was very quiet, very introverted. The house that he lived in, all the doors were boarded up. It was kind of strange. We didn't really think anything of it. And then to hear the laughter of this little kid. In 1967, Frank Madrid's family had just moved to a new city. Making friends after you're moving around a lot is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hit and miss. Our father was in the Navy, and we moved around. Um, Frank was born on the other side of the country in uh, Virginia. I had no friends in the neighborhood. One day I was riding my bike, and I saw this little boy of this house that was on the corner. So I just rode over there and said hi to him, and we started talking, and I thought he was a friendly kid. I thought he was kind of lonely and scared for some reason. He was very quiet, very introverted. Said our goodbyes, I went back home. And the next day I'm riding my bike and I see him again, so went over and started talking to him. Our father was gone a lot, and everyone else was younger than he was. So he kind of latched on to the first friend that he could make, wanting so desperately to have somebody 
to socialize with, to play with. Um, you know, I believe it got very intense very quickly. And after a while of talking to him, a few days, you know, he started lightening up and, uh, you know, we'd make each other laugh and, and you know, it was kind of like a normal child relationship, you know, we, we would play and laugh. Frank enjoyed having a new friend, even one who seemed a little strange. I never saw him pick up anything. He would just use his fingers for guns and stuff. And I had plastic ones. He never would touch those. There were some times where I'd bring some toys over so we could play, but he would never, ever grab any of them. He wouldn't play with them. He just seemed to be kind of scared, not, you know, I think he was, it, it kind of almost kind of seemed like he was afraid that his parents would find out that he was playing with me or my toys. So that's the kind of impression I got from him. But being as young as I was, I really didn't pay attention to it because I didn't want to lose my friend. You know, I didn't want to cause any kind of problems. Nevertheless, it was becoming increasingly obvious to Frank that his new friend had something to hide. You know, you, you get tired and work up a sweat and get hot and thirsty and, you know, just nonchalantly, hey, can I get a drink of water? No. Why can't I have a drink of water? Well, you can't go in the house. Well, why can't I go in the house? Because my parents aren't allowing anybody in the house. I go, well, can you go get me a drink of water? No. Why not? Because I can't go in the house right now. So, you know, this is really confusing to a little kid. You know, I want a drink of water. You won't get it for me. You know, you kind of get a little upset, you know. Well, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to get my own drink of water. The argument over the glass of water had an immediate impact on the boy's friendship. Things did change after that. He was more withdrawn into himself, and he didn't really laugh anymore. We couldn't just have fun like we were having fun before. One day, went over there to play, and, uh, you know, so the first time in a long time, he was excited because he told me, I found something. Well, what'd you find? Well, I found an axe over here. So we went over there, and he showed me where he found this old, small hatchet. And uh, I remember it being just, you know, really old and ancient and, and rusty and just, you know, laying there, half buried in the dirt. He told me, you know, pick it up. Let's go, let's go chop something. I said, no, I'm not going to pick it up. And he kind of got upset, and he was, you know, really forceful. He picked the thing up. Let's go over here and chop some wood. To appease his request, it's like, OK, pick it up. and uh, followed him over to this little log that was laying there. And uh, he's telling me to chop it. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I better not, you know? Why don't you chop it? He goes, I can't. Well, why can't you? I just can't. So I said, all right, I'll chop it. So I got the ax. It was 1967 in National City, California, when young Frank Madrid made a new friend. But his new buddy had started acting very oddly. Why don't you chop it? He goes, I can't. Well, why can't you? I just can't. So I said, all right, I'll chop it. So I got the ax. And The tip of the ax hit the dirt and the gravel and the wood, and I had some gravel fly up into my eye. 
Immediately, everything went white with big globs of red. I ran home screaming because I couldn't see out of my eye anymore. The one thing that I remember that I'll, I won't ever forget was uh, the horrible laughter that he was laughing when I was running home screaming. And that laughter followed me all the way home. When I got home, they, uh, my folks took me to the hospital, and I've had nine major operations on it and four minor ones after that. They didn't have the technology that they do these days, so they really couldn't reattach the retina. The incident left Frank blind in his right eye for the rest of his life. Are you comfortable uh, taking your glasses off and mm -hmm. talking about it? Because I'm. I can't see you, but there I am. So, um, look at this. Plastic. <laughs> when I would hear about Frank's accident, um, it always was centered around this boy on the corner. I mean, there's just so many things that I couldn't understand at the time because I was too young. And you think about, about things that happened. The clothing that he wore, red and white striped shirt, blue jeans rolled up at the cuffs, and the black high top tennis shoes with the white balls on the side. This kid, all the days that I've seen him, those are the same clothes he wore all the time. that he lived in, nobody lives there. It's abandoned. My childhood friend, this kid that nobody else could see but me, was, was a spirit kid. Children haven't been conditioned by their parents or society to not believe in the paranormal. Well, it's part of their reality, basically. Child spirits, when they're dealing with human uh, children, really come across as valid and legitimate. They don't seem to be a spirit, and the children are very open-minded and accepting of them. He was very open to it. He was, I mean, I don't want to use the word desperate because it sounds negative, but in this situation, it makes sense that he was desperate to make a friend to have some kind of companionship there in a place where he knew no, nobody. I think the little boy died in that house, and uh, I think the parents were so distraught about it that they moved away. And his energy is still there, his soul and spirit, however you want to say it. So he went to what was familiar, and what was familiar was that house. I never went back to the house to his house to see if he was there or not. Um, I wanted to stay away from that place. I didn't want nothing to do with him or anything. I mean, that laughter was still in my head, and there was no way that, you know, to this day, I, I can't forget it. Many years later, Frank had another paranormal encounter. It seemed like we had met before. I go to talk to him, and as I'm talking to him, he starts to fade, and I can see through him, and then he just vanishes right before my eyes. Just gone. Very well could be the little boy on the corner as a man. It's possible that the child spirit aged somehow on the other side and returned to visit him to show him that, you know, here I am, I've grown up with you, and it's good to see you again type of scenario. But it's also possible that that child spirit maybe had another spirit go and visit him in an adult form because it was more socially acceptable or understandable. This gentleman was just standing there in the middle of, of the road there and looking directly at Frank there was some knowledge of who he was. Since their childhood friendship was so intense, that there would have been more. If 
the axe incident was intentional, I would expect that person to say, gotcha. And if it was unintentional, and if it was just a fluke, then I would also expect to say, I'm really sorry that that happened to you, and not just faded away as he got close. There's just too much unfinished business there. That's kind of an evil thing to do. Frank will never forget this episode of his life. His injury reminds him of his ghostly friend every day. When people tell you ghosts can't hurt you, they can cause an effect harm to you. That'll haunt me as for as you know as long as I live. It's just something like that. The presence of the spirits of dead children should never be ignored. They are often the first sign that a portal to the spirit world has been opened. My husband had lost his job due to a back injury. I was diagnosed a long time ago with Crohn's disease, but I'd gotten really sick, couldn't work anymore. We needed a place to stay, so we decided we'd take the house. It used to be uh, what they called veterans housing. We had our first son together. His name is Jordan. When we moved into the house, the first thing I remember is we couldn't get our mattress up the stairs. Um, it was too narrow of an area. We had to sleep all on the sofa bed. I woke up to smelling like flowers, like roses. I'm a Christian. And it was always said that if you smell flowers or roses, it could be the Holy Spirit. So I tried to maybe think it was something like that, but it didn't feel uh, refreshing because it smelled more like when you go to a funeral home like death. It reminded me of death. It was very uneasy. Um, it was uneasy that I made the statement all the time that I don't feel like this is our home. I can't put my finger on, I just couldn't figure it out what it was about the house. The family had not been living in the house long before Don noticed Jordan was displaying some disturbing behavior. Jordan was playing on the stairs inside the hallway at the bottom of the stairs was a rocking chair. Jordan got in the chair and would swing back and forth and say, baby hurt, baby hurt, baby hurt, baby hurt, over and over again. And I'd say, Jordan, what do you mean by that? Baby hurt, baby hurt. And he said, the baby got hurt. And he said, yeah, there's a little girl standing there at the top of the stairs. and I had no idea what he was talking about. Baby hug, baby hug. And I said, uh, I don't see her. He said, look, Mama, there's Allie. Allie was my neighbor's daughter that passed away. I had heard about my neighbor's daughter probably about a month after living there. She had died at four. She was only four years old. It was just some sort of weird virus and medication, but she had died in the house. Jordan did not know who she was or her name. Baby hug, baby hug. There was no way that he knew, but that wasn't the first time he told me things that there was no way he could possibly know. With Jordan's behavior on her mind, Dawn confided in a new friend. She had ended up telling me that she was into witchcraft. She started to say to me, well, maybe if you use tarot cards, you can get some answers. She gave me a book and she gave me the cards. And I took them home and I started playing with them. I would ask questions to the cards. 
I just kept wondering if, you know, he was really seeing Allie, what he was really seeing. It can be dangerous for people to use spiritual divination tools such as tarot if they don't have the knowledge or know-how and, and how to use these items. You can open doorways, um, hauntings can begin, entities can come through and actually attach themselves to the people that are using these tools. Dawn's dabbling with the tarot cards seemed to make the situation worse. With Jordan, his room was very uncomfortable for everybody. Nobody could stay in that room. Jordan didn't want to sleep in that room. One time he told me he saw our whole family. It was a mother, a son, and a daughter with bullet wounds in their head. And then all of a sudden, all those were gone, and the only one there was one he called the man. Don Pierce's family had moved into a new home and immediately started experiencing paranormal activity. Don's young son had started seeing the ghost of a child. Baby honey, baby honey. Then he started seeing other phantoms in his bedroom. One time he told me he saw a whole family. It was a mother, a son, and a daughter with bullet wounds in their head. And then all of a sudden, all those were gone, and the only one there was one he called the man. And the man wasn't very nice. And the man said some terrible things, and the man told him to tell me horrific things. He says, the man told me to tell you as long as you live here, he's going to keep you sick and make sure you stay sick. My husband's like, why don't you throw a recorder in Jordan's room and see what you get? So I said, okay, that's a good idea. I put the recorder in the room, nobody was home, and I put it on top of a Bible. And when I went and I rewinded my recorder and listened, I heard the worst. I can't even, it, it still plays, it was like the most blood-curdling thing I heard it say. It was just like the most evilest thing I've ever heard. Like it's in, engraved in my brain to this day. It was scary because I'm thinking, what did I do to open these doors? Terrified, Dawn started looking into ways of protecting her family. I just kind of learned about some prayers of protection. And one of them was Psalm 91. My son was taking a bath. And all of a sudden, it was like his eyes looked different, like he looked sinister. And he seemed to get, like, super strong, and it wasn't, it wasn't him. I knew it wasn't him. Walk. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. Sure. So I opened the Bible and I started reading Psalm 91 as I did. He started thrashing around in the tub and he's like, You shut up, you dumb whore, bitch, call me all kinds of names. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me to And eventually it stopped. It might have been just one or two minutes, but it seemed like the, the longest one or two minutes. And when it broke, he started crying and he said, Mommy, Mommy, that wasn't me, that wasn't me. When you're trying to protect your child, you do anything to protect them. But when you can't see or physically feel what's attacking them, you feel hopeless and helpless. At this point, Dawn was desperate to get help for her son. And at that time, that's when I met Joe. She was telling us that she believed that her home was haunted and that her son was seeing things and he was talking to spirits. 
Dawn had mentioned a couple of different smells in the house. Just before a spirit may show up, you will smell um, a flower of some sort, and, and it's usually roses and lilacs. Jordan believed that a little spirit, a little female, was speaking to him. A child could relate to a child spirit. The spirit of the girl that had passed away was trying to come through, and the only way she could get anybody's attention was to go at somebody that was more on her mentality, or more on her wavelength, which would be another child. As the unraveling started and I started asking a bunch of questions, then certain things were like, okay, tarot cards. She had dabbled into a few things and then everything was starting to get put back into perspective. If somebody is playing with tarot cards, they're divination tools. Those are tools to communicate with those that have passed. A lot of times people just play with cards. Every so often, somebody makes a connection and a door does open. We have this thing in, in the paranormal that if, if something comes back, sometimes it can come back two, three times worse than it was originally. It sounded like that's what happened. The game plan was to go find something. If something was there, we would try to pull it out. If not, we'd like to get some sort of evidence, just something to go on to show us that um, there is something supernatural happening in the home. We spent about, I'd say, a good four or five hours of investigating. The very last sequence was in the basement. We set up cameras, we set up our video equipment, we took lots of pictures. I didn't have a good feeling going into the basement. I kind of felt, it's almost like when you have the hair in the back of your neck stand up. It was one of those things and I'm like, you know what? Uh, let's go down here and let's check this out. Initially, I don't like to hit people with prayer right off the bat. I don't want to come off as anybody that's too religious or trying to make something out of nothing. But I felt compelled to pray into the house, in, in, into the basement, and that's what we did. And when Joe had called me about two days later and said, I got something to play for you, you're gonna, you know, it's gonna knock your socks off, basically. At the very end of the tape, just before it ran out, I heard us saying the prayer. Now a house of Christ, and that means that you are no longer welcome here, evil spirit. And you know you must obey our commands. Dawn Pierce's life changed when her son Jordan began seeing the ghost of a child in their home. Run, it's over. Sure. After unsuccessfully trying to get rid of the spirit herself, Dawn called in professional paranormal investigator Joe Citrone. At the very end of the tape, just before it ran out, I heard us saying the prayer. There's now a house of Christ. That means that you are no longer welcome here, evil spirit. And you know you must obey our commands. And right during that time, over what we were saying was a loud growl, a human growl that sounded like a mule being kicked. And you know you must obey our commands. It was just the most god-awful, loud scream like an animal was being tortured. And you know you must obey our commands. It is definitely an inhuman sound that came over that recorder. But I felt relieved because it validated what we've been going through. There is something supernatural happening in the home. 
Not long after Joe had investigated the home, the Pierce family were spending a normal evening together. My husband, me, and Jordan were in my bedroom. My husband was on the computer. I was laying on the bed with Jordan, and I was reading through the Bible, and I started to read it out loud to him. And he started thrashing around on the bed and hitting me and, you know, yelling obscenities. And I yelled, Mark, Mark, come over here, help me. He came over and he was restraining Jordan and he said to me, just keep reading, just keep going. He, he was very strong, and then all of a sudden, he just stopped. Cried, and again, you know, explaining that was not him. And I didn't know what to do with Jordan at that point. I was just sitting there frustrated. And that must be hard for you. You know. Were you blaming your son? I was blaming myself. What did I do to open these doors? I felt like my curiosity maybe opened it, but I knew that there was something there from when we moved in. Things just weren't going to get any better and we had had enough. We spent four years in the house, so there was a lot of different things that happened. He was young at the time, and I thought maybe he would forget, but he still hasn't forgotten. It was my first child, and um, I, I just, I still blame myself because he has problems with PTSD, and you can't tell a psychiatrist he wants to tell somebody why he's the way he is, and instead, he has to deal with medication. He'll be 13. But now he's been back to out on sleeping on the couch. He, he doesn't want to sleep in his own room. After what he's experienced, he wants to go back in my room. He can't sleep without the lights on. Um, he can still hear things. He can't see them. Um, he's become a little bit more closed off, but he's very paranoid, um, very anxious. Um, a lot of anxiety. Um, I thank God that we did move. I didn't want to keep living there and uh, live to be tortured every day. There was an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. As spirits protect the living and their property. My wife would hear voices. There was something definitely going on. They're here to protect our family. If I didn't go through it, I wouldn't believe it. Be prepared to be afraid. Take one, 80 common marks off sticks. I am a single mother of an 11 year old boy. It's always just been the two of us, just me and him. I live in a house and it's been divided into two apartments. I have the upstairs. 
I grew up on the next street and my mother still lives there and like all my childhood memories are there. I love the neighborhood and it's just quiet, calm street, not a lot of traffic. I like it a lot. <laughs> After I signed the lease, I had a really bad dream. And it's one of those dreams that really scares you. <laughs> I dreamt that there was a decapitated girl in the bathtub of the apartment. There was no water in the tub, but she was kind of folded over herself, bent over her knees, down by the drain, and she was blue and dead. In the days before she moved in, Nikki's horrific dream became a recurring nightmare. I kept seeing a dead girl with no head, and I kept thinking about what I was going to do. And I knew I was being irrational. I'm like, oh, there's no way this place is haunted. And I just kind of tried to forget about it, but it stuck with me for at least three or four days. And I moved in. But despite Nikki's best efforts to put it out of her mind, it wasn't long before she started noticing some weird things happening. One day, I went into the bathroom. And um, my towel rack was on the floor. I didn't think anything of it. I, I mean, the screws fell out, so I figured, oh, well, somebody just didn't anchor them properly, or it wasn't very strong. So I just put it back up and forgot about it. Later that day, I was watching TV in the living room. All of a sudden, my pot racks vaulting off the wall into the middle of the kitchen floor. I picked it up and examined it. I tried to put it back on the wall, but the screws were still on the wall. There was no way to get it back on the wall. It didn't fit, it didn't go. You'd have to unscrew the screws to put it back on the wall. It didn't just fall, it flew across the room. I don't have a big kitchen, but it's big enough that it probably went probably five or six feet. Sometimes entities and negative spirits will actually start doing violent or chaotic um, incidences in the household, like throwing items or attacking the family. I believe that they do this to stir up negative energy, such as fear, because that's their energy source. It's something that they feed off of. I'm skeptical of, like, spirits and whatnot. Around this time, a neighbor told Nikki that the previous tenant in her apartment had complained of being haunted. One day, a girl showed up at my front door looking for her mail, and I realized that it was the girl that used to live in my apartment. She told me things used to fall off her walls all the time, the doors would shut, um, that her daughter saw a big and scary man, and sometimes she'd be talking to it, sometimes she'd be screaming. She told me the doorbell would ring. I said, well, that hasn't happened to me. Bye -bye. 
I hadn't mentioned anything to my son, especially about what the neighbors had said and what the previous tenant said, because I don't want to scare him. Um, so I just kind of let it go. Nikki tried to carry on as normal for the sake of her son, but the entity in her home had different ideas. I have an e-cigarette because I quit smoking, and um, I usually have it with me at all times or within reach or I know where it is because I need it. So I had put it on my TV stand and... I think I went to do the dishes or something, and I came back to get it, and it wasn't there. I started looking through the whole apartment. I think I looked for probably a good hour, hour and a half. I started to yell. Probably about 30 seconds to a minute later, it was back on my living room floor, right in the center of my living room floor. And that was a little unnerving. The girl that lived downstairs had lived there for probably about two or three years by then, and she said that they'd gone through probably four or five tenants upstairs in the last two years, so I thought that was a little weird. I think it was probably the next day when the doorbell rang at 11.25 p.m. My heart was like, pounding and I thought, you know, who's going to show up at my house at 11.30 at night? Like, it's crazy. Clayford had been experiencing strange incidents since moving into a new home, culminating in her doorbell ringing late at night. The doorbell rang at 11.25 p.m. My heart was like pounding. I thought, you know, who's gonna show up at my house at 11.30 at night? Like, it's crazy. said, like, who is it? And no answer. So I listened for a good five minutes to hear if somebody was leaving, because you can hear everything. When no one answered, and I knew there was no one there, and it was scary, like, hey, yeah, I am a single mom. It's just me and my kid. That night, I was really scared. There was something definitely going on. So I posted on social media. I basically just asked if anybody had ever experienced living in a place that they thought was haunted or whatever. What did they do? Did they get hell? Like, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, what do you do? I got 450 replies. Someone referred me to a medium, uh, Shannon, and I'm very skeptical about mediums. 
The first thing I do is try and figure out if it's someone who just wants attention. So I made connection with her and spoke with her a little bit. She was pretty freaked out. I would say there was definitely no doubt that she believed something was going on. Shannon immediately picked up on Nikki's fear and confirmed that there was a strong male presence in her apartment. I made a comment about a, the man that was in her home. I asked if there was a path nearby because I felt like he had passed either on a path or on some train tracks nearby. As soon as she said tracks, I just knew it was Rodney. He was murdered about three years ago on train tracks. He was pushing his daughter in her stroller when someone ended up stabbing him and leaving him to die. He was related to my son. Rodney was a distant relative of the family, and it was pure coincidence that Aiden was at the hospital the day he was brought in. I guess my son saw him before he died. When somebody experiences a violent death, such as a murder, um, they're more than likely going to become a human spirit stuck here on Earth, an earthbound spirit, because it's such a traumatic and horrific event. Oftentimes, people don't realize that they've died. They don't realize that they are now in spirit form or that they're not at peace with what's happened to them. They're still trying to understand how it is that they died or you know, maybe even get revenge or resolution and solution on their murder. Worried that Rodney's spirit was unhappy and causing the disturbances, Nikki asked Shannon to perform a cleansing ceremony. I wasn't sure exactly what I was dealing with. I felt there was a negative energy. We had Peterborough Paranormal come as well to help. They brought a lot of equipment. One thing being a ghost box, which I didn't know at the time was pretty much the same thing as a Ouija board, and it can invite things in. And you can hear different voices coming across. It's like a radio when you're switching stations very quickly and you hear different words. When they asked what it wanted, is when it said my son's name. It said murdered. She was pretty freaked out. She was worrying that it meant Aiden was gonna be murdered or that Aiden was gonna murder someone. I mean, hearing those words randomly put together, you come up with a million different things that it could be. So she was definitely very worried. Of course it scared me, like, what are they gonna do to my son? With a better understanding of the presence in her home, Nikki and Shannon carried out a cleansing, which allowed Rodney to communicate directly with the medium. We decided to smudge the apartment. So I used the sage and sweetgrass. And we went around her whole apartment. Rodney told her that he was sticking around because he was scared. He had like an inner turmoil, and um, negative energies will latch on to that. He struggled with, like, drugs, and he had his, his <laughs> demons, I guess you could say, and he was scared that because of some of the things he did in his life, he was going to go to hell. He didn't cross over right at that point. He wasn't ready to go yet.
So before I left, I let her know sometimes it can take multiple times of us coming back to clear a space. I felt a little bit guilty when I left um, because I felt like there was still some energy there. It wasn't something that I felt like I could take care of on my own. I didn't want to tell her exactly what I was feeling. I wanted to wait and, and speak with my daughter um, so that we could figure out exactly what was going on. Without disclosing all of her fears, Shannon advised Nikki to remove Aiden from the apartment as he had been the main focus of the spirit. So I sent him to my mom's. So the next day, as I'm laying down, trying to sleep, I hear like thumping and dragging noises. And it's not just me hearing them. My dog, Lucy, would sit up and stare, and her ears would go up, and she'd be like on high alert, and something wasn't right. <laughs> it was really loud, and so I kind of jumped, and I was like, I thought things were supposed to be better. I'm like freaking out. I'm really scared. I'm all by myself in the house. Even my downstairs neighbor is gone away for the weekend. She's in Niagara Falls. So I am like completely alone in this entire house. I got on the phone and called Shannon. <laughs> I was like, is everything gone? Like, I don't feel right. She's like, well, no. I said, like, is Rodney not gone? Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. Like, what's going on? She said, no, he's gone, but you have other things there. She told me whatever it is, it was invited in and that it is in Aiden's room. She told me to salt the windowsills and then the threshold of the doorway uh, from our front door and across Aiden's doorway so that it can't get out. So I did all that and my son's bedroom door slammed shut. After enlisting the help of a medium, Nikki Playford was desperate to believe her home was now safe. It wasn't long before she was disappointed. My son's bedroom door slammed shut. I went and I opened the door about, I don't know, half a foot. Someone pushes me out of the room and slams the door shut. It felt like someone or something was standing in the doorway, like, blaring at me. And so that really scared me. The only thing I can think of is that Rodney was there to try and protect us from whatever it was. And now that he's not there, it was like full force. Nikki realized that cleansing the home of Rodney's spirit had been a mistake. With his family connection to her son, Aiden, the spirit had been protecting the two of them. The next night, Shannon and her daughter came back because Chelsea is the one that deals with these types of things. Chelsea is definitely more connected to other energies that don't make themselves known to me. When I got to Nikki's, I felt dread. I felt a lot of negative, overwhelming energy. It felt like it wanted to hurt people. It felt like it wanted to hurt me. We don't normally get something that powerful. My daughter and I went into the room together
it was just overwhelming energy. It was heavy. It was like I'd hit a wall and I couldn't take a step forward. I was a little bit shocked because I don't normally deal with that kind of energy. And we were saying the Lord's Prayer, God, our Father. And every time we got to that point, deliver us from evil, every time we said those words, we both got goosebumps through our whole body. And it was just like, like it was, that's what we were dealing with, was evil. And I could see a big black mass. It looked like a bat, but like a man. It was just all black. And there were wings that were with it too. Kind of like a big gargoyle. It was very large and I just felt like it was just right in front of me. And that's when we were calling on like archangels to come and help. We saw, <laughs> it sounds crazy. It's gonna sound crazy. <laughs> but I saw, we saw angels come in and my mom asked me what I'm seeing. And I told her, cause she was seeing the same thing of this angel come in and it, more than one were trying to take this entity out of the room. And it was like a battle. And it's like they were fighting right there in front of us and trying to take what was there out. It wouldn't leave. And then was ripped away and um, was dragged out of the house. And we felt like it was gone. I've never seen a struggle before to take away an energy, and that was fearful for me. This is the worst house clearing we've ever done. We've done lots. That's definitely the worst one. All the activity stopped in my apartment the very next day. It was calm, I wasn't scared. If I didn't go through it, I wouldn't believe it. Protective spirits are often drawn to children. In Nikki's case, it was a deceased relative of her son. For the Rose family, it was their young daughter who would end up needing a spirit protector. I was 25 years old and I was single. I was looking for a house to start a family in. And I uh, found this place and as soon as I walked up to it, I knew it was the place for me. I had to have it. It's a large two-story house, uh, six bedrooms, got an acre of land and three, four buildings in the backyard. And the house was here for over 100 years. Uh, it's really unique property. Before I even bought the house, the owner gave me a key to move stuff in. I had a couch here, and I was sleeping in the living room. I got woke up about 2 o'clock in the morning. I heard all the cabinet doors slam and shut in the kitchen. And I got up and went in there thinking someone was in there. It was Ronnie Rose's first night in his new home, and already he was feeling far from comfortable. There's no one there and all the doors were shut. 
At first, I thought it was an intruder that came in, but upon going in, I was only one room away, so there's no way they could have got out in that time. I just pulled the covers over my head after that and fell asleep till morning, but I was really scared, felt something was in there. The next morning, everything was fine. So I kind of tried to push away, like, you know, maybe I was half asleep. Ronnie tried to convince himself it was all nothing. But whatever had caused the strange incident had other ideas. I started hearing, like, footsteps upstairs when I was alone. And at night, you'd hear stuff dropping on the floor. And sometimes you just get a feeling that someone was there with you, even though you were alone. It was becoming ever more difficult to ignore the worrying events. I was in the house a few weeks at this point. It's really boss, man. Deep purple, keeping it I was in a spare bedroom and I was going in the dresser getting some clothes out. And it was the middle of the day, the window was open, it was sunny. How was the trip? I looked up and I saw a little girl. Probably about five, six years old, wearing a white dress with dark hair. Her back was turned to me, standing in the doorway of the room I was in. I couldn't see her face, but I could just see black hair with a long white dress that almost touched the floor. And she was kind of see-through looking. And then she walked out across the hallway into another bedroom and then just disappeared in the doorway. I started when I saw it, and I just kind of thought I was imagining and tried to push that away because I knew I was alone in the house. I didn't have any children, so it was out of place to me. Ronnie's hopes that it was all a figment of his imagination were dashed when his brother moved in with him. My brother stayed here for a few weeks when he was getting his first apartment. He asked me the next morning, were you in my room last night? And I said, no. He said, you weren't leaning over my bed with your face by me. I said, no, I was upstairs sleeping. He described what the man looked like and what he was wearing. The man's probably about six feet tall, gray hair, wearing a white shirt. When he said he saw that, I did believe him. The man that built our house actually died in that bedroom. Along with the house, Ronnie had inherited an album of old photos from the previous owners. I showed a picture of the man that built the house with his four sons, and he instantly pointed to the man in the center of the photo and said, that was the guy I saw last night. I kind of felt a little relieved that someone else that was at this house experienced something and it wasn't someone that I knew. I feel that his presence is here because he built his house, he built the business that was here, he's got a lot of memories here. It's pretty typical for somebody who built or designed a house or is very attached to their home to stay in that home in the afterlife after they've died. They feel some sort of ownership of the house still or that they feel a little bit possessive of it. And oftentimes they'll make themselves known and really establish that this is their house still. Although the incidents were unsettling, Ronnie was determined to get on with his life. I bought the house in hopes of meeting someone, starting a family. I didn't know Candace would be that person. When I first met Ronnie, he did have the house. He lived here for almost a year um, before him and I met. We both had the same ideas on what we wanted in life, family and everything. And after about a month or two, her lease was actually up on her apartment and I told her to move in here.
I really loved the house. I loved the age of it. I loved the style of the house and how open it was. And we loved, both of us loved the backyard. We decided to get married eventually and have a family. I never really talked to her about anything that had happened here. Happy to be together, the couple were oblivious to any other activity in their home until Ronnie started chatting with his neighbors. I'm still friendly with the people I bought the house from, and they always told me a story that the old man had buried money somewhere in the house. And there's a little room in the basement that he had built to make wine in, and there's a little bump out in the foundation on the wall, like a shelf that's about two feet wide by six feet. It seemed like a really odd thing to be there, so I broke out the concrete and started digging to see if I could find anything. Not even knowing if the story is true or not, but just trying to check it out. And uh, my wife Candace was with me at the time. And we were down there for about a half hour, breaking the concrete and digging a hole out. All of a sudden, we felt really overbearing presence, like something wanted us out of there. Learning that the man who built his house had hidden some treasure in the property, Ronnie Rose set about investigating a strange section of the wall in the basement. And we were down there for about a half hour, breaking the concrete and digging a hole out. All of a sudden, we felt really overbearing presence, like something wanted us out of there. It's very overwhelming when you're in that area. Uh, you just immediately feel like something is right there with you. They are really trying to tell you you are not supposed to be here. It's just a really unnerving feeling like someone was angry with us and wanted us to be away and stop doing what we were doing in that spot. We decided we better stop doing this and went upstairs. Sometimes spirits will stay here on Earth because they have unresolved issues, such as feeling um, possessive or needing to guard a certain item. So say if somebody buried cash or money in the basement, that spirit will still feel possessive of that item. They will feel the need to protect it and guard against that so that other people will not discover the item. The rest of the night, no matter where we were in the house, there's always a, a strong presence that was scaring us the rest of the night. Whenever I go near that spot, even if it's it's nothing to do with digging the hole or anything. I, I start feeling a presence around me, no matter what time of day or night it is. Ronnie and Candace took the hint and never tried to open the wall again. Shortly after the basement incident, Candace gave birth to their first child. Things progressively got stronger after we had Kaylee. At night, putting our daughter to bed in her room, my wife would hear voices, like a woman's voice whispering in her ear when she was sitting in the rocking chair at night. I would fall asleep rocking her, and somebody was always standing behind her door. And when I drifted off to sleep, I would be awoken by a whisper, and I could tell it was a little girl's whisper. And I couldn't make out what she was saying to me, but I could tell that she was trying to talk. Ronnie could not shake the nagging fear that his family might be at risk. After my daughter was a few months old, she would always wake up around the same time in the middle of the night crying, and when he'd walk in a room, he'd get a really strange feeling that someone was in there. It was, it was scary. We decided to get a baby monitor to listen, and we'd hear whispers in there.
Candace went back to bed, hoping it was an isolated incident. Until one night. We were in our bedroom. And we'd just be like, did you hear that? And he's like, yeah. I, Ronnie said, yeah, I heard that. Like, you think you're crazy. That was spooky because we had physically hurt it ourselves, but not being removed from it. Like, and you know your kid's in there and you can't take her out of there immediately. And like, there's something in there with her and you don't know, are these things bad? You know, is she gonna be harmed in some way? We got a monitor with a video screen on it. And whenever our daughter would start crying and fussing in the middle of the night, we'd look at it. could see orbs flying all around in a room. And then we'd have to go get her because at this point she was really crying, something was scaring her in there. The couple were almost at their wits end, but then the activity in Kaylee's room stopped and everything went back to normal for a while. When she got older and she could talk, she was always looking at her closet door at night and she always wanted the door to be shut. We asked Kaylee what was bothering her in the room and she was seeing things. A series of unexplained events had plagued Ronnie Rose and his wife Candace in their new home. Now the activity seemed to be focusing on their daughter, Kaylee. We asked Kaylee what was bothering her in her room if she was seeing things. And she would say that she saw red eyes. And she's scary looking because her face looks messed up on the one side. And she always tries to talk to her and be near her, and she's just scary to look at, so she would cry because she didn't know what to do. She didn't know what it was. Kaylee described her as being young, uh, sort of longish hair, and she would always say that her face was messed up, that there was something wrong with her face, and that's what scared her. We are worried for her daughter. We didn't know if Whatever was in there was going to do something to hurt her, or she's going to be traumatized from being scared all the time. So we wanted to find some kind of resolution to it. We decided to have someone come investigate and see if they could back up what we were experiencing. Which prompted us to contact a paranormal investigation team. I called uh, John Griffin. He has a, a paranormal research team, and he came out. Ronnie and Candace. Uh... Uh, called me. Uh, their family was was frightened, specifically more so their daughter. They were really worried about their daughter. We had one of our intuitives volunteered to come and do a walkthrough of the house. He immediately was drawn to the second floor, particularly the daughter's room, and that he saw this little girl with a burnt face. We decided we would do a, uh, a cleansing uh, for their house. It worked for a while. Kaylee told us that the ghost in the room said that after the baby was born, daddy would be here, but mommy won't. Kaylee would come up to Ronnie and she said, daddy, you're gonna be okay, but mommy's not going to be. 
We didn't know what to think when a, a three-year-old is telling us someone that we can't see is telling her these things. We didn't know what to think about it. Ronnie and Candace decided to dig a little deeper into the background of the house. Because of the history of the house, we want to have the property on the historical registry. So we're doing research. We went down uh, to the Historical Society in Schenectady, and we told them where we lived, and the woman instantly said, do you want to find out about the ghost that's there? And we said, we were just trying to find out about the property. How do you know there's a ghost? And for a couple of years before I bought the house, it was vacant, and there was sporadic tenants running the place. And a woman that lived there before me had went down there trying to find out if there was any ghost. We had John and his team come back out, and they investigated some more. John came with, with the psychic. We found that uh, there was a family, um, a mother, a father, and a little girl. The psychic told us that a few blocks from here, there was a fire, probably in the 1920s or 30s. And this little girl had lived at that house. And her father was kind of mean to her, so she liked hanging out at our house with the kids. So she was always over here. And the little girl had actually uh, died in a fire. When she died in the fire, her face was disfigured on one side. And her spirit came to this house because all her memories of good things happening were here. So she felt more at home at this house. It's believed that when you're a spirit, you have free choice. So if you think about the places that you've enjoyed visiting in your lifetime, things that you have fond memories of, spirits oftentimes will go back to a location that they have happy memories of because it brings them peace, it brings them joy. And um, you know they like to go there physically, and so oftentimes these spirits will return to a location they have memories of. The psychic described what the man looked like, and it was the same man in the photo I have. Could this be the spirit that was taking over Ronnie's house? In the basement, we just feel really strong presence at night, kind of scary. Uh, no matter how many lights or anything you have on, you don't want to be down there alone at night. John did some EVPs down there. He said it was uh, an evil spirit was there. So we ended up having to come back out and bless again. John believed the house had both positive and negative spirits. Far from trying to harm Kaylee, the little ghost girl in the bedroom was trying to protect her from evil. John didn't know who the evil entity was, just that they were trying to suppress the, the good spirits that are in the house. The little ghost girl that's in the house would always try to play with my daughter at night, and that's what was keeping her up. She wasn't there to scare her, but they were around the same age, so the ghost thought this could be a playmate for her. The little girl is a good spirit. She was just scary in appearance because of the way she died. So she still has the disfigured face. And to any little child, that would be scary to see, especially in the middle of the night, waking up, and that's what appears before you. Um, but she is a good spirit. She was, we're told by John, that she was sent here from God to protect Kaylee. We didn't want the good spirits that we feel should be in this house to leave, just the ones that were attributing negative aspects to what's going on. John came with, with the psychic, and they said prayers, and they were burning sage in the rooms and sprinkling holy water around, trying to get the evil spirits to leave. Right now, our house is pretty much normal. Once in a while, we'll experience a few things at night, but it's not the negative spirits that used to be here. We feel it's just the family in there. They're in their house, and they're not going to leave, and we're OK with that because they built this place. They have a lot of memories here, and those ghosts don't bother us. So when we do experience it, we, we kind of know who it is. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. 
I was so freaked out. As they confront spirits that just won't leave. Like, I couldn't have moved if I tried. I was so scared. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Uh, born and raised in Schenectady, New York. Lived there for 19 years of my life. Well, I grew up with my uh, with my mom and dad, and uh, about four years later, my uh, younger brother Jeremy came into the picture. Jeremy and I were were the typical brothers. Like any brothers, we always had our scuffles, of course. <laughs> It was the, the normal thing for us. But uh, otherwise, we got along well. Like, we always we always liked the same things. Uh, we were both big into video games. My childhood, I would describe it as, uh, at the time, I would have described it as normal. And then I learned that it was anything but normal. I mean, we lived in a one-floor house, uh, had an attic, a basement. It was uh, approximately 70 years old. With the hallway, I mean, it always gave off really dark and, like, creepy vibes to us. Like, if you, if you like, looked down the hallway at night when it was dark, you would just get this, like, really eerie feeling, like something's looking at you almost, you know? The first odd thing I can recall um, it was actually a few things that kept happening throughout the entire time that we lived there. There'd be uh, footsteps up in the attic. Like, uh, sometimes it sounded like, sounded like it would come from down the hall, like there'd be like a thing, like something walking down the hall, and then you'd hear like run up into the attic and run across the house. They were smaller footsteps. It, it did not sound like a grown-up at all. It sounded more like a child rather than an adult. And all of a sudden, I would just hear like a do-do-do-do like in the back of the house. There was uh, uh, one day that I was homesick from, from school, and it was just my mother and I. heard uh, sounded like about four or five footsteps literally right above us. Hello? There's somebody here? My mother and I just looked at each other. We were a little freaked out. So we walked over to the attic and we, or my mother opened up the attic door and yelled up to the attic saying, if somebody's up here, you better come down here now or I'm calling the police. I saw a man had this stare of like, hey, what, what are you doing up here? Get out of here. I never, I didn't tell my mother. I couldn't. Already terrified after his encounter in the attic, John Griffin would soon find out that nowhere in his home was safe. There was an incident in 
our bedroom one night. I used to always throw blankets over our mirror, or over the mirror, because I used to always see like shadow figures walking around in our room, and I just didn't want to see it. It, it. There was just something about the mirror that was creeping me out, so I kept on throwing a blanket over it. cats kept on knocking the blankets down, which would frustrate me. I saw this man looking at me through the mirror. He just gave you that vibe when you looked into uh, looked into his eyes that he didn't like you. You didn't know why, but he just didn't like you. And he kept on giving you the look of, I just want you to go away. And then he disappeared right in front of me. I just remember thinking to, to myself, I, I can't do this anymore. Children seem to experience more paranormal phenomena and psychic activity because they haven't really been conditioned or groomed environmentally or socially. Um, they're a lot more open-minded to those types of experiences. There's also people that are just more uh, sensitive or in tune to these types of things. I remember hearing uh, what sounded like a little girl's voice. John Griffin, feeling threatened by a menacing spirit in his family's new home, had now encountered a second ghost. She seemed frightened and upset, and she was trying to kind of remain as, remain as quiet as possible. Help me. And then she was just gone. Soon after, John found that his younger brother Jeremy was also seeing things he couldn't explain. Jeremy told me about one experience he had in the living room. I was sleeping on the, the love seat that was right next to my parents' door. It's like probably around like six feet tall. It's wearing like uh, a camouflage outfit, uh, camouflage hat, like, you know, like hunter camo, uh, wielding a shotgun. And its face is just pure white eyes. I just like freeze. I remember waking up that morning and Jeremy was very quick to pull me aside and say, I saw him last night. And it's like, the, the guy from the hallway? Oh, yeah, he was, he was dressed up in a hunter outfit. I'm like, 
okay, wait a second. Are we, ta we're talking about the same person, right? I was like, so he's coming in the living room now? I mean, that's my first thought. I'm sitting there going, he's coming into the living room now. I can't get away from this guy. I mean, I definitely, after that, I definitely started believing more so in, uh, you know, spirits being in the house and haunting the house. Jeremy and I constantly worried about our own safety. We were wondering every night what was going to happen next. Uh, we wanted to go and confront the hunter himself. We had had enough of it and we were gonna tell him to leave us alone. If somebody were to confront a spirit and tell them to leave or cross over, they could have a different reaction depending on that spirit or entity. Oftentimes spirits will willingly go and then oftentimes there are spirits that simply do not want to leave and there's much more of a confrontation or activity begins to flare up. We told him that we're tired of him and that he is to stop bothering us. That didn't go over too well with him. Jeremy and I were just starting to come to the realization that we were just gonna suffer with this until we move out. Fortunately, a few months later, the boy's father got a new job in a different town, and they were able to move. It wasn't until only a few years ago, actually, um, long after I'd moved out of the house, uh, that I started like kind of piecing the things together in my mind. Like, you know, I was thinking back, like, okay, so we got uh, a hunter with a gun, uh, you got a little girl down the hallway saying, help me, um, that, you know, was running up into the attic. And so, like, I thought of these things, and I was like, okay, so these things actually kind of do seem to fit together a little bit. It makes me wonder, was he terrorizing a little girl? I think it started to put a, a, a clearer picture uh, together as to uh, what was really going on in the house. Once we left, I was done with it. I just wanted to move on. The experience changed John's life forever. He now works as a psychic medium, helping other people rid their homes of unwanted spirits. Anybody who comes to me with experiences or wants my opinion on anything, if there are no facts to back it up, I'll listen to what they have to say, and then I look at the, uh, the other side of it. I always stand in the middle because everybody deserves to be heard. Some ghosts stick to a particular place to relive past crimes again and again. Others are happy to rest in peace until someone living does something to offend them. My wife and I were we're looking to move, and we wanted to buy an old century-type home. And we found this beautiful old house in Aurora, built in 1915. The three families had moved in and out of the house within a year and a half. And I thought, oh, well, something's wrong. Something's got to be wrong with the house. So we had a building inspector, naturally, and he told us that everything appears fine. So based on his investigation, we went ahead and bought the house. For Bob, his wife Donna, and their baby daughter Ellie, it felt like a dream come true. This house was really, really nice. You know, the banister was like 
hand carved and everything just appeared to, to be exactly what we were looking for. Three weeks after moving in, Bob made an unusual discovery. In the backyard, when I was cutting the lawn, there was a rectangular shoebox size depression in the lawn. It was very precise, and it was about two inches deep. And I thought, wow, something looks like it's been buried here. My curiosity got the better of me, and I started to dig it up. had discovered an unusual depression in the lawn at his new home and decided to investigate. And I found nothing. And I thought, something was buried here probably many years ago, and whatever it is has long since decayed, and there's nothing left. I, I went out and bought a tree, and I planted a tree there, so I didn't get my, my lawnmower stuck in this thing anymore. I was really happy about that. I knew the house was fine and structurally sound, and there were no major problems, but I was still concerned uh, about why people are moving in and out of there so quickly. So after we moved in, I thought, well, I guess I'll start going through boxes and seeing what we have. felt somebody breathing on my neck on the left side. There was someone there. I was sure of it. I could actually feel them breathing. It scared me quite a bit. No idea what it was, what would cause that. I thought, well, maybe it's wind or something's blowing. I always tried to put it down to something else. Bob's encounter in the attic turned out to be just the beginning. On the main floor was where the washroom was. Somebody in the hall behind me, outside the bathroom, Walk by. And I go, who is that? There's nobody here. It was a black figure. It was just a black figure. And it was fairly quick. So it was just like that. Right? So you know you saw something, but you, you didn't see it long enough to be able to focus on it. So I kind of shrugged that off too, thinking, oh, well, that's who knows what that is. 
I thought maybe it's a reflection. Bob was starting to get an idea of why the house had seen three previous occupants in the last two years. When the weekend came, I always liked to have a fire, and it had a real wood fireplace in the family room. So Friday night, I would get home, we'd have dinner, start the fire. I would usually be the last one up. My wife would go to bed. And when it was almost out, I would, I would close the flue. And then I would close the screen. Then I would go to bed. One morning, I got up and I came down. I was the first one to come downstairs. And all the ashes from the fireplace were piled in a big, neat pile in front of the fireplace. It was like a pyramid shape. Couldn't figure out how it could possibly get formed like that, because if you blow on it gently, the whole thing's going to come down. How could anyone possibly form ashes to sit like that? That really startled me and freaked me out. In order to get somebody's attention, sometimes spirits will actually manifest items or sculpt a certain object so that it can get the person's attention, so that therefore they can have help crossing over or just give the message that they're present in the household. I was in the kitchen washing dishes by myself in the house. Nobody else was there. I heard coming from the basement right below me, four elderly female voices having a tea party. And I thought, this is one of these times where you really think you're losing your mind. And I did, I thought, okay, I gotta be going nuts. This can't be real. I was trying to listen to what they said, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. It was like, it was all gibberish. But there were definitely four elderly female voices. And I heard all the sounds clearly. I heard when they could put their cup on the saucer. I heard when they stirred their cup. All the sounds were there. OK, this is one of these times where I, I definitely think I'm losing my mind, because this, what I'm hearing, cannot really be happening. Walk downstairs. Nothing. Perfectly quiet. Nothing was out of the ordinary. Nobody was down there. And I, I couldn't believe what I'd heard. moved his family into their dream home. Everything just appeared to, to be exactly what we were looking for. But he was beginning to realize why several previous occupants had moved out so quickly. A series of bizarre incidents, including disembodied voices, cold breath on his neck, and weird supernatural displays had left him confused and afraid. 
we had a couple over and we were all sitting in our family room and he excused himself to go to the washroom. And he came into the family room and said, oh, thanks a lot, guys. That was really funny. And where it's like, uh, what? What are you talking about? Oh, you know, you're pushing against the door. You know, that was really, you know, really funny. And we said, well, all of us have been in here, you know, since you guys got here. So I don't know what you're talking about. After Bob's guests left, he and his wife stayed up for a cup of coffee. I was on the phone and I saw a lady coming up the driveway. The first thing I realized was she wasn't walking up the driveway. There were no steps, just like she was floating up the driveway like this. I yelled to my wife, somebody's coming to the back door. Nobody came to the door, so we both went outside. We're looking all over the yard. <clears throat> Never saw anybody. I must be going out of my mind. These, this is not normal. I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. And I went to the Aurora Historical Society, and I said, oh, maybe somebody died in the house. And they said, unfortunately, they didn't have very good records in those days, and know that they weren't really able to tell me uh, if anybody passed away in that house. But they were kind enough to give me a list of everybody that ever lived in that house. One day when I was uh, out in the front yard and I was cutting the lawn and a car pulled up and a lady got out and she told me her name and she said, I used to live here and my husband and I moved out some 10 years ago. Um, I said, would you like to come in and have a look around? And she said, oh, that'd be great, thanks. So I took her in the house, and just before she left, we were in the front foyer, just inside the front door. And I said to her, before you leave, there's one question I would like to ask you. And she said to me, you're gonna ask me if it's haunted. She said, did you ever hear about the old lady with the cats? And she said, well, there was a lady that lived here. Um, her name was Miss Glover. She lived here by herself. She never married, but she loved cats. And during the course of her living there, that she had buried some of her cats in the yard. And she left a note actually for whoever the next owners were coming in to please not disturb certain areas in the backyard where she had buried her cats. The first thing I thought of was, holy smokes, that thing that I ran over with my lawnmower where I used to get the lawnmower stuck all the time. That was rectangular shoebox size with a depression in the grass about two inches. That must have been where she buried one of her cats. Now I got her upset with me. 
If a spirit feels that it has been disrespected or not honored properly, the spirit is known to actually come back and begin haunting the household. And when it came to showing how upset she was, the late Miss Glover was only getting started. My wife was out and I was home by myself with my daughter and I was up in her bedroom rocking her to sleep and everything was very quiet and I had my daughter over my shoulder like this and I was in the rocking chair just rocking her to sleep and you know kind of like singing a lullaby or something. After disturbing a cat burial spot in his yard, Bob Mowers had incurred the wrath of the cat's owner. The only problem? She had been dead for years. The whole room was shaking, and I, again, thought, I'm, I gotta be losing my mind. This can't really be happening. I was so freaked out, and I didn't know what to do. But I saw it, and I still remember it clearly very vividly in my mind, clear as a bell. I'll never forget watching this happen, thinking what could possibly be causing this. But I was really, truly afraid in that house. For Bob, it was one incident too far, and he decided to put the house on the market. The people that bought our house had it exercised, and they would go to every single room. They went to every bed bedroom, started praying and telling the spirit, you don't belong here. Go to the light, follow the light. Just when the minister and his wife were getting ready to leave, they all heard the same thing. Like she said, we all heard this loud female voice scream. And her minister said, that was her, she's gone. You'll, you won't have any, anything else. And she's ever since then, nothing's out. Bob Mowers incurred the wrath of his home's former owner by disturbing her cat's grave. Territorial entities can stake a claim on a property for all sorts of reasons. And sometimes they need no reason at all. Take one marker. Five years ago, um, just came to a point in my life where it was time for me and my husband to separate. Uh, we both realized that it was the right thing to do. So I was looking for a place to rent. Um, I decided that I didn't want to just run out and buy something. I wanted to think it through. At the same time, my brother was also going through a divorce. So an idea for us to rent together. And we knew that we could trust each other with um, our each other's children because we were siblings. and. Um, we were there just to kind of be moral support to each other, too, through a difficult time. My main criteria was looking for a four-bedroom townhouse. I found the townhouse that it was available. I went that day and put my money down on it. I have two children. It was the perfect setup because we kind of had living areas upstairs and down for two families um, kind of cohabitating while we both kind of find um, the homes that we were looking to buy and, you know, for this transition period. When we moved in, it just didn't feel like home. It had a cold feeling and not like a temperature-wise cold feeling. It just didn't feel homey. The children didn't feel comfortable when they went to bed. Um, 
I felt like I could only sleep by the TV on. You just, ne you just never felt relaxed. It was an odd feeling, like someone was watching you. End of September, beginning of October. I got up about four in the morning. And you could see the impression of somebody, like, like the comforter was down. And I knew I felt it, but there also was the, well, maybe it was a weird dream. I was unpacking coats and putting it just straight into the entryway closet. Then when I bent down to put the shoes in, I kind of moved things around and looked up and noticed lower down on, on the wall was a big cross that had been drawn in pencil. I put some boxes in the storage area that was in the laundry room. I just kind of had noticed on the beams that there was a big wooden cross um, nailed up on the beams. I started getting a sick feeling like something isn't right here. Whenever Regina tried to put it out of her mind, something else would happen. I was out in the garage, and it was somewhat cold out. I had a jacket on. and it felt like someone very forcefully like pulled my hair. I, I have never really experienced anything like that before. I knew I'd be moving out in the next couple months, so I just kind of wanted just to get out of there and not deal with it. But then the activity escalated. I was the only one home, and I looked down, and across the top of my foot were three lines, like scratches. It looks like claw marks. We had no animals that lived with us at the time. Um, I was sleeping alone. Nobody else could have scratched me accidentally. I started trying to find any plausible reason, including scratching myself. But it was perfect marking a three. I was really scared to tell anybody, um, because you just, you think nobody's gonna believe you. There's several different reasons why a spirit would become violent or attack a family or a person, and one of which is that they feel very possessive or controlling of that house. Um, another time is that they might not like the people that are within the household, or it might be a more sinister entity that really has a malevolent intent towards the family and just simply wants to harm them. I got out of the shower and I went to brush my hair and I noticed it. Regina Hughes thought she was imagining things in her newly rented home. But after her hair was pulled and scratches appeared on her body, skepticism had given way to genuine fear. I got out of the shower and I went to brush my hair and I noticed it.
My brother was home. I ran upstairs to show him, and he just couldn't believe it. He was like, wow, you know? So he took pictures. That was the day that it went from this weird to what, what is in our house? The attacks on Regina had been bad enough, but even worse was to come. I was making dinner upstairs and my son was in the downstairs. Um, I was basically just sitting on my bed in my room all by myself and I had my um, headphones in and I was listening to music, felt super quiet. felt like somebody touched me and then like a split second after that, it just got super freezing cold just on this leg and like the weird tingly feeling, like almost like your leg fell asleep and but not, I don't really know how to describe it, but it was really scary. All of a sudden I heard something drop. He came upstairs, he just, the color was gone from his face. He was completely freaked out and he said, I'm out of here. And he went to a friend's house and he come home till later that night. And that night he slept in my bed. could really tell he was scared. He didn't want to be there anymore. It was just weird feeling, bad feelings in the house, so. So at this time, I, I was just, I'm the mom, I'm the parent. What am I gonna do to take care of these kids and protect them, because something's going on in this house. In theory, spirits are able to attack people by sort of coming into our plane of existence, our reality. They're able to transcend that veil between worlds, and it takes considerable energy for them to physically attack somebody. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. So I actually drove to our church. So I, when I went into pastor's office and told him, I said, I know you're gonna think I'm crazy, but this is what's happening. And I showed him a, the couple pictures I had gotten on my cell phone. He said, I will come out and bless it once you're done. But I really don't feel safe or comfortable doing it until you have someone smudge your house. My name is Heidi Steffens, and I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm actually a paranormal energy consultant. Since I was a child, I've been able to see and communicate with spirits. Most of the cases that we've worked on over the years have been entities that are not wanted in the home. When things come in three, like the scratches did, and it's in a negative form, it's usually a mocking of the Holy Trinity. And that's of great concern to me, especially when children are involved. I knew that it wasn't an animal that had passed. It wasn't a loved one that had passed. It was something darker. And I knew they needed help. We agreed for her to come out later that weekend. We got out there on a Sunday afternoon and met with Regina. I didn't know what to expect, and I was very relieved when I opened the door and saw um, a very lovely, <laughs> normal person. So we decided to you know, start in the upstairs and work our way through the home from room to room, and then finish downstairs where we felt the energy was the strongest. And that's the first time we heard it. Like, I couldn't have moved if I tried. I was so scared. It was almost like shouting, loud talking, but you couldn't understand the words. It just is like, it was saying something, but you just couldn't understand it. And it voice was just so freaky, just scary. It was quite able to move around and interact with the living in a very negative way. It presented itself as a female energy. And that the best way she could describe her to me was like a hag. And so we just kept about our business got a little bit louder, and finished it up.
went through the space. We went through it again to make sure. It felt good. It did. It felt great. I would have slept there myself that night. And uh, we knew that it felt very safe when we were done with the clearing. Regina Hughes' experience shows that even when unwanted entities are removed, the trauma of encountering them can remain for many, many years. So this really opened my eyes that there is negativity. Um, I don't know if evil might be a little bit too strong of a word, but just that with the good comes the bad. There is dark things out there, and it's really scary. I, to this day, avoid driving by the road that, or driving on the road that goes by that townhouse. I don't like to think about it. It's um, something that I never want to experience again. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. When spirits talk to the living. All of a sudden you hear the voice in the background say, get out. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. We lived in Rhode Island all our life. We originally moved to Texas just to try something new, to see if we'd like it somewhere else. But we missed home. We missed being near the water, the four seasons, the snow. And one day we just found out, hey, I'm pregnant. <laughs> we basically decided after that to move back to Rhode Island because we grew up here. Um, we raised our other two kids in Rhode Island, so we figured this one would be the best way to raise our son that's being born now. When I found out Shalisa being pregnant, I, it was the happiest day of my life. I wanted to be close to my family. And I came back down and I got the apartment, the three bedroom apartment. It was great. High ceilings, big, big rooms, you know. No one lived in it for a long time, so I was like, it was meant to be. It was meant to be our place for us and our kids. The plan was me and my husband would move down to Rhode Island while my kids would stay in school in Texas to finish out the school year. Um, I didn't feel right taking them out of school, so we just let them stay there with my brother, who resided down in Texas, while we moved down to Rhode Island to get ourselves settled and situated. He was there for about a month by himself. I was kind of lonely, you know? I was yeah, all by myself, not seeing my wife or anything like that. One night, I came home. I was sitting down in my living, my living area watching some TV, and, uh, I look out into my kitchen. And I, I actually took like a like a two-time look. It was just like a tall, real tall, like maybe six, seven, just dark figure, like a shadow. If I stand in front of a light, I look behind me and with a mirror on, you see my big shadow behind me? That's pretty much what it looked like. Like real dark and deep. Is that someone standing in my house? And I'm the only one living there, you know? I didn't even have my dog with me, it was just me. Brian shared the experience with his wife, Shalisa. My husband would tell me at nighttime, he would look out the living room, on the, while he laid on the couch watching TV, and our living room faced the kitchen. And when he would look out there, he would see a dark figure just standing there staring right back at him. I don't know, I just, he was trying to play it off like, like a joke, you know, ha, 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 you know. So I don't know if she believed me or not, you know, because I don't know, she didn't see it for herself yet, pretty much. Well, I just thought it was, he was overly tired, you know, and his mind was playing tricks on him. I didn't think that there was anything there. 
Well, my wife, Shalisa, moved in. Uh, it was great. I was happy. There was someone there with me, you know. I wasn't there all by myself. I, I looked forward to coming home. I personally, I loved the apartment. It was, it was what we needed. I felt happy. I didn't want to think that it was anything wrong with it. At first, it was light and bright and happy, and then suddenly just started changing. The atmosphere of it really was different. I would go in the kitchen, I would cook, I'd hear something behind me, and I'd just brush it off thinking it was my dog or, you know, just not putting much thought into it at all. But Shalisa suddenly felt a wave of negative energy wash over her. There was this overwhelming feeling of, of sadness, of irritation, of anger. I kind of brushed it off my shoulder thinking, you know, well, maybe it's my mind playing tricks on me. Maybe, you know, the exhaustion from moving and into a new place, different state, maybe that was getting to me. So I kind of brushed it off at first. After my husband would leave for work at 5 o'clock in the morning, I would get up and just start cleaning the house. And I'd hear whispering from the right side of my head, which would be from towards the kitchen. Now, me, I'm thinking it's a TV. Maybe somehow it's projecting itself throughout the room. But it was multiple whispers. I, all I heard was pss, 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 pss. I could not make out what it was saying, but I could just hear the voices whispering inside the kitchen. I thought I was going nuts. <laughs> I really thought, you know, I hear little voices in my head. I couldn't pinpoint it at the time what was going on. The experiences continued to escalate. Me and my husband were watching television. Reliable sources say that chicken soup has proven to be I was laying down on the couch. I happened to look to my right. And I seen the same shadow figure that my husband was telling me about, just watching us. Wouldn't move. I didn't see a face. It just it was just a figure. I turned around to my husband and I basically poked him in the shoulder and I said, do you see what I see? He leaned over, he goes, I, that's what I've been telling you. I've been seeing the entire time I've been here. And then that right there made me feel like I wasn't crazy. You know, I thought it was could have been the light, it could have been something passing there, but there was absolutely no lights in my house but the glowing from the TV. There's something in here that's watching me for some reason. She was frightened. My wife was frightened about seeing the shadow guy. And I was scared for her, too, because I'm like, hey, you know, there's someone else in the house. Something else is here. You know, and it's just watching us. It was about to get much worse. I was in the shower one day, and um, I usually have the bathroom door open just in case I hear somebody knocking on my door. I heard, like, you, you, somebody's hand was wet, and it streaked down my kitchen table and made such a screeching sound. fingerprints and a handprint streaked down wet on my kitchen table. 
Shalisa searched for an explanation. My dog was dead bolted upstairs. There's no way anybody else could get in. At that point in time, I did call my husband and said, listen, I got to go. I got to leave. I can't be here right now. It, this is really freaking me out. When I came home that night about maybe 8 o'clock, and the mox was still sitting on my table. Of, of like fingerprints being slid down the table. No. I woke up one morning and I looked down. There were three bruises, fingerprint bruises. Like little tiny fingers. It looked like somebody came up from behind me and grabbed me. I, I, I couldn't explain it. And she definitely would remember someone, someone or something actually did that to her. Unexplained bruises and markings could be unexplained paranormal phenomena that a person's experiencing from a haunting. Sometimes it takes a drastic measure, such as a physical um, impression on the body, like bites or scratch marks or something like that, to actually change a skeptic's mind into believing that they're experiencing something paranormal. A couple days later, I realized I looked down on my leg and there were scratches also on my leg. Three deep scratches on my legs, so it was, it was very frightening. It looked like somebody ran their nails right across my legs and their nails were very sharp, so it left three marks on, on my leg itself, on my left leg, on my thigh. I was worried for my baby's safety. I didn't know if what was happening would affect my child that I was carrying in my stomach. I didn't know if it was somehow, some way, trying to get to my baby. She wanted out. And I kept on insisting that, no, we can't. There's nowhere else we could go. You know, I don't have the money to get another place. And it's going to take a while to find another place. And this is suitable for us. And I felt bad for her for saying that to her because, you know, I'm supposed to be supporting my wife. You know, and then I felt bad because I couldn't protect her and my child. At this point in time, it, the progression was unbelievable. I mean, it, the bruises started coming, the scratches started coming. Um, it, it, had, it seemed like it had a personal vendetta against me. I did go to my, um, my, pre, my OBGYN. The baby was fine. I was fine. There was nothing going on wrong. Everything was normal. That was a huge relief that everything was going OK. After getting a clean bill of health, Shalisa would experience her most vivid and violent episode. I remember one morning, um, my husband left probably around 4.30, 5 o'clock to go to work. As always, like every morning, I get up, I make him his cup of coffee, he, you know, and I wait for him to go to work. I'll lock the door behind him and I'll go back and I'll lay down on the couch. She said she was trying to fall back to sleep with her arm over her head. And I'm just laying there. There was no TV on. There was no nothing. I was wide awake. All of a sudden, I felt something grab my hand and hold on to my hand. It was a very, very tight grip. It felt so real, like it, it was another human being there that grabbed onto my hand. Next thing I know, as I'm facing upwards, Shalisa Carvelis and Brian Rodriguez had moved into a new apartment, only to find themselves attacked from the spirit world. All of a sudden, I felt something grab my hand and hold on to my hand. Next thing I know, as I'm facing upwards, I see something to start hovering right over me. I see the hair, forehead. It 
it was just levitating right over me. I blacked out because I was so scared. I called my husband up. And she actually wanted me to turn around and come back home, but I couldn't. At this point in time, it was, it was the scariest thing that happened, yes. She sounded very frightened, very scared. She didn't want to be in that house until I came home. I was afraid for my baby. I was afraid for me, because if it was just targeting me and hurting me, I was afraid it was going to hurt my son, too. We needed to find somebody that could help us. The couple reached out to paranormal investigator Jack Kenna. My impression of them over the phone was that they were very sincere, very genuine. I told them about the bruises. I told them about the, the dark figure. During the investigation, when we got there, uh, we spoke to the clients. We started setting up our equipment. There's a green dot on there. I got a device here. It's a K2. We have a few devices we use. Um, I have a tablet that I use that's I got an application called Ghost Radar. They left for the evening. And then we started to try to interact with whatever might be there. I felt like, great, he's going to do something for me. He's going to take care of this. Uh, I was excited to see him. We have been invited here by Shalisa and Brian, because Shalisa and Brian have both been experiencing very strange things here. They can't explain. And I think it's you. They think it has something to do with a spirit. We uh, sat down. We started talking and just asking questions. You know, who's here with us? Is there anybody around here with us? We want to talk with them and find out who you are. Shalisa was actually scared to the point where she blacked out on this exact couch. And I'm really feeling... It is heavier. No, I'm really feeling it. And I suddenly started getting a strong, heavy feeling. The room was light when we first walked in, but I got a very heaviness, and the room seemed to be getting harder to breathe in, which is usually an indication that something might be going on. You have an opportunity to talk to us to let us know what's going on. We noticed uh, a blip, which usually indicates some type of energy. Uh, it could be spirit energy, it could be something else. Devices can be used for spirit communication in which an entity or a human spirit can manipulate the energy levels to provide yes or no answers. Two blips for yes, one for no. Are you the tall shadow man that they see, both Brian and Shalisa have seen? Are you the tall shadow man? Yes. yes. My psychic friend told me that she felt there was a male figure, very strong male figure in the house, negative individual. Uh, he was not a very nice person when he was alive, uh, didn't like women, um, was an abuser. Uh, he was still there and felt he owned the house, the house was his, and nobody else should be there. But at the same time, you know, he was attracted to the energy uh, of Shalisa. Are you trying to use Shalisa's energy? Yes. The response was yes. Are you trying to use her energy? Another EVP device includes taking measurements from the environment, such as temperature, the barometric pressure, and assigns those numbers to a word out of a word database. And so it's believed that the spirit can actually generate a conversation or words in context with the investigator by manipulating their environment. And that was on the ghost radar. And I said, well, no, you can't do that. You, you, you know, that's wrong. You can't do that. That's not good. And we caught an EVP, the male voice, saying, I can. EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. Um, this is when people capture disembodied voices of the dead. Uh, you can't do that. At that point, we kind of knew it's trying to take her energy from her, which is never good. Uh, you can't do that. We got back to the house around 12 o'clock. Uh, midnight, Jack came in the living room and says, you know, I usually don't do this, but I'm going to sit down and tell you. They did catch some EVPs and voices on, on the recording. 
How about walking through this room? All of a sudden, you hear the voice in the back room say, get out. It, it was very shocking. The other one was um, when, about the energy, when he said, Jack told him, no, you can't have her energy. Uh, you can't do that. What was your reaction? It was a relief. I was very relieved that, that there was actually something there. And it just took a big weight off my shoulder to see, OK, somebody else has seen it. Somebody else has heard it. They're happy to know that, OK, you know, good. We at least really know now that we're not crazy. We're not imagining this. Uh, at the same time, it can make you very nervous. I was kind of overwhelmed. There was a dark, dark figure that was trying to steal my baby's energy and my wife's energy. It's always kind of a double-edged sword. Hearing the voice of the ghost seemed to bring the terrifying events to a new level. I was laying down, and all of a sudden, the blankets came around me. Rodriguez and Shalisa Carvelis had been experiencing paranormal phenomena in their new apartment. After calling in an investigator to help them make sense of the events, they heard the voice of the entity tell them it wanted to possess Shalisa. That's not good. I was laying down, and all of a sudden, the blankets came around me. wrapped me up basically like a burrito. I couldn't get out. I couldn't move. I tried fighting my way out. There was no way. About two minutes passed, and all of a sudden, it, the blankets released me. I leaned over. I pointed to the door. And as soon as I opened my mouth, I have her now. She's mine. It was what basically came out of my mouth. Something came out of, her, out of her mouth, but it wasn't her voice saying, She's mine now. She's mine now. I didn't have control of what I was saying. Demonic entities can temporarily possess people and speak through them, um, or there's sometimes more prolonged possessions. But basically, an entity is able to take over the body, the emotions, the mind of a person, the victim, and use that body to manipulate and um, generate different words or communicate a message to the rest of the people there. I don't remember saying it. I don't remember getting up. I don't remember waking him up. Not being in control made me very, very frightened that I would eventually was going to hurt somebody or something, and I couldn't control it. And that's not how I want to live my life anymore. I was very, very scared out of my wits. Because if he could do that to try to hurt me, he's hurting my baby, too. And I, I didn't know what to do at that point in time. The one person the couple thought could help was paranormal investigator Jack Kenna. I went back to their home, um, and I decided to try to a new technique to look for portals within the home. If you're near a portal, it'll start to swing. It'll kind of give you the direction of the portal. It'll let you know it's there, and it'll swing like a pendulum. And if it's very strong, it'll swing very quickly and very obviously. I found several portals, many portals within the home, more than I expected, and I found about 18. In this particular case, these were spirit portals where spirits can come in and out of. And the fact that the apartment was empty for so long before they moved in would only make that entity feel more that it's his. And whatever's in there is his. And that's never a good thing. So what I envision is a torn piece of fabric with light coming through it, and I'll sew it closed. And you do that to every single one. 
I also talk to the spirits that are there and say, you know, anything negative has to leave. You can't stay here, you have to go, especially the, the, the male figure. And when I started closing these portals, there was a lot of activity on it at first. And then nothing. Jack was confident the spirits would no longer be able to access Brian and Shalisa's home. But the whole experience was just too frightening for the couple. So we thought the best thing would be just to leave. Even if we had nowhere else to go, it would be better than dealing with this every single day. Hopefully it doesn't follow us, you know? If it follow us, then I'm in the whole, in that whole line of again. Excuse my French. You know? But, yeah, I just hope it doesn't follow us. If it doesn't follow us, I'll be happy anywhere else. Let it stay there. You know? After moving out of their Pawtucket home, the paranormal events ended for Shalisa and Brian. Electronic voice phenomenon is just one method an entity can use to speak with the physical world. Seances and spirit boards can also allow the dead to talk. Trevor and I, we both met each other actually over the internet. Uh, we've been together for four years. But eventually we decided to move in together. So we start looking online and I found this house. One that just stood out to us for some reason. I fell in love with the location. I was like, okay, this is this feels like home. When we first went to visit for the viewing for the house. First location was the basement. Uh, the feeling when I first walked down was there was definitely some odd energy downstairs. It wasn't like an open, airy space. The first thing you notice is this big old cistern. It's actually a well that's indoors. And in the old days, they would use that well for storing water, either from the eaves troughs off the roof going directly in, or even putting snow from the winter inside to melt. It was really odd when I went down there first because it's not something that you would expect to see down there. The presence of the cistern in there just gave it, like you're wondering what's beyond that point kind of feeling. You're just not quite sure why there's a darkness in that back corner area. Trevor Bishop and Mark LaRock had found a house they loved and moved in together. But a spooky cistern in the basement was giving off negative energy and filling them with a sense of dread. Like you're wondering what's beyond that point. So we had an incident happen the first day that after we moved in, I was heading off to work in the morning. Right when we woke up, Trevor was looking for the car keys. And I couldn't find them anywhere. I asked Mark to look around downstairs for me. We looked around, must have been for 10 or 15 minutes straight, and we could not find them anywhere. Finally, Mark has enough. And I said, that's it. Put the keys back right where you got them. And then same spot though that we checked a couple times, the keys were sitting right there. I precisely know I looked at that spot. 
There's numerous reasons why a spirit might aport or manipulate or remove items from a household. Typically, it's to get the homeowner's attention because maybe that spirit wants help or to engage and interact with those people. Or sometimes the spirit might just have a certain affinity for an object. The house was holding more secrets for Mark and Trevor to uncover. One night I was using the washroom, and all of a sudden I just heard. I thought it was Mark actually because it was around 9 o'clock at night, and that's the time sometimes he goes to bed at. I thought maybe he was carrying a cat coming up the stairs, going slowly, taking one step at a time, like step, step, step. I wanted to double check to see if that noise I heard was Mark or not. downstairs and asked Mark if that was him, of course. Yeah, I'm actually sitting down in the living room, and Trevor came out and had said, was that you climbing up the stairs? And I turned around and said, no, I've been down here all this time watching television. It couldn't have been him, because there's no time for him to get from downstairs to upstairs in the time I came out of the washroom, so. The basement remained a source of bizarre events. When we first were checking out the cold room in our basement, once we moved in, we noticed there was an odd sort of feeling downstairs. There was an energy presence that was trying to push me back. But I could still, still feel the energy right there. just more or less the feel. Hands push me back, trying to push me up the stairs, saying, okay, you're not welcome. It felt like a bunch of energy just coming right at you. Basically, picking you up and throwing you off your feet, you landing 10 feet back. That's, that's exactly what I was feeling. Almost as if somebody was down there sort of either watching you or just some odd kind of energy coming from that back area where a cold room is. It was like, don't come downstairs. Do not come downstairs. There was one incident, though, that I was downstairs with Trevor. We were cleaning up our tent that we actually had outside, and we brought it back in. So I was busy folding that up, putting it away. While well, I was doing the laundry, um, I was facing the cistern. And it feels like somebody's down there sort of watching you. I was feeling this kind of presence, though, that you got to look up and look over towards the cold room door. That's when he noticed the activity coming from the door to our cold room. Bishop and Mark LaRock had bought their dream home. But after moving in, they found themselves plagued by ever more terrifying ghostly phenomena. That's when he noticed the activity coming from the door to our cold room. I saw this hand reaching out, trying to reach towards Trevor while Trevor was back was towards it. And all of a sudden, it went back in. Frustrated and unable to explain the odd events in their new home, 
Mark and Trevor contacted a medium friend, Jen. I am a uh, ordained spiritualist minister in the province of Ontario. So I do weddings and funerals, those sorts of things. But then I also have a passion for physical mediumship and work with individuals to bring them comfort, bringing their loved ones that have passed through so that they know that they're not on this earth plane, but they still are in the continuum and that they support them and love them and that at some point we'll be reunited with them. So she's a very open person to everything paranormal, spiritual, and she's very accurate as well because she is a medium too. The house was built in the 1920s. Uh, it is a brick house uh, and on a limestone foundation. Uh, it's about a stone's throw from the Grand River, so you have continually running water, which puts out negative ions, which allows spirit to come forth. And it has a cistern in the basement, which again, when you have energy constantly moving, is another way for spirit to be able to manifest. Determined to help Trevor and Mark, Jen started looking for uninvited spirits in their home. I had sensed that there was something upstairs. Since it's an active house, you can also pick up energies in a house of people. It's an imprint. So lots of sort of memories in a house doesn't mean that it's haunted or that there's spirits, but there's definitely sort of many years of family memories that, that are in that house as well. Is there anyone here? A little girl, uh, blonde, curly hair, big blue eyes, and she was coughing and she still had that fever, so she was showing me that that's how she'd pass away. It felt like either scarlet fever or um, like a typhoid or, or something like that, that, of that sort of period. 1920s, 1930s, uh, that sort of era of time. So I said, yeah, she used to go to the attic that way, and that's why you're hearing sounds of footsteps She's in no way, you know, problematic. She's just there and will probably always be there. The energy in the basement would prove to be more of a challenge. And as soon as I walked in, I could smell that swampy kind of damp and I could see the wet footprints on the floor. Um, so as soon as I walked in, I knew it, and then he appeared to me. So I could see him and he was dripping wet and he was in, you know, clothes that were sort of 100 years old. He drowned because I, I feel it. So I could feel water in my lungs. I started coughing up. And just knew that he had drowned quite suddenly and unexpectedly. Got him feeling that he was safe and that I wasn't trying to banish him. What is your name? I got the name Andrew. Jackson. She was able to pick up the last name Jackson. One of the main reasons a spirit will actually verbally communicate with someone is often to share their story or to get a certain message across, whether they have unfinished business or unresolved issues, maybe from a traumatic death. Um, oftentimes, spirits will actually reach out to share their story verbally, and so people will experience auditory phenomenon with paranormal incidents. We wanted to do some research first to find out more information on the spirit himself. And we came across his name in an article about a boat accident that happened back in 1878. There was about 18 or 20 young people all around the age of 20 years old. They went on what they call a pleasure cruise in those days, which was just like a modified rowboat that had a steam motor in it. They ran into trouble one evening that they were out on the water and the rudder got stuck. Instead of turning away from the dam, got stuck and turned right into the dam and capsized. Thank you. 
Now, not all the people perished on this accident. Uh, the two women that were with them, they escaped unharmed. But unfortunately, the rest of the men that were on did perish. The bodies weren't found. They were all drifted down the river by the time they went to check. And Andrew Jackson was one of these men that was on the boat at age 19. Quite often when you pass really suddenly and unexpectedly, you don't realize you're dead. And felt like he had a lot of things that he still needed to do, so was having a really hard time moving on. He ended up having family that owned the property that we're currently on. So what we think happened to our spirit's body is he ended up floating down the river and recognized the land that his family owned, which is now our property, and his spirit got off at our place. Knowing that Andrew had really existed, it spurred the couple on to take communicating with the spirits to the next level. We wanted to try to get some evidence of the spirits that are there and why they are there. We set up our night vision camera system in two different places. We set one up downstairs, and we also set one up in the attic upstairs. In that one camera that we had upstairs, we actually got some activity. Trevor Bishop and Mark LaRock had spirits living in their new home. In an attempt to communicate with the paranormal, they set up recording devices around the house. In that one camera that we had upstairs, we actually got some orb activity. Roughly around 4 o'clock in the morning, there was a ball of energy that came across actually from the right-hand side, came in front of the camera, and it shot down towards the stairs. It went from the camera all the way to the back and actually turned the corner and head down the stairs towards the stairs of the attic. So. This orb did move in a distinct fashion that would suggest that it wasn't dust. We really want to find out more information about who the spirit is that is in our basement. So a seance is an opportunity for the medium, which in that, in that case is myself, to uh, open up and allow spirit to come through and communicate. two skeptics. I always intentionally bring skeptics or people that have never sat in my seances before so that you've got objective people saying, yeah, I, I can't explain what happened. So I think they were really excited about it. So we give spirit permission to use our energetic bodies in order to come through and communicate and give message and, and pass on whatever information that they want to do. She was telling us that we had three spirits in our house. There was a male and there was a girl, a child. And today, we have met all of them so far, so she's been right on, so. That was when Andrew interacted. Things moved, there was banging, there were sounds, there was noises, all that kind of thing. So he was definitely there and interacting and gave some feedback about, you know, things he liked and didn't like and, and things like that. We asked him questions. Andrew, are you happy, though, that we're here? Do you want us to move? The table actually did shift. And then it was pushed actually into me, basically saying to, uh, saying to us, even to me, don't move. I want you here. Andrew was stuck before we started working with him. Now he comes in and out at will because he just wants to see what's going on. We believe that Andrew was looking for some connection. And we hope that now that we've done the research, we've communicated with him. He knows that we're open to communicating with him that maybe it'll be easier for him to move on. And we hope that he is able to do that now.
this little girl in there, how she's just mischievous and she's lonely. She doesn't have anyone to play with. She doesn't have anything to play with. Um, I get the impression, too, that her mother hadn't yet passed. So I suspect when her mother passes that she will then go along, too. So quite often they'll hang out and wait until a parent has passed over, and then that parent will help them cross them over. It was just like a little kid that played strange. You know, it was that sort of feeling, and just she was confused as to why her mom wouldn't, wouldn't come and talk to her and that kind of thing. I had said to them when I did a seance at their house, I said, look, you need to get her a doll or something to play with. And since they've got her a plaything, it settled down. The keys have stopped moving, stuff has stopped vanishing. She's still there, but she's not causing issues with people being late and, and moving keys and things that are important. After communicating with the spirits, Mark and Trevor have a new understanding of their paranormal encounters. I think it was more of reaching out just to say, seeing if it could reach me. It was trying to maybe reach towards me to say hi. If it reached me far enough to touch me, it may have just touched my back like a tap on the back saying, hey, I'm here. And that's about it. It wasn't a negative, like black shadow or something trying to take over you or something like that. Oftentimes, people have noticed that paranormal activity has decreased when they actually engaged in conversation and let the spirit share their personal story. Sometimes it's, it's almost as if they're being the psychiatrist for the spirit so that they can get something off their chest or to be able to set certain boundaries with the spirit and communicate with them and set those established perimeters. And a lot of the times, the hauntings will actually be resolved. I feel that the spirits are not negative. They're not trying to harm us in any way. Uh, it's not pol poltergeist activity or anything like that that's throwing things. It's just movement. They're moving things to let you know they're around. And I'm okay with that. We've come to full understanding. We're here for you. You guys are here for us. Let's work together. As long as there's, we're not getting harmed or th there's no trouble from them, then we're totally fine having them here. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. And there was this dark image right behind me. There's no mistaking that is a human body. As ghost soldiers come back to haunt the living. He was a, a war hero to this country. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Story 18, Ben, take two, marker. I am a retired uh, Marine. Uh, doing nearly 24 years in the Marine Corps. About every three or four years, the Marine Corps uh, moves you, your whole household, it uproots you. Connecticut was open, and I said, well, I'll take the Connecticut because my wife is from Connecticut. Constantly moving wasn't the hardest part of Ben's job. Among his responsibilities was the sad duty of informing the next of kin when a soldier had died in combat. Then when we start the procedure of getting the remains home, I get to the funeral home. I open it to make sure his uniform and everything is correct. I'm gonna make sure he's ready for a presentation. And then uh, I'm there with the family every day. We're looking for a place to live at now in Connecticut to, uh, to settle down. We were looking around the state, you know, some of the nicer areas, and somehow this email popped up with this house in Merida. So we're like, we'll go check it out, you know. So as we pulled in the driveway, uh, we saw this huge barn in the back. Ben and his wife Janice experienced a strong draw towards the barn. people had packed up all their tubs and stuck them out there. And they all said Janice on it, which was my wife's name. And took that as a sign, first of all, that her name was on it all over the inside of the barn. So 
So when we went in the house to see the family who owned the house, a gentleman and his wife, turned out he was a Marine. So with all those signs, uh, we said, no, this must be the house. Uh, we bought the house in December and ended up moving in in January. But I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the barn. And suddenly, it just started coming to me. And I started hanging up uh, my flags that we had flown in Fallujah. We started uh, putting up things on the walls just of, of my time in, in the Marines. We have pictures of everybody uh, who was killed while we were over there, um, of everybody who I had to notify their families. Uh, those who have come back and have committed suicide, we've added them to the, their pictures to the wall. So when people come up there, they can see them, um, remember them the way they were. The barn became a memorial to the soldiers that Ben had encountered during his military career. As Ben settled into his new home, he continued to be drawn to the barn. There's times you can go up there and it's just kind of odd. And the wind started picking up. Started hearing the dogs running back and forth upstairs in the barn. So we went to go check on the dogs. And the dogs weren't up there. There was nobody there. There was nothing there. Came back downstairs, and the wind and everything just stopped. I was in my house one night, about 9, 9.30, when I suddenly get, I get these feelings when my hair stands up. They say, you need to come out to the barn. I have no explanation for it. It's just, I get a sense, and I go out to the barn. Ben was certain that he had heard footsteps upstairs. And you can clearly hear footsteps and running back and forth up there, uh, shuffling. And the wind and everything just stopped. And then as I looked on the wall, one of the pictures of the guys that had been taken off the nail. And when you look at that little edge, ledge there, there's no way it could have fell that far. It was obviously taken down, set. And it was off the nail. Not only was it off the nail, but the nail was gone. I said, something's wrong. And I couldn't figure out what. And I, I sat there for a little while. And, I, and uh, I said, something's happened to somebody. Or somebody's going in that spot. And it's not going to be a Marine. Which at the time, I was very concerned, because my oldest son was in Afghanistan in the Army. Ben was deeply troubled, but did his best to put the worrying thoughts out of his mind. The next day, I went to a benefit concert. Uh, someone comes up to me and says, hey, Ben, we have a mother over here, and she's crying. Do you mind talking to her? I say, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking to her, and it turned out uh, her son was in the Army. He had lost both legs in Afghanistan, uh, came back, and got killed in a car accident. So I was trying to make her feel better and, and uh, talking to her about the barn. And she goes, well, I have a picture of him. Can you hang it in the barn? So I brought it back. This was the next day after that night at the barn. So I brought that back and I put that picture. So it was almost, 
this, the, the crazy coincidences, I don't know. But I mean, the barn told me there was going to be somebody. My mind starts saying, OK, am I imagining this stuff? Am I making this stuff up for myself? You know, because uh, being in the war you know, so many times, or and I almost thought, do I need to go to a psychiatrist? And I had this barn gathering. I do it once a year. And Kurt happened to come to it. He was a Vietnam era vet. I met Ben when we were both members of a veterans organization that was concerned with fundraising for veterans activities. And he found out what I do is a, uh, a vocation, paranormal investigation. And we talked about a few minutes. He goes, you know, if you like, you know, I, I'd like to come and set up at the barn. At the time, I wasn't good with it. Um, it was many, many months before I felt comfortable with the notion of him coming and doing the cameras. And I didn't want to say there's nothing here and maybe kill it for the families who did believe. I was still very neutral, but I was at the point where my head was really confused on everything that was happening in the barn and that so many other people were noticing also. Ben's hope was that Kurt would provide answers to the unexplained events in the barn. The day of the investigation, we arrived about 7 o'clock. We set up our cameras. We set up recording equipment, uh, infrared illuminators. It's really hot here, Ben. Former Marine Ben Granger was having strange experiences in his barn. Yeah. I'm getting something here. It's really hot here, Ben. He turned to a paranormal investigator to find answers. I've been investigating the paranormal for about 35 years. This was probably the most intense experience that I personally had had in all that time. It definitely wanted to, to let me know it was around. And it did. Dave. Oh, oh, man. Dave. But I was basically, holy shit. That's all I could say. We were able to confirm a lot of the things that Ben had claimed. You could see a dark figure standing to the left of him. There's no mistaking that is a human body. They realize that they're not crazy, that there is something going on there, and someone else was able to prove it. You see that? Yeah. And just as the shadow figure passed in front of Ben, we'd heard the name Dave loud and clear. Unbelievable. The next steps were to bring Karen Hollis in. Karen Hollis is a psychic medium with a gift for contacting spirits. Before I even got to Ben's house, uh, I was turning the corner. And no sooner did I turn the corner than I heard in my backseat of my vehicle, hi, I'm Dave. Dave. And then I knew I had a discarnate spirit with me already. Karen, as a clairaudient medium, has the ability to make contact with 
deceased family members, deceased friends. She was able to tell Ben things that she could not possibly have had prior knowledge of. My take on Ben when I, uh, when I mentioned that Dave's name was that he immediately kind of recoiled and looked at me in a very confused way, as if to say, how do you know who Dave is? As Karen began her investigation, she knew she was not alone. first. And David was the first casualty that I had to notify the mother. Karen explained to Ben that the barn memorial had drawn the spirits of Dave and other fallen soldiers. I do believe a memorial acts as an invitation to open up a portal for spirits to come back and come through. Spirits will use that memorial or that invitation to maybe get one last message across. I started to experience um, voices. Each one of the uh, men in the barn started to uh, tell their story one after the other. And then I would see and experience flashes of um, the battle uh, of his particular death. Dave uh, stood by each one of the uh, young men as they came forward, and he let them tell their stories first. He was the last one to tell his story. Former Marine Ben Granger was having strange experiences in his barn and had invited in a medium. She quickly made contact with one of the soldiers from Ben's past. Dave uh, left himself for very last to tell his story. And he spoke of uh, how, he was, how he was hit um, and how the bullet went and hit him in the head and how he was killed. He gave me very specific information to tell Ben, and knowing that if he gave me that evidential information, Ben would know that it was definitely him. And he said to tell Ben that he specifically appreciated the fact that Ben had taken special care to make sure that the mortician had worked to cover the left-hand side of his head because it had taken out a part of his skull and he did not want his mother or his father to be upset by that wound. I knew this because when I prepared the body for viewing at the funeral home, we placed a big white towel underneath his head to kind of hide all the bandages where, where the funeral home had fi fixed him up. So when you looked at him, you had no idea there was a hole in the side of his head. He was the very first one that I notified when I moved to Connecticut, and I had to go notify a family um, that he was killed. And he almost burst into tears because he knew it was Dave. He knew there was no way that it could be anyone else. Knowing that the ghost soldiers were sending positive messages, Ben was reassured they meant no harm. He felt the spirits supported his efforts to honor them. And these young men wanted him to know how much they appreciated him. In fact, uh, one of the young men even spoke about that there was always an honor guard there at the, at the barn. And that's why they were hearing footsteps. And they would hear the footsteps all night long sometimes. And it's the most well-guarded uh, barn, I think, in Meriden, Connecticut. I do believe that the type of people we are when we're alive carries over into the spirit realm a sense of duty, of protection that you did once here on, on Earth, um, you can have that same desire to do that in the spirit realm. 
As a Marine, your job's never done. You take care of your Marines. And it felt a sense that even though these guys had lost their lives, and there's quite a few on the wall, um, that I was still in a sense taking care of them and allowing them to maybe get closure with their family, see their families, put them even in spirit form in a better or happier place, um, which is the barn. Losing a life while serving in the military can leave a lot unsaid. With no preparation to leave the physical world, fallen soldiers have been known to travel across continents to get a message home. Christian interview, take one. Uh, I joined the military in 2006. And I did deploy to Afghanistan uh, with Task Force 110 uh, in May of 2010. I was, I was excited but scared. The idea of going overseas to me is why I joined the military. Um, and it's kind of in my family. My, uh, as far as my name goes back, there's somebody that's been in the military. On uh, the 24th of May, we were doing a normal resupply mission. I was the rear security for the vehicle. So uh, in the crewman trade, we call it the gib. That guy in back, he stands uh, in the back of the vehicle and uh, watches out of the rear. And my vehicle ended up striking an IED. The explosion would have a lasting effect on Christian. I was ejected uh, about 120 feet or so from the vehicle. After that, all I remember is yelling for my driver, and uh, I got no response. Christian's driver had been badly wounded. I remember doing first aid on him, and uh, I, then I lost consciousness uh, due to shock. Uh, he unfortunately was killed that day. Because of my Injuries, I had to come home early. Um, and my daughter was born November 11th, so I was, I was able to uh, witness the birth and see my daughter born. And, and I, I, I remember holding her for the first time. It was the, the best day of my life. After the trauma of combat, Christian was grateful for the tranquility of family life. But the calm would prove to be short-lived. I start hearing knocking that you kind of just brush off because you thought it's your house creaking or expanding. And it's just intensified, that's all. I thought somebody was in the house. And uh, I have some kit from when I was overseas. Christian D'Andrea had recently experienced the death of his friend while on duty in Afghanistan, quickly followed by the birth of his daughter. His instincts were on high alert when he thought he heard an intruder in his home. And I freaked out and just grabbed my gun. and I walk through around my house and there's nothing there. I kind of just tried to brush it off and ignore it. But the events were not so easily ignored. One day I was talking to my neighbors. Uh, I think me and my neighbor outside having a cigarette. 
we're just talking, and I asked him, like, what time are you putting the girls to bed? And, and he's just, just like, well, they've been in bed since 6.30, 7. And I was just like, oh. He goes, why? I was like, well, I keep hearing banging and running over from your place. And he said the same thing. He's like, well, I thought you guys were fooling around or whatever because I can hear the same thing. And that's when I started thinking that there's something else there. One of Christian's friends also had strange experiences in the house. What she told me is she saw three things standing behind her. <laughs> and then they all turned and walked away. And when she turned around, there was nothing there. I was like, okay, well, you're over-exaggerating. I think there's something in the house. I have no idea what it is. So she went over next door and got my neighbor. And he came over and searched my house, and there was nothing there. Uh, she was scared to be in there. If I'm in the basement, if I'm walking past the basement stairs, it looks like there's someone standing at the bottom of the stairs. And then I look, and there's nothing there. But you can hear footsteps, legitimate footsteps, walking up and down the hallway. I thought someone was in the house. I, I, I don't even know how to explain it. You can feel a vibe of like somebody else is in the house. And that bothered me. Like you, you have that helpless feeling. When you're dealing with something that I like to term as a phantom draft or a phantom vibration, it's a lot different. You feel a sense that n not only is your spider sense is tingling, but you know that something's there and you may catch something at the corner of your eye. When it gets that strong, the indications are a good percentage that you may be visited by um, an unknown entity. I was in my house alone. Uh, Isabella was with her mother for the weekend, and I was laying in bed, and it sounded like someone was actually punching the wall behind, from the room behind me. My headboard actually shook and smacked up against the wall a few times. At first, I was scared, uh, like, what, what's going on? Who's that? What is that? The force went from shaking the bed to pressure on Christian's chest, disabling him. I can't move, I can't yell, I can't talk, I can't uh, do anything. And uh, it stands, it, it feels like someone's sitting or standing on my chest. It almost looks like someone's kind of standing in the room, watching, I guess. Then I wake up a little while later and I'm just scared. Like, you just, what just happened to me? A lot of time the spirit will appear at nighttime, and uh, I've dealt with many cases of spirits going, um, hovering over somebody's bed or beside them. A lot of times it is to give a message, and that theme is always reoccurring. It's, it's there for a reason. Um, what that reason is is hard to detect, but usually it's to give a message, um, to tell you something, maybe forewarn you of something, or simply to say, I know you can see me, what are you gonna do about it? The events were escalating. Christian's daughter became scared to sleep in her bedroom. She said, there's a man in my closet. There's a man in my room. And I asked, like, okay, does he hurt you? Does he touch you? Does he talk to you? What does he do? And, she, and all she would say is, uh, he talks, or he stands there, um, and it scares her, because it's dark. I, I actually thought somebody was coming into my house, but my doors are always locked. You have to walk through, you have to walk past my room to get into my, to get to Isabella's room, and it was winter, and so I looked outside, and there was no footprints leading up to her, any of the windows, and my little doors were still locked in the morning, I took the closet door off, and uh, actually I put a, uh, 
a camera in her room to see what was going on, and I caught nothing. And then I thought I was sleepwalking, so I would put uh, baby powder uh, in the door or uh, in the hallway. It was out of my door. Nothing. Nothing was ever there. So I thought, okay, well, something's going on. After returning from a tour of duty in Afghanistan, Christian D'Andrea had been experiencing strange events in his home. Uh, my mom was, she was sitting on the couch. Isabella was at daycare, I believe. And a picture flew off the wall. So it was just like, okay. She called me right away. I came home, I looked. Well, she didn't touch anything. She left it there so I could see it. And it was uh, a picture of Isabella uh, uh, about three and a half feet from the wall. And my mom said it just came off and dropped. A spirit would push over a picture or move an object to get attention if it's trying to tell you something. And it has enough energy to manifest itself in our physical realm to move an object, because it does take a lot of energy to do that. But most of the time, it is to um, grab your attention of something it wants to tell you. Oh, uh, when I saw the picture frame, it was, uh, everything became real then. I was nervous, because I, I didn't know what it was. It, it's, it's now taking objects and moving them. And, like, that's glass. What happens if that happened? Because Isabella has a chair underneath where that was, and that's where she puts her shoes on. So I was just like, what happens if Isabella was there and this glass falls and hits her? So that's when I got scared and that's when I contacted uh, Katie because now it's moving things and throwing things. Like, what's next? Katie Turner is a paranormal investigator with the Petawawa Supernatural Research Society. As soon as we walked into the house alone, I felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. Whoever it was, did not want me there. I was just a little skeptical, so I didn't tell her much about my past. Uh, I told her basically what was going on, that uh, like a picture just flew off the wall. Uh, my daughter's sometimes afraid of everything. Uh, I need help. There was something clearly wrong in the situation. This one particular entity did not want us in the residence. I was getting pain in my arm, and I was getting pain in my head. I was getting a very bad headache. I could feel, I could hear, I could see um, an entity. As Katie started to make contact with the spirit, she was guided downstairs to the basement. We have a PSB7 spirit box, and what it does is it sweeps through radio frequencies at an extremely fast rate, and it is able to pick up, it's almost like a phone for the spiritual side. So they are able to, to talk through it, and we can hear them in real time. So we ask questions, and it will answer. And as soon as I got into the basement, I knew right away. That's where I picked up um, Christian's friend. She asked, uh, are you attached to the house or are you attached to the family? And you can hear family. Uh, what do you think of Christian? He's a good man. Uh, are you worried about him? Yes. She said it was someone, that's, uh, someone that you knew. 
I could feel an entity. Um, he was very standoffish. He did not want us to be there. He was nervous. It wasn't as if he was evil. He just didn't want us there. In that area was some kit and equipment that Christian had. And I believe that there was an attachment there to it. Katie told him that the spirit was his friend and driver the day of the explosion in Afghanistan. So I was like, okay, well maybe this, maybe she's not crazy. Maybe she's real. You have people in this world that are very strong and they're dominant and they have a lot of will and determination. I believe that same will and determination can alter the frequencies in the supernatural realm to give more of a powerful energy as to somebody who is maybe a little bit more reserved while living. It was a lot to take in at once, um, a little emotional, but uh, it felt good at the same time, knowing that it's not some random man, it's uh, somebody I know, who I know was uh, a gentle guy, a gentle man, um, meant no harm to anybody, uh, just wanted attention, and now he has it. He was a, a, a war hero to this country, so he may be gone, but he's still here, and uh, it just proves that uh, they're gone but not forgotten. Now that Christian understands the presence in his home, the violent episodes have stopped, and he knows that his fallen comrade remains by his side. When a person passes away with outstanding business to take care of, that's often enough of a reason for them to stick around in the physical world until they can give their message. Story 10, take one. My mother and I and my brother moved into the home when I was about five years old. That was probably 1957. My great-grandfather built the home. He ordered it through Sears catalog, put it together by a number, <laughs> followed the directions. I grew up there, went to school there, have still friends and family in the neighborhood. It's a fabulous house but many skeletons live in that house. <laughs> My mother and I were sitting in the front room, and it was about 10 o'clock at night on a school night. My daughter was in bed. She had been there since like 8 o'clock. And all of a sudden, she comes flying down the steps with this scared look on her face, saying the stereo came on. And I just kind of, yeah, okay. It's just the radio, huh? It's okay. I'm okay. okay. And I says, something must have started it. And was about 20 minutes later, after I had tucked her back in, Again, it just turned on by itself. She said, Mom, I'm not sleeping in there because the stereo turned on again. I thought, well, maybe the plug was jostled. You know, I, I just kind of wrote it off. I didn't think any more about it. But the stereo switching on by itself turned out to be just the beginning. It was after that that I started hearing things in the kitchen. I worked afternoon, so I would come in to relax, unwind, watch the news. And I would hear things jiggle, like when somebody opens a refrigerator, the bottles. And cupboard doors, same thing. I hear them open. I have a magnetic strip that holds them shut, and I'll hear it click like somebody opened it. I'd go in and refrigerator door was closed. 
Nothing's moved, nothing's changed, everything's the same. A day or two later, I was upstairs, making sure everything was ready for the next day of school. And I came down the steps from upstairs and the kitchen cupboard doors, there was three of them open. And I went to check to see if my son had been up in the kitchen and he wasn't. And I shut the doors, went back and sat down. I was doing some homework myself. And the door was open and I didn't hear it open. And I was sitting there. <laughs> And then when my son was in the basement, he made the basement his bedroom. And I had gone to the basement steps to say goodnight. Judy Spihar had lived in her family home for decades when she started noticing strange events. The incidents started to occur more frequently and became more frightening. And I turned around and there was this dark image right behind me. It was not black, but almost a, a dark gray. And I, I covered my face. I would tell people my stories and they'd all look at me like I was crazy. Well, oh, it's just a imagination thing. You know, nothing like that happens. There's no such, such thing as spirits or ghosts. Judy struggled to understand the weird incidents. I'm sleeping one night and then I, I could hear something, but I, I wasn't sure what it was. And I could feel like somebody walking with their hands and knees up the side of me. I could feel the indent in the mattress. It was scary. At first I thought it was the dog moving and I noticed the dog was in the same spot. And then I was thinking it was the cat because I have two cats and there was nothing there. I have a street light that that comes in through the window. And there was nothing there, but I could feel the indent. The bizarre events could no longer be ignored. Judy needed help. My sister-in-law introduced me to Ken so that we could find out if there really was something or if it was my imagination. When we first got to Judy's house, the overwhelming feeling in the house was that the presences that were there, it did feel like family. During the investigation, we kept getting in, you know, a series of EVPs, call Beth. Beth, Beth. Very emphatic. It was definitely a man's voice. When Ken told me, I was flabbergasted. I didn't, I didn't know what to say because I hadn't thought of Beth in years. Beth was married to my brother, Mike, who had passed away. Mike had died in the late 1970s in a farming accident. I believe that they may tap around the person that they want and go to somebody else because maybe they can communicate better with them. Maybe that can be more of a um, I'd like to use the term a, a validation of who it is, and then that person can take the message over, and it's easy to hear that way sometimes. I went on Facebook to see if I could find her, and luckily I, I did. Mike and I were married in December of 68. We had four days to plan our wedding. 
We had 10 days together honeymooning before he left for Vietnam. So January of 70 was when he returned. And uh, we filed for divorce because when he returned, he was so, so different than he was when he left. A lot of years, I carried a lot of guilt because I didn't stick with him like our vow said. Beth was not the only one with unsettled emotions. Well, at this point, it's pretty clear that somebody wants to get a message to Beth. So I went to the investigation, and it was after midnight. In my mind, I was more concerned about what does this spirit want with her in the first place. I kept feeling cold breezes on the back of my neck, or the hair would stand up on my arm. What I sensed was that there was a lot more energy in the room. Beth heard something that blew her mind. We could hear Mike saying, Beth, I love you. Oh, it's still gives me goosebumps. <clears throat> Beth's dead ex-husband, Mike, had made contact. I believe entities can come back if they have unfinished business, especially if they die tragically, they can come back to give a message. My whole body got that sense of being shocked. I mean, from my fingers to my toes and all the hair on my body stood up, and it was like a jolt of electricity shooting right through me. Hearing from him and hearing him say that, that he still loved me, and it made me realize that he wasn't angry at me or, um, that I could let go of the guilt I'd been carrying around. And it just gave me so much more peace. So that was important for me to know that he wasn't like mad at me or it's almost, I felt like he was still hanging around because he needed to get that message to me because he could see all these years I was carrying around all this guilt for not staying with him. Mike wanted her there for a reason. He wanted to make a closure, I believe, of what was going on with him and her. He wanted her to know that he was OK and that what they had done was the right thing. And how do you feel about the house now? I always feel comfortable in the home. I love it. Um, I just wish I could figure out who's crawling up the bed. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. As spirits return from the dark side to deliver evil messages. This can't really be happening. You can't explain the fear. I've never been that scared in my entire life. I wanted to get out of that house. Be prepared to be afraid. Story 20C, take five. Marker? Kelsey's not bad. Uh, the nice thing about it, it's still a smaller city. I was looking online at all these different houses, and it was the right time, good prices, and easy to get mortgages. So, made a move. 
it was a foreclosure, so that makes it a lot easier to buy a house in decent condition. I actually didn't know a lot about my house before I bought it because it was a foreclosure. So pretty much the online listing said, um, home located in Kalamazoo, great condition, um, sold as is. Everything was great the first few months of the house. Um, never had any issues. I met Dave about February of 2013. Uh, we started talking online. One day I bothered him enough to meet me, so <laughs> he did and kind of hit it off. There were some issues in July, and I was actually moving to Kalamazoo, so Dan said one day, you know, well, move in with me. <laughs> uh, he moved in about uh, September last year. My first impression of Dan's house was it was, it was a very nice house, you know. It was a good starter home. The first few days after David moved in, everything was good. Um, we never had any issues at the house. Um, it was just peaceful. The next few months, everything was calm all through holidays. The first experiences we had was right after we had visited my brother for the 4th of July. We had come home and my brother had given us this Bible. Didn't think anything of this Bible. He just had it sitting on an end table at the house. We got home and we were both tired, so we laid down and it was probably 12 or one o'clock and I had the TV on still. I don't know where the door just slowly shuts. I got up and opened the door again. And there's nothing there. I laid back down and you could just hear creaking along the bed right next to me. A minute later, I heard something fall in the kitchen. I stayed up all night worrying something would happen. The next morning, he told me about it, and I was a little skeptical. Um, I hadn't experienced anything in the house. First occurrence, I was home by myself. It was during the day I just got home from work. I heard in the kitchen the dining room chair slam against the floor. Then I heard running across the uh, kitchen. And the basement door fly open and hit the wall. So I hurry up and walk towards the kitchen area. And I see the basement door moving still because it opened with such force. And I see shoes scattered like they're just thrown down the kitchen area. My logical side is fighting with me, saying this can't really be happening, but deep down inside, I'm terrified. That was the first occurrence that I had at the house. When you're dealing with any type of uh, aggravated spirit, they will do whatever they can. Obviously, the um, more energy that a spirit has, the greater the damage that they can do. Within a few minutes, David actually came home. Dan looked very startled. You could just tell that something just happened to Dan that he couldn't explain. After that happened, the rest of the day, every little sound 
you'd be worried that something else was going to happen. It goes from you being the sole person to experience it to, okay, now it's an event. Now it became real because you're not the only one. Putting aside the signs that something was potentially amiss in his home, Dan went to work on a renovation project in the basement while David was out. I was in the basement by myself. I was working on replacing some doors in the house. So I was chiseling out the hinges and cutting out um, where the door handles go. And as I was working on that, um, the cat had actually come downstairs and she was by me while I was working. And um, the cat was looking towards the back of the basement and then she stops and she starts growling. And then she starts backing up. At that point, she gets right by to where I'm at and she starts swatting and hissing really loudly. And she's so frantic to get away that she actually does a backflip and flaps right on her back and is flailing around and she runs up the basement stairs. I actually told Dan that the back corner of the basement behind the entertainment room, it was just like hitting a wall. You'd walk back there and out of nowhere, you just hit this cold spot where your hair would stand on end and you just felt this chill and you could just tell there was something very unsettling about that space. So at that point, I go upstairs, and I get up there, and she's in the living room staring right towards the basement door. At that point, I'm walking towards her, and she's just looking right through me or trying to look around me just at the door. And um, she gets frantic again, starts clawing towards that area, and she just runs right to the bedroom, and she won't come out the rest of the day. I got home after, that, after what happened to Dan in the basement probably 30 minutes later. You know, I went downstairs and started working on a project that I was working on while Dan went back to his doors. And Kitty, of course, was right next to you. She wanted to leave you. Well, I turned around and I, I was staring at Kitty and she started swatting at the air out of nowhere, you know, just swatting at the air. And Dan walked up to the door and he asked me, you know, what are you doing? And I, I just let out a rather loud shh in the back corner, three seconds later, you could hear a woman in a woman's voice going, shh, back at me. We both said in sync, you know, did you just hear that? That was the first occurrence where we were both aware and we both heard at the same time. We probably didn't go back in the basement for anything other than laundry after that. After a couple of days with no recurring incidents, Dan and David started to think it must have been their imagination. We were sitting on the couch and I kept like glancing back at the hallway just because a moment before I saw something. Dan Engblom and David Powers had been experiencing weird paranormal activity in their home, and it was getting too much for David to bear. We were sitting on the couch, and I kept like glancing back at the hallway just because a moment before I saw something. I said, I, I think I'm seeing someone in the guest bedroom. You think that you see it, but then as soon as you go to look at it, it's not there. He didn't really acknowledge it. He thought I was crazy. Still skeptical that anything paranormal was happening in his home, Dan was alone one night while David went to the gym. I was watching um, a TV show, and that's when a loud bang happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw shadows from the kitchen area. After that happened, the lights in the um, kitchen and the living room all dimmed, and then they flickered out. 
and then they came back on. It felt like my heart dropped at that point. There was a very musty body odor smell that you couldn't really pinpoint where it was coming from. You'd just smell it, and then it'd be gone. At that point, I just ran out of the house, and I waited until uh, David got home, and we stayed outside for about an hour after he got back. I was terrified. I did believe Dan. You know, Dan's a very rational person. So when he says, you know, he can't explain something, then I, I'd have to believe him. At that point, I knew we needed to contact someone and try and figure out what was going on and get some help. Terrified that the unexplained events in their home would get worse, Dan and David called in a father-daughter paranormal investigation team. The intent and the purpose of the pre-investigation is to gather relevant information and to substantiate if what they've told us is accurate and true. Just pulling up in the drive, you know, I looked at my dad and told him something's off. And then definitely once we walked into the home, there was a very heavy feeling. It felt dark. I was very relieved when they first came because it, it was a step towards something. So seeing the video cameras and uh, the tape recorders, all that, it, it makes it more real. Well, during the walkthrough, uh, we had them take us to the locations that they had specific issues that they could go back and, you know, and, and outline for us. We deployed all of our recorders. We used K2 meters. We also used an ovulus. They used their infrared camera and took pictures throughout the house. Thermal imaging, our thermal imaging camera, allows us to see in a realm that our eyes aren't able to. They did use the camera on the cat a few times. They actually picked up a really compelling picture they had of uh, there's actually a hand on the cat's back as she was looking up. You could see this arm and hand right on her. And it's like 30 degrees cooler than the cat's temperature. And you can see a hand going along its back. Having witnessed and collected enough evidence, Alan and Anna left the home to sort through their findings. Right after that first investigation, we did exchange a few emails back and forth. One of the emails, I was actually getting ready for work, and I was in the bathroom getting ready, and I saw an email come in, and I'm reading this email from them, and as I'm reading it, I hear footsteps down the hallway. I open the door, and I walk out of the bathroom, and David's in the bedroom. David. Don't believe this email I just got. And I'm telling him about the email that I had just gotten from Alan and Anna. And as I'm doing that, he stops me and he's like, there's someone behind you. All you hear just stands up on your arms. You just get this primal fear. It's a very old man with sunken in cheeks and it's a face you'll never forget. You know that there's something there. I've never been that scared in my entire life, especially when it's looking right at you. The email from Alan and Anna said that they're 100% sure that there is something going on at the house. They had uh, sound recordings and um, infrared images that confirmed and showed all the evidence. I'm scared I don't have to sell my house. Due to the findings, we made arrangements to get right back, and I think it was three days later we conducted our investigation. Alan and Anna came out for the second time. After about a few hours in is when there started to be a little activity. Alan and Anna were downstairs in the basement. They had the spare box on this old tool chest that I got from my dad, and Alan kept trying to ask who was down there. 
What's your name? He was asking if someone was down there um, to say something to let them know that they're there. After he said one more time, give us a sign that you're down here, the box actually spun on top of the tool chest. We understand that you like to hang out in this corner, is that true? After encountering paranormal phenomena in their home, Dan Engblom and David Powers called in an investigation team to try to get evidence of any haunting. Their team's findings shocked everyone. After he said one more time, give us a sign that you're down here, the box actually spun on top of the tool chest. We understand that you like to hang out in this corner, is that true? You gotta see this. I gotta stop it and back it up. We understand that you like to hang out in this corner. Is that true? I've never seen an object move in that manner. I mean, I could not replicate or debunk it. We knew something was there, and it had a strong enough energy to be able to manipulate an object that big. And so we knew it was probably serious. I 100% believe it to be paranormal. The next room we went into was the guest bedroom. They had hoped that they'd be able to speak to the old man. They did get him to interact a few times through the uh, spirit box. We were in there for probably 15 minutes and the spirit box went from being very quiet to being very noisy with an old grumpy man talking through it. saying F this and F that and F you and get the F out and just saying all these obscene, very vulgar things. I had a meter in my hand that uh, would go off when there was electromagnetic field near it. There were points where the meter would completely peg and my arm, I was holding the meter and my arm would just start shaking uncontrollably. I just had this electrical sensation pulsing through the left side of my body. And then out of nowhere, it just grabs me by the ankles. It felt like we were being bullied out of our own home, yeah. It felt like whatever was there was manipulating us. A spirit, if given the proper energy, some of them can go beyond just moving objects. Some of them could actually uh, physically harm people. Because even though their physical body's not here, their emotions still remain the same. Now that physical things were happening, it felt like we're in more danger. We were done at that moment. I didn't want to do anything else. I told them we're not doing anything else. They packed up all their equipment and they left. I felt like whatever was there didn't like us and wanted us out of the house. We didn't stay there again after that. At that point, I felt defeated. I felt completely helpless because we had just gone through all of this and you had the hopes that we had resolved it and it just wasn't the case. Having reached their wits end, Dan and David moved out of their home and stayed with friends. It was probably a week after all this happened that Dan finally called the medium. I was skeptical about believing whether or not she could fix it. Yes. As soon as we walked in the house, we go downstairs and the medium said that she could sense a little girl. The little girl kept saying that she was hiding. She hid in the basement, and then she said that she killed him. It was her fault. And the medium asked her, what's your fault? And she said, the fire. She said there was a fire, and she did what her mommy and daddy told her to do. 
she said that she went downstairs when there was the fire because her parents told her that if anything ever happened, to hide in the basement. Right away, you just smell fire. You just smell like fire all around you. The little girl said that she lived in a farmhouse and she went in the basement to hide like she was told. And her, she said she heard her mom and dad calling for her. And they came downstairs. And she said that the stairs collapsed. And it was her fault that they all died down there. The medium felt that it happened probably 100 years ago or more. And it was on the land that this had happened, not necessarily the home that I live in now, just the same location. She told the little girl that it's not her fault that her parents are gone, and told her that um, her parents are in the light, and she needed to go to the light to find her parents, because that's all the little girl wanted was her parents. And she said that she found them. At the light, she found them. And little girl, you just, just smell a fire went away. It just got a little bit lighter. And you just felt good because you just felt like you helped. We made our way back upstairs at that point. Dan Engblom and David Powers were being haunted by the spirit of an old man. They enlisted the help of a medium to cleanse their house of negative energy. It's cold and dark. We made our way back upstairs at that point, and the medium was able to come across the old man in the uh, dining area. She said the man was very vulgar. He said he was making a lot of uh, profane statements, and he said he didn't approve of us living in his home in sin. And he said he was a good Christian man, and it's not fair that he had to die the way he did while we were living in sin in his home. What had set everything off was when we brought that Bible into the house. And the Bible made him angry because he had always been very religious, and he felt betrayed. If the person that lived in that house who had died was of the Christian faith, sometimes the anger that somebody has or a spirit has is enough to fuel the energy it needs. We had um, discovered that he was saying that he was trying to get into the attic and the ladder fell out and he fell down into the basement, onto the basement stairs, and that's where he had died. After we learned how he died, um, we realized that he was not at peace, and we just wanted him to be able to move on. The medium helped the spirit come to terms with his death, allowing him to cross over peacefully. After they just were able to talk to him about his death, they burned sage throughout the house. We could feel his presence there for a little bit longer. Um, gradually, it did fade. And since that day, there's not been another occurrence of anything from him. He had been there all that time and was trapped and had so much resentment that he couldn't move on. Ever since the medium came in, things have been perfect. After they left, the house feels completely different. It felt like, um, homey again like it used to. Part of me wonders if I'll always be afraid to fall back asleep in the house by myself. Always in the back of your mind that fear that, that something's gonna happen again. It's just not something that I feel I'll ever get over. When an entity has an evil intention, the effects on the living can be utterly devastating. Twenty-four, take three, maybe common, self check mark. Mm -hmm. 
My name is Tony Rogers. I'm from Lake Simcoe, a little town called Town of Georgina. It's a nice tourist area. People come through, go fishing. Me and my husband, we were looking for a quiet place to live. We just got married a, a year prior, so we wanted somewhere where we can raise our children and enjoy a, a nice, quiet town and a place for the kids to grow up and have that small community feeling where everybody knows everybody. found out that I was pregnant. My husband was working in the city. I used to work at a daycare. I was talking to one of the neighbors and they were looking for a babysitter. So I just got a babysitting job. And she's a very happy-go-lucky little girl and she's just a joy, and plus, she was just directly right behind my house. So it worked out perfect. I would take down the laundry to the basement. And then I had this weird feeling that I'm being watched in their basement, and I was like uneasy. So I just dropped the clothes down there and I ran back up and it's like, uh, you get that eerie feeling. And Telling my husband, you know, like, I don't know, it just feels weird being in that house. It's just not, it just feels uneasy in that house. Like I'm being watched and he's like, yeah, it's just probably you're pregnant and whatever. And it's just hormones and don't worry about it. With no one taking her experiences seriously, Tony continued babysitting at the neighbor's house. I talk to my family about it, my sister, my brothers, and they all kind of brush it off. My dad would always say, just make the sign of the cross and believe in God and everything will be fine. Tony leaned on her faith and tried to shake the unexplained feeling that she was being watched in her neighbor's house. One time, it must have been like maybe a couple of weeks into the babysitting, I felt like I needed like, you know, a nap. The mom actually told me, if you ever get tired, there's a spare room right next to the baby's room. There's a monitor if she wakes up. and then all of a sudden you feel like you're being watched. I opened my eyes and then couldn't move. And then all of a sudden these four things were like right there, like on two on each side of the bed. And they're looking down at me as I'm looking up, but I couldn't scream or move or nothing. And they were like in brown hooded robes. There's no face. It was like darkness. The 
baby all of a sudden started to fuss in her crib, and all of a sudden I just jolted up. I looked in around and there's nothing there. I ran to see the baby and checked her out and she was fine. Called my husband and said, you know, they had this weird experience and this house is weird. There's like these four robed monks around my the bed. And he's like, oh, it's probably just a dream. Don't worry about it. There have been many cases involving um, what we like to call either incubus or succubus cases, where a person will say that they had a dream that they were surrounded by beings without faces, and they've um, felt an overwhelming fear come through them and, and almost paralyzed, um, where they couldn't move. They knew what was going on, they can see what was going on, but they couldn't do anything about it. And then the second time it happened, it was more intense. <laughs> It was 1992, and Tony Rogers was babysitting at her neighbor's house. She went to take a nap, but realized she was not alone. And I laid in the bed, and um, I got the same feeling again. And I saw five of them this time. And it was like two on each side. One was in front of me. I was trying to scream, couldn't scream, trying to call for help, but no voices coming out. And there's this one at the foot of the bed, and he reaches out his hand, and he had long claw nails kind of thing. And he went like over my stomach and scratched me. I did the sign of the cross with my tongue, and that's when I was released. You can't explain the fear. Like, it's like terrifying feeling. Especially like, you can't explain what it was. When dealing with the demonic, um, a lot of times, anything that involves a demon is usually never nice. Um, one of the big things that demons um, prey off of is fear, um, instilling fear into somebody. Was it a warning? Was it a sign? Was it a, to test me for my face? I have no idea. I just wanted to forget about it, and I just let it go. <laughs> I'm like freaked out, called my husband, and I said, this thing actually scratched me. I think there's something going on with the baby, like they're out to get my baby or something. He's like, oh, don't be ridiculous, like it's okay. And I'm like, no, I actually have a scratch mark on my stomach, like something scratched me. I can't be here anymore. And he's like, don't worry about it. We have an ultrasound coming up in a couple of days. Everything's gonna be fine. But at that moment, I knew, like, there's something that's not right with the baby. I don't know what or why those things were there, but as a pregnant mother, I knew there was something not right. So I told the lady, I said, um, I, I can't do this anymore. So we went for the ultrasound and then they found that there was something wrong with the baby. He was born on um, April 26. Complications, his uh, chest cavity was too small for his lungs and he lived for 13 days and we had to take him off life support and I had to say goodbye. I'm living in this house and the plans were to have children. Feeling like a, a failure as a mom, as a wife, as a person. Six 
months later, I got pregnant again with our second child. And Jesse was born, and it turned out he was a boy, <laughs> and a healthy boy at that. You can't explain the excitement. Like, it's beyond happiness, being a mom. Things were, like, you know, good. Everything at the house was awesome. And, uh, you know, Dad went to work, Mom stayed at home, raised the baby, cleaned the house, you know, good old housewife. Tony was grateful for her second chance at being a mother, and all the unexplained incidents seemed to stop. Until one night, more than two years later. Jesse was two and a half. We were all sleeping. It was like two in the morning. We heard Jesse screaming at the top of his lungs. Mommy! Mom! Mommy! Mom! Me and my husband go to the room to check out the situation. Mommy! He was screaming that some man was trying to pull him inside the wall. I was scared for my son's well-being, my well-being, and I wanted to get out of that house. Fearing that the malevolent spirit that had been haunting her was now targeting her son, Tony decided to do some research on her house. I went to the town and got the city records of who lived in my house. Every six months to a year, people were moving in and out, and I've been there the longest. My husband was more skeptical, like he didn't believe. So then I just kept it to myself. I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't want people to think I'm nuts. Tony tried to dismiss the strange events as coincidence, but any hope that they would stop were soon dashed. I guess it was about 11, 30, 12, slip into bed. All of a sudden I see out of the closet coming some older woman. Rogers had been living with evil spirits in her home for years. So far, their intention seemed to be to harm her family. I guess it was about 11, 30, 12, slip into bed. All of a sudden I see out of the closet coming some older woman. She walks around the bed and she walks over towards on the other side where my husband's sleeping. She's placing these roses on top of his chest. And she spoke to me in Italian. She says, which means, don't worry, my child, everything will be fine. And as she did that, my husband started to choke because I felt like I was being choked or I, I felt pressure. I didn't understand it. And we just let it go at that. A couple of days later, I go to my mom's house. I was going through my parents' photo album, and I spotted this woman in this picture. She had black hair. She kind of looked like me, actually. Completely taken aback, Tony saw a photo of the same spirit that had visited her only a few nights previously. And I asked my mom, who is this lady? And my mom said, that's Nonna, like that's my mother. I was the only one out of the, my family that was born in Canada, and so I've never had the pleasure of meeting any of my grandparents. I was freaked out. Like, why would my grandmother come visit me with a dozen roses and put it on my husband? I believe that uh, there are spirits that stay behind for a little bit because they do have a message that they want to convey to um, 
to their family members, a loved one, friends, and uh, they won't move on until they get that message across. About a week later, my husband uh, packed his things and walked out on us. It kept playing in my mind, like, over and over again. Why would my grandmother come, come out of the closet with a dozen roses and say that it's going to be OK? And now it makes sense. She was protecting me or giving me a sign that my husband was planning to leave me because I was shocked when he decided to walk out. With the absence of her husband, Tony struggled to make ends meet for herself and her young son. That's when I decided to put my house up for sale. We put the house on the market. We got an interested buyer, a contractor, actually. He was planning to tear down and rebuild. He came for his inspection, and I wasn't allowed to be in the house at the time. I said to the contractor, make sure you close the door behind you, and I off I went. Come back home after an hour, and I noticed my front door is open. I walked in. Hello? Hello? Is anybody here? in my son's room and I noticed on his bed all the stuffed animals on my son's bed were upside down. Hello? And I look in the trap door and it's open and there's an extension cord with a triple light leading to the crawl space. Are you here? Hello? Is anyone here? real estate called me and said the contractor is not interested in the house. And I said to her, OK, um, I'm kind of ticked off because he left the front door open and he actually left a few tools and his trouble light here and it's turned on. The contractor said he wants nothing to do with the house and the lady's crazy for living there and to keep his tools. I was like angry and scared and like I didn't know what was going on. Like I thought, I don't know, the house was possessed or something. Like I can't explain it. Even the real estate, she said she can't get a hold of the contractor. Like she doesn't know what happened. I feel like it was a warning and if a spirit didn't want me to live in that house or my son, they would have had me kicked out long before, like, as soon as we moved in. I think that they want me to stay. So I just decided that I'm just going to stay here. And since then, my house has been really quiet. We feel like we're safe there now. There's an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I was so completely overcome with terror. As multiple witnesses remove any shred of doubt. Thank God it wasn't just me. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid.
Story 29, Lori, take one. Parker? My memories of my grandparents' house are all very frightening, nightmarish memories. I dreaded going over there. I never felt comfortable. I always felt like someone was watching me. I was always on edge, waiting for something to happen. Lori didn't know how to explain to other people the sense of foreboding that the house gave her. I remember I was in the house, sitting in the living room, and I heard someone laughing upstairs. I knew there was no one up there, and I didn't see anyone, but I could feel like there was someone there. <laughs> the laugh itself didn't sound like a happy, funny, that was a great joke kind of laugh. It was more of a sinister, I'm going to get you kind of laugh. Lori wasn't the only one who was sensitive to the atmosphere in the house. Her cousins noticed it too. When it was not nice outside, we would be sent into the basement to play. The heater was in the far back corner. And as long as I can remember, we would joke with each other that that's where the ghost was buried. Because next to the heater, there was a depression in the floor. Um, it was a very old kind of linoleum floor over dirt. And that part of the floor had kind of sunk down lower as the house settled. And it was the size and shape of a grave. It was very creepy. Up until now, Lori had just been a visitor at her grandparents' house. But that was all about to change. My parents divorced, and we moved to my grandparents' house. I was already not happy because my parents divorced, but the thought of having to live in that house it was like my worst nightmare coming true. So I felt like I was being sentenced to like some kind of long prison sentence. When we moved there, I noticed that no matter what time of year it was, there were certain areas in the house that were always freezing cold. One of them being my bedroom. Didn't make sense because my room got all the morning sun. It was on that side of the house. So it should have been bright, cheerful, and really warm, but it wasn't. Lori tried to ignore the strange experiences, but they continued. There was this old rocking chair. I would hear a noise and I'd look over and the chair would be moving. Back and forth and back and forth. And then it stopped, like dead stop, just like someone put their feet down on the floor. And then I would look back at the chair and it would be rocking. The air in the room just got that feeling like something was about to happen. I hated that chair. That chair just gave me absolute creeps. And if I got up to go tell my grandmother, it would stop. My grandmother was a very religious person, so we had a lot of pictures throughout the house of religious themes. Now, I 
specifically requested and wanted a picture of the Blessed Mother in my room. I was hoping that it would lessen the appearances of whatever it was. But that would not happen. The picture literally fell off the wall. The nail was still in the wall, so it didn't fall out of the wall. It was lifted off the nail. The hook was still in the picture, still intact. I would be getting dressed for school in the morning. I would take my clothes out of the drawers. I'd push the drawer back in. I'd put my clothes on, I'd turn around. All my drawers would be open. I'd push them back in. I would go to the bathroom, I'd come back in my room. All the drawers were open again. My personal belongings would always be moved, misplaced. My mother and my grandmother would tell me that it was my imagination and that I needed to stop all this nonsense because I was scaring the younger kids. A spirit can pick and choose most of the time who it wants to communicate with. And sometimes it will find people who are more open to see it. And I've always found out, you know, in, in my travels of investigating that children are more susceptible to seeing spirits. And um, chances are that child has seen something that your average person aren't able to see, or at least don't want to see. Things got much more intense in my room specifically. I started to hear scratching in the walls. Like someone was stuck in the wall and trying to get out. Like intense scratching. And I would feel like there was someone right over my back. Hull had lived in a state of constant fear since moving into her grandparents' house. I started to hear scratching in the walls. I would feel like there was someone right over my back, and you would feel like you could not breathe when that would happen, like it would take all the air out of the room. It was a suffocating kind of feeling. It scared the life out of me. I was sure I was gonna die. It eventually kind of receded back towards the bottom of the bed. <laughs> so far, only Lori had experienced weird phenomena, but that would soon change. At one point, um, I was about 16 or 17, I hadn't invited one of my friends to stay over because um, we were out and he had missed the last bus home. So I said, you could stay in my room and I'll sleep on the sofa. He came downstairs in the middle of the night, and we'll never forget this, <laughs> woke me up where I was sleeping on the sofa and he said, I'm walking home. I cannot sleep in your room. He said that he woke up and there was something dark, like right over him. And he said he swore it was going to, like, smother him or do something to kill him. When that happened, then I knew. I was like, okay, it's not me. I'm not crazy. This is really actually happening because I never told anybody that. And for someone else to come down and say exactly what happened to me, it. I mean, it was scary, but I was in a way happy because I knew that was the moment I knew I wasn't crazy. My friends and I decided that we would try to find out more about who it was and what it was trying to do. We decided to use a Ouija board 
to try and contact the spirit in the house. It started to really move more, I guess, purposefully. F R. We had asked for a name, and we seemed to be speaking to a woman who called herself Fran. N. One of my friends got really scared and didn't want to do it anymore, so she left the circle. I wondered if Fran was the woman who I hear, heard laughing on different occasions and the one who was opening the drawers. Fran said that she had lived in the house. She indicated that she had committed suicide. If you were somebody that conjured up spirits or you were into, you know, magic or whatever you were doing, um, and it was of negative um, influence, and then and now you go into somebody else's house and uh, a spirit would see you as, um, as a threat. One night I was asleep and something had woke me up. There was a woman just standing there. And then I saw that she had a rope in her hand and she was just staring at me. And she would put the noose around her neck and pulled it. I was moving towards the edge of the bed. And when I got to the edge of the bed and went to put my legs over, she picked her head up, lifted the rope off of where it was, and stepped down. I was so completely overcome with terror, I took off down the stairs. After several horrific experiences, Lori Hull was desperate to escape the terrifying spirits in her home. And I looked at my grandparents' room, which was downstairs, and I started yelling for them to wake up, and she said, they're not gonna wake up. I put them to sleep. Lori was so scared, she stayed awake all night. My grandparents were awake in the morning. I asked them if they had heard anything last night. They said no. The next day, she knew she needed to find help. I was really overwhelmed by what I had experienced. Now, one of my friends um, knew all the things that had been going on in the house. Her mother belonged to kind of like a spiritual study center. And when I told them the story, they were all just silent. Now, they felt that the spirit that was in my house was not a human spirit. They felt that it was a more of a demonic kind of spirit. And there are specific ways for dealing with that. And they did caution me to not try to communicate with it and gave me different methods for trying to protect myself spiritually. It was still there, but it didn't touch me. It didn't do as many things. And as soon as I was 18, I was out the door <laughs> of that house. So when I moved to, my friends were moving to Virginia Beach and I was gone. 
you know, I'm still trying to recover from what I experienced in that house. I think I will be haunted by those experiences for the rest of my life. When there is more than one witness to a paranormal event, it can prove that the experience is genuine. But when the phenomenon is truly terrifying, multiple witnesses provide little comfort. Story 27, Frank, take one, marker. This is the first time I've really publicly told the story. I met Marcia, um, actually she was a waitress who worked for me at a restaurant. As the time went on, we, you know, became friends and we started dating. It would take at least an hour with the traffic to go see her. So that was uh, getting pretty old. We discussed him maybe renting something up this way towards me so he wouldn't have to have that long drive at night after he would leave you know my house i was still living at home we found a home that was for rent in mount Tabor. It actually was a roommate wanted type of, of ad and my roommates were only there during the week so it worked out perfectly for us because he was very close he didn't have to sleep on my parents couch Frank settled into his new home and was excited about his relationship with Marcia. Four to five weeks after I moved there, I was in the living room and the, um, the curtains started to flutter. The house was an old house, but we had put the plastic on the windows, the kind you hit with a hairdryer to seal them tight. There is no reason why the curtains would flutter because the windows were sealed. And then the temperature really dropped a lot and I could see my breath and it's almost like I was walking into a cold spot. When dealing with anything to do with um, cold spots, um, you have to be careful. First thing you do is you definitely do a temperature check to see what the readings are. What we look for in a cold spot is an extreme drop. So you're in a house, it's 65 degrees, and then within three seconds of uh, um, taking another reading, it drops down to 45. Then you have something. Um, spirits will definitely drain a lot of energy um, rapidly, and we usually find out to be somewhere around that 20, 25 degree droppage that uh, we could probably um, pretty well guess it's paranormal. I could not figure out what it was, where it was from. I could not explain it away. I tried. I, I looked at everything that would possibly cause it, uh, vents, anything, um, and I could not explain it away. And that wasn't the only strange occurrence. I would be in my room and I would hear the radio go on downstairs. and you can hear the cha channels changing. It was an old dial stereo, and you can hear the channels changing, you know. It would stop on a big band type channel, like 40s music. And I'm like, well, who's playing 40s music? So I'm, I'm looking around, I'm on the second floor. I check my roommates' rooms, they're not there. So I, go, I start to go downstairs, and as soon as I get close to downstairs, the music stops, it turns off. I went back upstairs and I just um, started thinking that something is going on here. A few minutes later, I'd hear the radio go back on again. And I'd go back downstairs again, and as I went downstairs, it would go off. When I was in my room um, watching TV, uh, there would be some um, knocks and uh, some bangs, sometimes some scratches. And then I would hear almost like voices, like talking, uh, mumbling. 
Um, and I kind of like, I was looking at my, listening to my TV and I heard it off behind me, like in the hallway. So I turned off my TV and it would be a faint mumbling. So I thought maybe somebody was home. So I went out and to the hallway and there was no one there. It, it stopped. Activity started getting a little bit more intense. We had a landlord and the carpeting at home was very old. And we had tried for months to try to get the uh, landlord to pay for the re-carpeting in the downstairs. He finally said yes, and he, we had, he had to re-carpet it. After he had to re-carpet it, things started getting a little bit more intense. Spirits have a hard time with change. Um, if, if that spirit lived there at one time and it got renovated, um, it still feels like it's theirs, especially if that energy is still hanging around that specific location. Frank no longer ignored the strange events, but he was curious about his housemates and whether they had similar experiences. I didn't see my roommates a lot. We would like be two ships passing the night. So we didn't have a lot of communication. Um, and uh, I never really said anything to them when, we, when I did see them. Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, how's it going? How's everything? Things good. There. there was a moment where uh, my roommate Greg was in the kitchen, so we're kind of talking, hey, you know, how was your week, that type thing, you know. Yo, did you see that? No, man, what did you see? All of a sudden, I see him look with his, glance up with his eyes past my shoulder like he saw something. And I said to him, I said, what's the matter? He says, well, I saw a shadow go up the stairs. I said, thank God it wasn't just me. It always helps to have other people validate what you see or what you think you see. Um, you know, it, it helps you because as an investigator, you kind of lose that sense of investigating when something happens because you want to believe that the supernatural exists or you want to believe that that particular home or where you are is haunted. So when you can get two or three people validating that, it definitely helps in a, in a case for paranormal activity. With confirmation that the others were seeing the same thing, Frank finally confided in Marcia. I really, I didn't believe any of it because I was a big skeptic and I, I really didn't, I just really didn't believe him. So I just kind of let it, just let it go. I said, you must be crazy and just we'll let it go. The next morning, Marsha was no longer a skeptic. So we were laying there watching TV and um... all of a sudden we heard water running. Did you hear that? Yeah. I walked down the hall, opened the bathroom door. <laughs> Frank Regillo had experienced many strange events in his home, but his girlfriend, Marcia, was skeptical until now. I really, I didn't believe any of it. All of a sudden, we heard water running. Did you hear that? Yeah. I walked down the hall, opened the bathroom door, shower was on, and uh, all the water was running. So I turned everything off, left the door open, walked back down the hallway. Six or seven minutes later, all of a sudden you hear, Shh, and she goes, no way. It was on again.
I said, this is unbelievable. I said, this is, it can't be true. It just can't be true. She beelined out of that house as fast as she could. Because I was just, at that point, I said, I'm not staying here anymore. Frank was quickly losing patience with the old house. Uh, all of a sudden, you hear this big crackle of thunder, and I, the lights go out. I'm saying to myself, well, is it just my house or whatever? Or it might just be the neighborhood. I wasn't sure, so I went downstairs, went down to the root cell, because in the root cell is where the breaker, circuit breakers were. Found the breaker, uh, breaker box. As I'm doing this, it, was, it got very cold. I, I feel something behind me. Red, these red, two red lights, eyes, I don't know what you want to say they were. I headed right for those storm cellar doors that opened up into the backyard. I, I pulled the lever over, flipped them open. And I got in my car and I took off. That was the most terrifying to me. I just could not stay there any longer. I mean, I was willing to do anything just to get out of there. I said, I'll pay out the lease. I have no problem with that, but I'm moving. I didn't care. I was just glad to be out of there. We went in there, moved everything out in a matter of an hour, and I was gone. I was so glad to be out of that house. It, it was, it, it was, it's beyond words. It was really, it, it was just, it was just beyond words. chased out of your home by an entity is a chilling experience. Some people have no choice but to stay put, even when their entire household is being terrorized. Story 25, Cheryl, take one. My name is Cheryl Arnott. I'm from Lakewood, Pennsylvania. Ken's my husband. We met several years ago online, and then we just decided that we were going to get together and get a place. The house that we found was, it's like, a, it's a ranch style. And I fell in love with it right away because the kitchen size is what I was, I wanted. Moving into the house were um, myself, Ken, my son, and my daughter. It meant a lot to me to have my family close. And I felt safe because of the area that we were in. It was home. It was it was going to be a place to share our memories, going to be a place to share our, our lives. Cheryl and her family had everything they wanted, but it was early days in the house. First time that I really noticed anything off is I gathered up the laundry. As always, I did it once a week, but I was separating the laundry, and then all of a sudden I just get this feeling like I'm not by myself. It's like I'm I'm not alone, and um, I so what I did was I just kind of scooted the basket out of the way, and I looked around the corner. Um, down the hall. I'm thinking some somebody's there, but I don't see anybody. You might catch a glimpse of something out the corner of your eye, movement, and of course the movement makes you turn your head to look, but when you turn your head to look, there's nothing there, but you know your eye caught something because something over here moved. I'm thinking, this is crazy. I'm thinking, OK, you're tired, something. There has to be an explanation. Spirits will typically show themselves in various ways. 
I mean, it could be through a cold spot. It could be through catching something at the corner of your eye, if you, if you can see it that quick. And a lot of times, uh, we like to call it, or I like to term it as a phantom draft. Um, all of a sudden, you'll feel a breeze, whether it just blows by you, or, or maybe something moves, or a curtain, or an object. Um, just to let you know that they're there, they will use that. So it's typically just another form of communication and a manifestation of energy. But Cheryl's search for answers would only bring more questions. I went into the bedroom, and then I felt something brush against my leg. And so I'm thinking it was my cat. So I want to push the cat away, and when I look down, there's nothing there. So it wasn't my cat's. And it just, it was just rubbing against my leg like it was insistent on getting my attention. You, you just don't, you know, you, you can't, words can't even describe the feeling that goes through you because you're thinking this is just, this is totally unreal. Why is this, this shouldn't even be happening. It was a scary feeling because it's a, it's a contact. It's like a physical contact. Something touched you and you can't see what touched you. It's just mind-boggling. I didn't tell anybody about it for a while. I, first person I did tell was Ken. He just didn't believe what he didn't experience or didn't see. Cheryl tried to ignore the strange events and move on with her life. Um, Bonnie moved in with us two or three years later after we bought the house. Bonnie is like a mother to me. My kids even call her Grandma Bonnie. She's been a, a, a great grandmother figure and a great mother figure. And I, I kind of lean on her heavy at times. It was just like a, one big family. And I enjoyed their company. They enjoyed my company. It just felt like we was helping each other out. They ended up making my bedroom down in the basement. As the family settled into their new living arrangements, the strange phenomena started up again. We were in the kitchen one day playing Scrabble. And it's daylight, you know? And nobody's thinking about anything except for the game. OK, Bonnie says, oh, I'm thirsty. So she gets up, and she goes over to the cabinet. She takes out one of the cans. <laughs> Pretty soon, I look up, and this thing moves. had tried to ignore the strange events in her home. But then her husband, Ken, and family friend, Bonnie, witnessed something they could not explain. Pretty soon, I look up, and this thing moves. The can was turning around on its own. I'm there poking Ken. I was very scared. I couldn't even talk. I was so stunned. I was like, and I'm pointing and poking and pointing at this thing, saying, yeah, that's all I could get out. <laughs> and then about that time, the pop can goes, Shh. I'm scared to death, because I'm thinking, any minute, this pop can is going to fly. And I'm not going to get hit by it. I'm in running position right now. When all three of us saw it, we just definitely knew there was something in that house. And something wanted our attention. But who, what, why, where, all of that, I have no clue. The, the fear that everybody had was just what was going to happen next. The family was now on edge. Uh, the activity in the house after that Scrabble game happened was like, if you were walking from, like, the uh, kitchen into the living room, you might see something coming. And, I, and you know, you think Ken, because the, the 
shadow, whatever it was, was about as tall as Ken, which is, he's like 6'2", and you'd see it, like, coming towards you. You'd turn to look, thinking Ken, and when you turn to look, it was nothing there. It was always black shadows. They searched for ways to stop the unwanted presence. I was second guessing the house. Um, really, a move wasn't really, it was not really a big option because we had everything we had tied up into the house. It wasn't like you can just say, okay, I'm done with you house, goodbye. You can't just put everything in your purse and go out the door with the keys. We had nowhere to go. Bonnie would soon regret her decision to move into the house. I was sitting at the table. I was all alone. Everybody else was in bed. And I kept hearing this uh, noise behind me. And I thought it was one of the kids trying to sneak up on me. And I noticed shadows. So I got paying more attention to that. It was a, a precious moment that I collected. Glass ball had fallen on the floor and shattered all over the place except for the little angel on the inside. And that stayed intact except the head. The head was like chopped off. Uh, I knew at that point something was there, but um, I, didn't th I never at any time thought it was friendly. If it's friendly, it's not gonna give you a feeling of fear and terror and wanting to get out of there. Something friendly won't do that. My son uh, went to his room one night, and he had just gone into bed. His girlfriend at the time, her name was Nicole. Kill Nicole. He hears a woman outside of his bedroom door telling him, kill Nicole. Kill, kill, kill Nicole. Like, she would do that for about five minutes, he said. scared of daylights at him, like when anybody was like, how does this person or this thing that's outside of my door, how do they know, how do they know her name? How do they know anything? What, what, what else do they know about me? What else are they going to say? As morning arrived, Cheryl thought she was safe. I went over and I got in the shower. And I thought, okay, I'm in my shower and I'm get out of here. I got stuff to do, and I was planning the day in my mind. And I'm standing there, soaping my hair. And um, I felt a hand. After witnessing an evil entity in their home, Cheryl Arnott and her family were living in constant fear. I went over and I got in the shower, and I'm soaping my hair, and um, I felt a hand. Well, I jumped about a mile. You scared the crap out of me. And uh, nobody was there. It was definitely trying to get my attention and trying to scare me because, what, well, you know, something friendly isn't going to come up behind you and do that. So I went over to the other one, and I haven't been in that bathroom to shower or anything since. 
A few weeks later, the events took a different turn. We were in bed watching TV. But you could just see this thing slowly. This, like, mist cloud. Just moving, like slow motion. Ken says, oh my god, did you see that? I was like, <laughs> what do you, your mind's just totally mush because you're thinking, this doesn't, this, this isn't normal, this doesn't happen, this is totally crazy. Nobody was sleeping, nobody woke up out of a sleep. This is just the last straw when it starts to do stuff like that. I've had enough. I went over to into the kitchen. I was talking to Ken about something. I don't even remember what it was about. And we're both standing there and we're talking. And something shoved me. I went into the door and down, and I fell. I just went flat out on the floor. Ken's there helping me up. It was like, oh my God. I was standing there. It wasn't like, you know, I'm standing on floorboards that move, or I'm standing on ice or something like that that's explainable. I was, it, it was, it was, I was pushed. I was pushed. I was shoved. It, was, it wasn't a friendly thing. I mean, a, a person off the street, a person wouldn't put up with having come and... I mean, you're going to call the cops if somebody comes up to you and shoves you. As each evening arrived, the family worried about what might happen. I was laying in bed one night, and um, I just... It's just like somebody was there. It's almost like somebody comes up behind you. I didn't feel safe in the house at, at this point. <laughs> this woman was like maybe this tall, standing. And it wasn't a child, it was a full grown woman. And her hair was like pulled forward and it was just unevenly, like, like it never, like it needed trimmed really bad. And she just stood there with like a dead stare. She made sure I got a good look at her first. Then it was like sparklies, but it was black. And then it, they started to like the little glittery things started to just slowly fade out. You just felt like you were like a deer in the woods, and a hunter was just. You're just waiting for any moment for something to happen. But yeah, you felt, you felt like this vulnerable, vulnerable target in your own home. They could no longer live like this and reached out for help. So it was due to a friend through Facebook that we actually did get in, in touch with the right kind of people. The plan basically was to go up there, validate their stories, what they were saying was happening, was actually happening, and then to disperse what was there through several means. Because they were very religious, we decided to use their faith and back them up to try and get this out of their home. Ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock. He will comfort all of her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden. Desert, like we have oil that has been blessed, and we go into each room, and we make the sign of the cross on all the windows, and we have a biblical passage, basically, for clearing that room, and taking it room to room, and then finally getting outside. Once we get outside, we end up blessing the doorways top, left, and right-hand side. Q 
Keith and his team were able to remove the spirit. After Keith had come in and his team were in there, it was, it was a much calmer. You could actually breathe a sigh of relief and not feel like you're, like, looking. You know, what's, what am I going to hear next? What am I going to see next? He's been a godsend to us. That's, that's what Keith is to me, to see he's, he was a godsend. He and his whole team were just wonderful people. There was an evil entity in the house. You are about to see real people. I was terrified beyond belief. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. I truly felt it was like living in hell. When skeptics become believers. I always just thought it wasn't, wasn't real. It was, you know, just fake, pocus pocus stuff. I had a very myopic black and white view of the world. Now I'm talking to dead people. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Before I, we purchased our house in Bloomingdale, I was living in a small condo with my husband. And it, it was very small, and it was far away from both of our jobs. So we wanted to find a house that was closer to our jobs. The first impression I got was that it was very eerie. They had bushes that were overgrown in the front. The house needed a lot of work. I saw crumbling masonry work in the front and the back, the roof was old, it, the siding was old. Uh, we walked into the inside, and it was just the eeriest house I think I've ever seen, but I liked it. We did close on the house in December 1997, and I couldn't wait to get started on it because the inside was so dreary. Just being in that house, there was just something different. I couldn't put my finger on it yet. Of course, it, there was a lot of noises, banging, dragging. I just chalked it up. It's an old house. There are going to be noises. I'm very skeptical with saying this noise doesn't make sense. Very shortly after we moved in, I just started getting a very strange feeling that something wasn't right. Every night I would go to sleep and I would have this nightmare. I was in the house alone and I had a very horrible feeling about it. I'd be at the top of the stairwell and I knew something very ominous was at the bottom. And I would look at a shelf and something would fly you off. I would see a shadow at the bottom of the stairs. It would start to move up, and I'd hear breathing. You just felt as if you were going to be killed, attacked, something. And then that's when I would always wake up. And it turned out I had that nightmare every night for months. I had told my husband, I don't even want to go to sleep because I know I'm going to have that dream. Patty had always been skeptical of the paranormal, but events in the house were beginning to convince her otherwise. I went down to do laundry 
and we have a big, the biggest container of laundry detergent. And I did the laundry, put it back on the shelf. The detergent went back up in the kitchen, and when it was done, the laundry detergent wasn't on the shelf. I looked, and it was sitting 10 feet out into the, into the basement, upright. I just tried to ignore it, picked it up, did the second load, put it back on the shelf. When I came down a third time, it was right back out in the basement again. That's probably the first time when I thought, it's almost like a mischievous child playing tricks on me. There was something about that house, and I had even said to my husband one day, you're going to think I'm crazy. I think this house is alive. There's something about this house. I don't know what it is, but there is. He just was of the opinion, if you ignore it, it will go away. He believed my dreams were caused from anxiety, moving into a new house. He just didn't buy into it and kind of turned a blind eye. I find that skeptics will gravitate to rationality before anything else. Um, in their mind, they have convinced themselves that it can't be anything other than something rational. So they will take it that, oh, it must have been this, or they'll find any reason they can to prove that it's not paranormal. A few days later, I'm cleaning the house. We have French doors on our upper level going to the deck. and I see little handprints on the bottom of the window. And I told my husband about it. He goes, oh, you know, just forget about it. A Couple days later, I saw them on again. My husband was home. I said, come here, I want you to tell me what you see. He looked and he goes, it looks like a child's handprint. One of the situations that scared me the most, and I knew I had to find out and get to the bottom of it, again, happened in my room. started having terrifying dreams as soon as she moved into her new home. But the nightmares were turning into reality. I dreamt of the child that I thought was in the house and he bit me in the arm. And I woke up, I said, wow, that, that dream really hurt. And when I was in the shower the next day, there was, I was bitten. Now I couldn't fit that in my mouth to put that bite mark. And it was a small mouth. So that dream was a dream, but it wasn't a dream. I can't explain that. It became more than a dream when old friends Roseanne and Joe came over to the house for a visit. Uh, she was with a gentleman, and he was a big, burly, six foot three contractor. Roseanne had mentioned the apparition, and Joe started making fun of it. I had asked him not to do that, and he continued to do that. The next thing we knew, and I saw it, and Roseanne saw it. His stool was yanked out from under him. He landed on the ground. So of course, we're like, Joe, are you OK? He got up and started crying. S started crying like a baby. And he said, Roseanne, we got to go. We got to go. 
Roseanne called me later and said, Joe said there's something evil in that house. When I fell on the floor, something whispered in my ear, You are going to die tonight. You are going to die tonight. He goes, I'm never going back in that house again. And he never did. I just didn't know what to think. It can't be just my home. There's too much is happening. There's something, something happened around here, and I don't know what it was. I met my neighbor. She was walking her dog. I, I said, can I ask you a question? She goes, what? What? I said, do you have anything strange going on in your house that you can't explain? And she goes, what do you mean? I go, here we go. <laughs> She's going to have me committed. And I just looked at her. I said, ghosts. Her, her jaw dropped. She goes, I can't believe you said that. She goes, ever since I moved in, she goes, things have been going on in the house that I can't explain. It turns out many people in that area were having experiences, but my house, everybody seemed to point to my house and said, but that's where it really gets very strange. I had to get to the bottom of this, how to find out, and I didn't even know really paranormal groups existed when I Googled hauntings in Bloomingdale, I, I saw Mark's, Mark's website. I first heard from Patty back in February of 2008, and she was looking for us to come in and perform a professional scientific investigation. Now, during this time, we were doing audio recording, trying to capture EVP, which stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. Also during the investigation, we had a video camera with night vision set up in the master bedroom, pointed at her dresser where she felt like she had seen things before. Patty was sitting on the bed nearby with one of our other investigators. And really, I was talking, but you know, no one was getting anything. But I looked at the dresser, and I saw a white, almost like a mist or a shadow in front of the dresser. So the cameraman, the investigator, panned the camera around from the dresser to see if he could capture anything. When he panned the camera to the left, Evidence of the paranormal was becoming harder to ignore at Patty Haig's house. Now a guest had been threatened. You are going to die tonight. Wanting answers, Patty had called in a paranormal investigation team. So the cameraman, the investigator, panned the camera around from the dresser to see if he could capture anything. When he panned the camera to the left, All of a sudden, he captured what looked like a head uh, with no features. You cannot see a face or anything, but it looked like a head with a hairline. And it had very dark hair, very dark hair. And you can't see features of the face. It's bizarre, just to, you see the hair and it's sticking in. And then after a second, it seems to realize it's being filmed and it whoosh, slides right out of the frame. Almost as if this child realized and, and drew back. So we were unable to explain that anomaly. We went back to the house, we recreated the conditions, we looked for reflections, we were looked for anything that would have caused that anomaly and we could not recreate it. Now that we have technology and the things that we use to show the existence of life after death, the power of a skeptic has diminished. Their case is getting weaker and weaker. After the first investigation, Mark realized this is enough to pique interest in a second investigation. Uh, we felt that it was the land that had the activity more 
than Patty's house alone. So we made arrangements to bring in a ground penetrating radar team to scan that area to see what they could find. And the results were very interesting because the radar operator said he found five areas of interest. And looking at the imagery, you can see the white spots that they found, that it was in his opinion that they could have been human burials still underground. It was our impression that this could have been a Native American site with circles, possibly a medicine wheel or other types of ceremonial circle used in their religion. If it's possible that if it was used for ceremonial purposes with the spirits, that might account for some of the activity that we were encountering in the area. Once Mark and his team came in and did their investigations, um, activity did pick up in the house significantly, where it almost appeared that now it was taking more of a malicious turn for me. felt like you were going to be attacked. You felt like you were going to be murdered. I was pushed down my oak stairwell. I didn't lose my footing. All of a sudden, I was airborne, and I made a 90-degree turn, and I landed in the hallway. And I knew if I didn't leave that house, I wasn't going to survive in that house. I, 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 it would have been a disaster for me to stay in that home. So when my husband got a new job down south, that was probably the happiest news I had in years. I didn't care if we had to live in a tent somewhere. I honestly didn't. I would have been happy living in a tent to get out of that house. The last day of the house, I stood outside the door, closed it, locked for the last time, and got in my car. I felt a lightness that I haven't felt in years. I felt like a new person, a happy person. The house had finally convinced Patty that another plane existed, and it was too much for her to live with. It was that location, it stayed at that location, and now I'm living in a place that is completely free of any kind of paranormal activity, and I would never go back, ever. Skeptics of the paranormal often demand scientific proof before they will believe in the afterlife. But an intimate first-hand experience can lead to a dramatic change of mind. for about four years. We had a, a, it was a beautiful luxury condo on the lake and everyone thought we had the best life going. But we were just, we were really unhappy and looking back, we were unfulfilled. Well, condo life for me was a little bit difficult because we wanted to be closer to nature. We wanted to have more of a, just a real connection with, you know, the earth around us. And we weren't really feeling that where we were living. We went on the hunt for a house. And so I said to Jennifer, I said, let's go out to this place called Brantford, which I hadn't even heard of before. As we were getting closer and closer to the house, we were getting more skeptical because it was kind of like a subdivision that we were driving through. And we pulled up to this little house on the hill. We both instantly fell in love with it. And we, everyone thought we were crazy. It was a very stark contrast to what we were living in in Toronto. And when we got here, uh, we knocked on the door. 
and this older gentleman came to the door. He was well into his 90s. And actually, it was the owner. The agent hadn't arrived yet. He said, oh, come on in, come on in. He was 94, and he wanted to interview everybody who was interested in purchasing the property. He really wanted the property to stay intact. And he said, what are your plans with the house? And I said, well, Jack, I think it needs a paint job, to be honest, so I think I might paint it if you don't mind. And uh, he said, no, that's fine. Jack's wife died when he was in his 70s, I believe. And he believed that he would probably die soon after. He didn't expect to be here as long as he was here for. Jack took a liking to Jan and Daryl and sold them the house. We moved in September 30th of 2011. What we thought was a paint job turned into a complete gut job. It was during the renovation that Jan and Daryl began to notice strange things. Paintbrushes will go missing, uh, keys will go missing. I had a book that went missing. If we lived in a really big house, I think it'd be easier to, to kind of, but our house is very small, so how far can something travel? <laughs> When their complicated renovation was in full swing, what was supposed to be the easy job became the most baffling. And there was one particular paint color that Daryl would put on and the paint would not stick. It just wouldn't stick. And it would fall off and it would clump off and it would drip off. We thought, what the heck? So we took it back to the paint company. The paint company said, the paint's fine. I don't know what your problem is. So Daryl thought, well, maybe he just thought, you know, something came to his head, let's try a different color. He got the same paint in a different color, put it on, and went on perfectly. So we joke about the fact that Jack's wife was like, I'm not having that color paint in my house. Although happy to joke about it, the couple were skeptical that anything otherworldly was actually happening in their home. A lot of times when a family moves into a house, uh, they'll do renovations, they'll fix things, they'll, they'll change things. A spirit that has been there for many years, they're used to a certain thing and they're used to a certain way that their house was. If you go there and try to create things and do things, they, they take offense to that. Like, hey, you know what? I was here many years before you and you're not gonna change this. And if you are, I'm gonna make it difficult for you to do so. Daryl had never believed in anything paranormal. I've always been a skeptic. I guess I would need to see evidence of that to believe that. During all the, the construction and all the chaos, Charlie, my little dog, he and I were the first two to move into the house. There are times where he'll just, for example, he'll be in the living room and he'll look out into the kitchen and he'll just stare and stare and stare and stare and you're thinking, You're not staring at food, you're not staring at water, you're just kind of staring into the room and you're thinking, why are you doing that? You can tell he's looking, like he's watching something. And you kind of put your head around to see if you can see something too, you know, but I don't see anything. see something because I don't think he would stand and just stare for so long at nothing. <coughs> so that's kind of strange. Yeah. But it was Jen's experiences that would truly turn a skeptic into a believer. It just smelled like baking. Like I'd wake up and I, you know, Daryl doesn't cook or bake. I sort of smell the air and I'm like, oh, someone's been baking. Like vanilla, you know that very distinct smell of vanilla? And sometimes a very distinct smell of like apple pie. I was like, oh, it smells so good. And there would be nothing there. There was nothing that could have made that smell. You just sort of shake your head and go, okay, you know. And I was still adjusting to living to the country. And I heard the covers and again, at first I thought it was mice or, you know, whatever, because the house was being renovated. Jen White fell in love with their little house on the hill, but after promising the previous owner they wouldn't renovate, they decided to do just that. 
And I heard the cupboards, and again, at first I thought it was mice or, you know, whatever, because the house was being renovated. And there she was, standing facing the stove. You know, a 3D woman at the counter, sort of humming to herself, preparing something. And when I sort of squinted and looked a little bit closer, I could see that she was sort of filmy, smoky, sort of that, you know, iconic what a ghost would look like kind of thing. But she was there. I mean, I knew the hair color. She had these beautiful green eyes. I could see the figures. I saw a ghost. Everybody has a different reaction to seeing a spirit when they first see them. Obviously, the first thing you do is you're scared. I don't necessarily think it's something that you have to fear, but I think you have to essentially take note as to why it keeps appearing to you. So maybe do a little research, maybe find a little bit about that property. Did anybody die in that house? Um, is there any relatives that look remotely close to what you're seeing? And then kind of just do your own investigations. I wanted to authenticate my experiences and make sure that it wasn't, you know, all in my head. But I just knew when I said, oh, I saw this woman in my house, that I thought, oh my God, they think I'm gonna crazy, or you know, they're gonna go, oh my God, these crazy like city people have had, you know, too much country air. And when I reached out to the neighbors, they said, oh yeah, I think I've got a ghost in the house, and I described her. Oh, that's Jack's wife. And they said, you described her a tea, and then someone took out the photo album, I'm like, okay. was Jack's wife. That was the woman. I recognized her, like, that's what she looked like. Found out that Jack's wife, quite tragically, um, had a stroke or a, an aneurysm one night. Jack was watching hockey about 25 years ago, and she said, I wasn't feeling well. She got up to go lie down, and she dropped dead between uh, here and the, the back bedroom. Apparently, she was a prolific baker. So that was a, a really big watershed moment for me that yeah, I'm living with something. My life was about to change. As soon as I sort of admitted it, then it started to get like exponentially more frequent and powerful. The cupboard doors would slam and I would be in bed and I'd be like, Daryl, like knock it off. And he'd be like, I'm not anywhere near them. She turned around and looked at me and kind of smiled at me and then vanished. OK, this is, this is real. This is happening. The neighbor, Janet, had let me know Jack had passed. And then it was about two days later when the kids had called and said, would we be OK with him uh, being scattered out back? So they came back here and scattered his ashes back in the woods where he was most happy. With Jack's death, a new wave of paranormal events started. When we'd moved in, they'd cleaned pretty much everything out, uh, but there was this one chair that was down in the basement. The neighbors had said to me, oh, that was Jack's chair. It was this wooden chair that he always sat on outside and watched the world go by. And so I thought, well, it's ugly. So I tossed it in the garage and thought, okay, next garbage day, I'll get rid of it. And it would reappear in the house. Like, we would find it in the basement, or it would go back to where he used to sit. And I'd say to Daryl, why is that chair out in the middle of the backyard? He's like, I didn't put it there. Jen found that once she opened her mind to the paranormal, her experiences became more powerful. I went for a walk, and I took the dog, and the dog started barking his head off. Barking, 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 and then he started staring up the hill, and I thought. So I turned my head, and I looked up the hill. And there standing there, I'll never forget it, because I can still see his eyes, was Jack just standing there content in this like lumberjack plaid jacket that apparently, you know, was very sort of common and typical for him.
He was there sort of in this fuzzy kind of foggy state, but very 3D, very much alive, very much, you know, identifiable as Jack. Not, it wasn't a shadow or a passing image. It was Jack standing there. So I said to him, I said, hey, Jack, you know, I'm so glad that all is good. And I promise you we're taking great care of the house. And then he vanished and we continued on with our walk. So it was a really interesting and unique experience. A paranormal encounter changes many lives every day. And a lot of it has to do with the acceptance of knowing that something is there that is not supposed to be. So I was that typical white like, Anglo-Saxon Protestant conservative person who had a great job. I had a very myopic black and white view of the world. Now I'm talking to dead people. All of a sudden, I accept and respect that there's a whole lot out there that we don't understand. Once you know that there is life after death, you may treat your life a lot differently. You may live it differently. You may not take it for granted to know that in a split second in time, um, you could be in that same altered state. There's good advantages that, that come out of a paranormal uh, encounter, and a lot of it is to appreciate life as you know it while you're alive. Since Jack's passed, I haven't seen her which is really interesting. So when Jack passed, I have not seen her since. I haven't smelled her, I haven't seen her, I have nothing. And I think because she died so suddenly and Jack stayed here for so long that I'm convinced that she was here the whole time Jack was. A relationship between a husband and wife that maybe the marriage lasted 30 years. You don't want to be away from your partner. So there are spirits who will hang around and wait for that. And them two can um, live a life together in the afterlife. We still call Jack's house and Jack's property. We've been here four years. I don't know if we'll ever stop calling Jack's house. As a skeptic dealing with the paranormal, there comes a point where rational explanations just won't cut it. When the paranormal becomes a physical threat, there is no choice but to believe. Story 26, Greg. Take one, marker. Thanks. Story 26, Danielle. Take four, marker. I've never had any encounters before. Um, never really thought about it before. And it's just something that, you know, I always just thought wasn't wasn't real, it was, you know, just fake pocus pocus stuff. I met Greg in my space. She thought that I was cute, so we started talking. I have three children, Grant, Dylan, and Emily. They fell in love with Greg, and so did I. In December of 08, Greg opened his home to us. It was a kind of a rundown building, um, but it was cheap rent. And it served its purpose. Her and her daughter, Emily, uh, came up on the bus, um, started unpacking stuff, and she was like, oh, you know, I can rearrange your house now and, you know, make it the way I want to. I didn't have a lot of stuff. I was used to the military life, you know, we, being in the military, you minimize everything. And with Danielle, it was just, you know, it brightened it up a little bit more. You know, there's more colors, more, um, flowery stuff and, you know, just a woman's touch and it made it a lot better. But this good feeling would not last long. Um, it was just the little things at first. We'd want to go out to dinner or something like that and be like, okay, you know, time to grab the keys. walk over, went to grab for them, and they're not there. That's like, OK, you know, who's got the keys? And nobody's got the keys. You search, and you search, and you search. You know, keys are nowhere to be found. Go almost back into the first location where I first looked for them. There are the keys, and it's like, no way. There's no way those keys could be there. Couldn't explain it. Spirits will um, move things if they know that it 
bothers you and intimidates you, sometimes they'll play games. They'll take the smaller objects because it takes less energy to move those things. And sometimes they can be sending a message. It's hard to really tell with them because there are a lot of them that are tricksters. One time um, we were sitting down and having uh, cookies and milk. Emily told me, she goes, Mommy, I have this friend named Michael. He likes to play with me. And I said, well, that's nice, honey. Would you like to share cookies and milk with Michael? She goes, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you just see the glass move like six inches. Six inches to an empty space. This empty space beside Emily. What do you what do you say when that happens? You know, there's there's no good reason for something like that to happen, especially when she just got done saying, you know, go ahead, you can share your cookies and milk with them. It wouldn't take long before the paranormal became more real. Actually, a couple of days later, I had an, another experience myself. All of a sudden, something grabbed the back of my leg. Greg and Danielle Koch had begun to experience strange phenomena in their home, but were reluctant to believe they could have paranormal origins the activity was about to get more extreme. And all of a sudden, something grabbed the back of my leg and yanked me. I've never felt this before. It felt like they were trying to pull me off the bed. just got rocked. I turned around, looked back, and there was nothing there. And I looked at my leg where I got grabbed at, and I could see the hairs kind of like standing back up off of like if they were like, you know, condensed from where somebody grabbed me. I felt like a grown man trying to jerk me off the bed. I've never had any, anything so physical happen to me like that before. I'll, that's something I'll, I'll never forget. Greg started to rethink their decision to raise children in the house. Because if it can move me that much, you know, what else can it do? Finally, we were like, okay, you know, something, something's going on here. We had contacted the landlord, explained to her that we couldn't stay there anymore. And um, she was pretty understanding. She's like, I could, I could understand, you know, um, this isn't the first time we've had people move out in the middle of the month, you know, as quickly as you want to move out. It felt like the relief was off of my shoulders to be moving away from that place. We made the move to Tidio. Um, the house was like three times as big as the place we were in, so we were loving it. It was a really nice house, uh, two floor, big yard, you know, so we were really happy with it and it was only two blocks down from the school where Emily would be going to. Uh, we moved in July, um, beautiful weather. The neighbors were real nice. They came out and helped me move the stuff in. I really did think everything was left behind. And we started having experiences at the house that we're at now. Started hearing like walking across the ceiling and it's like, okay, we know nobody's up there. You know, I'll, we'd hear footsteps again, so I'd run up there and... There's nobody there. I'd go back downstairs again.
you know, you, you could hear him walking down the stairs, you know, thump, 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 thump. It just sounds like a, a heavy guy walking back and forth. And I'd run up there again, you know, just to make sure. There's nobody up there. It is very creepy feeling. Maybe a house settling, you're hearing a creaking, but maybe a spirit where you're dealing with sounds, it's gonna be more profound. Spirits will violently walk and the whole house would shake. That's when you start to think, okay, that's much more than just a house settling. We'd come back and, you know, from out to dinner or something like that. And it just seemed like every cupboard in the whole place was wide open. Nothing was really disturbed in the house besides like the cupboard doors, like there was no cans out of place, there was no, you know, anything missing, like somebody would have ransacked the place. It was just, every cupboard was open. Well, I was like, here, here we go again, you know? I was like, the last place was quiet, and now we got something going on here. And then, you know, Danielle was like, yeah, I really hope something's not, you know, kind of following me. I knew something was following us then. It just seemed like, you know, from one location to another location, there is definitely something out there. I was in the, the bedroom. That's where I had my uh, computer hooked up. I was playing a video game online. And she was out in the kitchen. All of a sudden, she calls me out there, and her voice kind of sounded funny. I was like, oh, OK, you know, what's going on now? And she's standing in the middle of the kitchen. And she's got this, like, kind of a blank look on her face. And she's got a knife in her hand. and Danielle Koch had already moved once because of paranormal phenomena. Despite starting out as skeptics, the couple now believed in the dark side as the events became life-threatening. And she's got a knife in her hand. She's got it up, you know, kind of held like, like in a stabbing motion. And she's just standing there and I'm talking to her. I'm like, Danielle, Danielle, you know, I'm trying to get her to, you know, acknowledge me, to answer me, you know, to at least turn her face and look at me like she was staring off a million miles away. You know, that, that knife really made me nervous. And so I was like, look, you don't put that knife down. I'm going to tackle you down to the ground and take it from you. She finally looked like she snapped out of it. She was like, you know, what, what's going on? And I was like, I was like, I don't know, you tell me. I was like, you've been standing there for about five, six minutes now with the freaking knife in your hand. I was like, I was starting yelling at you and you weren't paying attention to me, you know, you weren't acknowledging me. And she was like, I didn't hear you at all. All I remember is it felt like a demonic force and I was fighting with it. I was definitely scared because if it could do it there, you know, what if it's going to do it again where I wasn't around or if I was sleeping? So we both knew something, something serious was going on. Unexpectedly, Greg and Danielle found help close to home. You know, we were kind of hesitant to say anything to the neighbors. And then they actually brought it up that they were um, part of a paranormal society. And I was like, you're kidding me. I was like, you know, what, what are the odds that you guys are going to be living right next door to us? And then, we, you know, we told him what was going on, and we told him some of the experiences that we had, and he definitely felt 
that there was a, a dark presence in the house, um, that he was definitely worried about Danielle. Greg invited his neighbors into his home to perform a cleansing ritual. You know, I would see them going around and, you know, she does um, spells and stuff like that to try to, you know, encourage more good spirits and, you know, good feelings and stuff like that and ward off, you know, the more negative feelings. With the house cleansed, the neighbors gave Danielle an amulet to ward off evil spirits and taught her how to perform the ritual herself. Danielle seemed like she needed more of the protection. Um, it, it seems like they, they're more, you know, gravitating towards her and not me. And that's been protecting me. So that's how I survive. A lot of these things that we use, we use as symbols. An artifact is not going to drive a spirit away as much as what's behind that artifact, what faith is being put into that artifact. Essentially, you yourself is the one that's exercising the spirit out of a home. And to be honest, it, it seems like it's working. There's a lot less negativity in the house. We're kind of, you know, happy with living there as long as, you know, we feel we're, we're kind of safe. You know, we definitely felt like, you know, we're surviving there. Greg is a skeptic turned believer. Before Danielle moved in, you know, there was, there was no such thing as ghosts. But, you know, five, six years later, and, you know, I believe 100%, you know, there is no doubt the spirit's out there. There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. <laughs> oh, I felt terror. When ghosts attack the living. He wanted her, and he was going to get her. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Story number 21, take one. Al Kelchner dreamed of living a quiet life in the countryside. And in 2001, he needed some peace more than ever. I went through a difficult period in 2001, uh, uh, including my father's death, 9-11, and then I was laid off um, from the company that I was working for. I'd reached a point in my life where I needed a change. I needed uh, some calm in my life. My dad was a farm boy, so being out in the country, especially someone who was from the uh, urban New York metropolitan area, that was a big thrill. So Al made a change. He left New York City and bought a hobby farm in Illinois. It was kind of, I don't know, magical. It just fulfilled every expectation I had about the type of little farm I wanted. It was picture, postcard perfect. I just saw potential and possibilities. Al was so taken with the farm that he bought it on impulse, without having stepped foot inside. It would be a decision he'd live to regret. It was very dark, physically, literally physically dark. Oh, it was, it was threatening. It just, you felt uneasy the second you walked into that house. You felt as though you were being watched. was very, a very negative, dark energy and, and extremely intimidating. I did a subsequent research and found out that it was a pretty interesting place. There's a lot of history from early, uh, from the revolution and colonial days. I was very conflicted. I found my little dream farm, but at the same time, I hated going home at night. The drive, the closer I got, the more unnerved I became because I knew I had to open that back door and walk into a totally dark house out in the country by myself. Al's uneasy feeling in the house remained just a feeling until a few days after he moved in. One morning I got up and I went into the bathroom to shower and get ready for work. 
And the bathroom was a mess. Towels were on the floor. Toiletries uh, were scattered around. Items had been taken out of the cabinet, and they were laying across the top of the vanity. I was uneasy. I had no, um, no logical explanation. Little did Al know, this was just the beginning. Soon, he began to experience other strange phenomena. There was walking, talking, and frequently, my face was touched and stroked. experiences you can't see, um, you can't explain, and it's really unnerving. But that wasn't the end of it. I was sitting in the family room and talking with a friend on the phone when I heard suddenly loud knocking by the front door in the living room, which was a room and a half away. then moved into the parlor, which is adjacent to the living room. And upstairs, directly over my head. lasted a couple of minutes um, and it was incredibly unnerving and that was when I finally threw in the towel raised the white flag and said okay I believe in you so we're gonna have to coexist if Al thought acknowledging whatever was haunting his house would calm the activity he was wrong I was in the corner of the kitchen I had bread in the toaster and as I stood there, all of a sudden, I felt a, a sharp pain in the back of my neck. I thought, well, maybe I slept the wrong way and pinched a nerve. But the pain spread through my shoulders and down into my chest. And I thought, oh my god, I just bought this place. I'm going to have a heart attack in my new residence, and nobody's going to find me. You know, this is, this is just awful. But then I realized that um, it wasn't from stress. Um, it was someone who had wrapped their arms around me and was squeezing tighter and tighter. And I said, stop it. And uh, immediately it stopped and dissipated. But that wasn't the end of it. On Thursday of the same week, at about the same time, same location, same routine, toast in the toaster, it happened again. This time, though, it just was an immediate bear hug. Someone very large, very strong, very powerful, wrapping their arms around me and pulling me close. And again, I yelled, stop it, and it stopped immediately. I felt terrified. I, I couldn't see anything, but obviously there was something that had a physical effect on me. So I had no answers. A house could feel physically threatening depending on what entity or spirit is occupying the house. Spirits are what they were in life. So if you're a violent person in life, if you're an angry person in life, you probably carry that to the other side. Spirits can get violent if they just don't want you around. They could want to chase you out. It was a test. Let's see if you're going to stay around. 
But Al did stay around. I went upstairs. So I turned into the northwest bedroom, and I, I opened the door. The minute I stepped foot in that room, I felt nauseous. I felt terror. And I felt as though uh, something was pulling me down to the floor. The, the, the terror was the terror was almost debilitating. I, I was pushed a couple times. I was struck, and all of a sudden I felt a sharp, sharp pain in my right ribs. And that lasted for probably three weeks before it finally dissipated. Al started to realize that his life was in danger. I had a fight or flight instinct, and the, the instinct was to flee, so I did. It's really terrifying, the sense that you're not alone and that something bad could happen. After experiencing a string of strange events in his picture-perfect farmhouse, Al Kelchner was under attack. The feeling of, of dread and, and doom was overbearing. Al decided he needed outside help. I decided to open up the house to um, investigative teams. It really started with wanting a confirmation that what was happening to me, one was really happening, and number two, well, I wasn't losing my mind. I am pretty sensitive to the spirits, so when I get to a location, I can kind of sense there was a lot of animosity going on at this place. Before I go to any location, I would always try to do some research on it. I read a lot about the people that owned the farm initially. There was a doctor as well that lived at the property. And from what I understand, he did some crazy things with the children. He would molest them. Did you hear that? Within a few hours, we heard screams by doing some EVP sessions. The things that were scary to me were there were a lot of black shadows at the property. I heard noises coming from the staircase that was behind me. I heard somebody running down the stairs. I felt something come up close to my back. And the next thing I know, I felt just like a bear hug completely around my stomach. This would not be the only investigation at Al's farm. As time went on and I had groups come in, members of these investigating teams seemed to observe more and more shadow figures. One of the most amazing experiences I've had at that house was an evening when a small group was there. One of the people sitting at the dining room table said, oh my god, there's a shadow walking back and forth in the living room. And sure enough, the window was completely blacked out. They observed them outside through the windows, walking between the barn and the machine shed and inside the house. And then that morphed into what looked like the figure of a person. And for the next half hour, we watched that shadow walk around in the, the living room. It was pretty profound. Seeing a shadow figure, if it's a shadow man, 
you are seeing a spirit trying to manifest itself. It's trying to show itself to you. So it forms as a dark mass. Shadow people, on the other hand, they were never human. They're a bit more physical, larger shadows with heads, no necks, big shoulders. It could be you are going through a weakness at the time and they're taking advantage of it. Um, you could be also dabbling in something you're not supposed to be dabbling in and they come as a warning. Shadow people can be pretty bad and could hurt people. I was scared, um, frightened for Al's safety. I was told there could be up to 30 spirits in the house at one time, which I thought was an exaggeration. But when I hear that multiple times repeated to me over a period of years, uh, then I start to pay attention. I knew the place was haunted, but I didn't realize how haunted it really was. There was a woman at the house who came to visit, and she described every entity, known entity, in the house. There was a farmer from the 19th century who was in the kitchen. There was a male entity in the northwest bedroom of the house. The report was that this entity was a doctor who had a lot of negative energy or was not very nice. There came a point where I needed answers and I needed resolution. I believe it was 2011, to do something about the energy at the house. And no one had ever done um, a cleansing before. Cleanse this house of all negativity. Only love and light may enter. So we went from room to room, sage the corners high and low. It was my responsibility to make positive statements and also ban any negative energy. What I didn't know, although I was told afterwards, is that the medium with me could hear um, growling, um, furniture being slammed. Negativity. Only love and light may enter. Cleanse this house of all negativity. Only love and light may enter. <laughs> and apparently it worked because as I look back on um, that period and prior, the energy was very dark at the house. It isn't anymore. The cleansing seemed to rid the house of its ghosts, but Al wasn't done with the spirit world yet. There was one final ghost, and it was waiting, especially for him. A woman in the house, who was usually found on the second floor, died around 1845. And the connection was described to me as um, something like um, a soulmate. She described Sarah as my wife from a past life. Um, and it's really difficult for me to wrap my brain around, but they recorded an EVP. It's very brief, it's rapid, but it's pretty clear. It's a female voice saying, I love him. I love him. It's hard for me to, to comprehend. I really thought about selling the house and giving up my dream, but I decided to stick with it and see what would unfold. Although I know there's some very negative energy, my experience for the most part has been positive, and somehow I managed to cope with what was going on around me and achieve some level of acceptance. And here I am, eight years later. When ghosts physically attack the living, victims typically feel themselves being squeezed or hugged. But sometimes, the attacks can be even more violent and leave scars that never heal. That's Tormentor, story number six. I was in my 20s, and I was in bed. We were sleeping. And all of a sudden, I felt real heavy in the chest. And I 
woke my husband up and I said, get it off my chest. I can't breathe. Honey, honey, what's going on? And he said, there's nothing there. And I said, there is, I can't breathe. <gasps> It lasted about 10 minutes. I felt like I was being choked. Something, something was attacking me. I was scared, you know. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And the next day, I had bruises on my neck. They were like finger marks. Karen didn't know what to make of the incident, but it left her with an uneasy feeling. It was like for a funeral. A few days later, with her husband away for work, Karen had her next strange encounter. I saw a man in a blue shirt. I didn't recognize him at all. I didn't see his face clear. I always saw him at the bottom of the bed. I was being watched. I told him to stop, to go away. You're not welcome here, go away. But he didn't. I couldn't count the number of times that I saw him. But one night, the apparition did more than just watch. I just felt myself being pulled down, and then he would assault me. attacked in her bed by a spirit. And I was every night, he would assault me in one, some way or another, and then he raped me. It got to the point where I was afraid to go to bed at night. I have, in fact, heard of spirits sexually assaulting or having sex with the living. I had two cases personally where that happened. One of those cases went on for almost 20 years. Eventually, the attack subsided, giving Karen some relief. I wasn't being attacked so much, but it took quite a while before it stopped there. In the following years, Karen and her husband had a son, Ed. With the nighttime attacks having all but stopped, Karen thought her torment was over. But the worst was yet to come. I didn't know it would affect them. I thought it was just me. The first sign of trouble came when the couple tried to have their baby christened. Now an adult, Ed feels it was no coincidence. The night before I was supposed to be baptized, the church had burnt down, so I didn't go <laughs> the next morning, of course. From his earliest memories, Ed recalls being tormented by evil spirits. From age three and up, it's a piece of cake remembering almost everything, especially all that, the horrible stuff. I call him the tormentor. Always come out of the closet, try to scare the hell out of me, come up from underneath the bed or in front of the bed. Or he'd come from a dark corner, got a long face, spiked kind of tongue, horns on top of the head, black shiny skin. That's tormentor. If he didn't come out, it would be spiders. 
and it would be the walls, the ceiling, the floors, the bed, everything covered in spiders. And it, even if I tried to scream, it felt like spiders were coming out of my mouth. So it was a total nightmare city. Mom tried to blame it off as it's my imagination trying to, to calm me down, not to freak me out. I knew it was something, something different. I wasn't too shocked because, you know, I thought he was ha having something like I was having. I told him not to worry about it. I barely didn't get much sleep when I was a kid, and my parents did what most parents do, is they took me in and had me checked out, and none of that made a difference, but I just had to kind of play along, so they wouldn't think I'm, I'm crazy or I wouldn't get locked up in a loony bin. The family was desperate to move out, but finances were a problem. Eventually, they saved enough to get a new home, but whatever was tormenting them had no intention of letting them go so easily. This thing followed us there as well. It got worse in the teenage years. The writing appeared on the wall. It's telling me to kill other people, kill myself, ways of killing myself. I just had to keep putting all that stuff out of my memory. I felt bad for him. I just told him it was okay. You know, nothing bad is gonna happen to you. The torment continued for 10 more years until finally, Karen and Ed sought outside help. We have a friend who belongs to a paranormal group. It was through him that we got this shaman. They had us basically sit in a chair like this. They put a piece of cloth underneath the, underneath the chair. And then he used like a, a sea salt and an eagle's feather. And they just brushed down your body. They fold up the, the doll into like a little totem and just say that you give all your evil spirits and energy to this doll. and then they're supposed to go and burn it. They call it the release place. If the doll burns completely, you're out of trouble. And sure enough, the next day, they went to the burn site. My doll didn't burn completely. After a few months respite, the torment and the man returned. He disappeared for quite a while. I thought it was finished, it was over with. But there he was. He's back. Right. Come on. Fearing for his mother's safety, Ed took matters into his own hands. I challenged it and told it that you want to attack somebody, leave mom alone because mom's in her 70s. So I said, leave mom alone. Bring it on. I'm open for it. If you want to attack somebody, you can come and attack me. To protect his mother from the evil spirits that had tormented her for years, Ed White challenged them to come after him. Bring it on. I'm open for it. If you want to attack somebody, you can come and attack me. It was an ultimatum he'd live to regret. He 
was being attacked, scratched. My back is covered, my ribs, my stomach, my chest. They take months, sometimes years, to heal up. We had a nurse practitioner. She measured my arms and the scratches, and she said, there's no way you could have made those scratches yourself on your back. The body ain't meant to bend that way, so there's no way it could have been you. It's always in threes every time it happens. The pain is, is unbelievable that goes with it. You can't scream, you can't do nothing. The theory is when you get three scratches, because they usually come in threes, that it is the entity's way of mocking the trinity. It's a matter of making you afraid and keeping you afraid so you don't have the will to fight back. I can be in bed, I could be in mom's room, I could be anywhere. I've known Edwin and, and Karen for about five years. He's a kind, gentle soul, and we see him all the time. He was in my yard, and he dropped right to his knees. <laughs> we were talking away, and then they saw my leg get red. They saw the scratches come, and then they just saw the blood just start gushing down the one leg. <laughs> And he had three fresh scratches on his leg, deep red scratches. And I go, what was that? And he goes, it got me again. And I go, what do you mean? And he's like, they're after me again, these demons. It was really weird. You'd have to see it to believe it. And the pizza man saw it too. He saw the skin rip open, three on each side, and he's just like, okay, let me get out of here, please. To this day, Ed is still being attacked by his tormentor. Some people think you're crazy, you know, sometimes. I worry about Ed because he, he just can't take it anymore. The most frightening thing for me is the scratches on my body, and if they're gonna get worse, or if it's gonna even be taken to another level. Whatever has been following me around, there's gonna be no end to this. Ed and Karen are currently searching for someone who can rid Ed of his tormentor once and for all. Not all ghost attacks result in physical assaults. Some of the most terrifying can be when evil spirits try to take away our most precious things. Our children. Story number three featuring Kristen, take one. We were renting a townhouse, and it was just a lot higher rent, so we moved into this house, which was a little cheaper. We had a yard, and just had all of the amenities that we wanted. After Kristen and her husband, Ken, moved in with their six-year-old daughter, Becca, tragedy struck. Um, my aunt committed suicide. She hung herself in her basement of her home. We're very close, very close. I think she just had a lot of mental things going on. At the funeral, Kristen said goodbye to a much loved aunt forever. Or so she thought. Just, you're a wreck after those things, you know? We got home. I was grieving, and I was mad at her. I was severely mad. Um, I hated her, and I remember just yelling at her. Why did you do this? Why? 
just yelling and screaming at her because she was putting our entire family through something we should never have to go through. I told her she was weak. I told her that um, I was ashamed of her. Um, of course, I'm screaming at this point at her. I told her that I hated her and that I would never forgive her. I'm sorry. But Kristen had no idea that by venting her anger and grief, she might have opened a pathway to the spirit world. Spirits and demons can appear more often in times of grief. When people are grieving, it sometimes opens doors for other things to come in and prey on the vulnerable. I was grieving severely. I was angry. It was hateful. What? So, yeah, I, I believe that quite possibly that I could have let something in at that point. I remember one night, it was probably about 11.30, and I was flipping over laundry. And I felt something behind me. And I turned and looked, and there she was. Overcome with grief after the tragic death of her aunt, Kristen Whitesell had unwittingly invited something unexpected into her home. And I turned and looked, and there she was. I took off running up the stairs screaming, and I turned around, and my aunt was coming up the steps after me. She looked completely different, demonic. You don't ever get that sight out of your head. And at first I thought I was going crazy. Like I thought you're wanting to see her so badly um, because I didn't get to say goodbye. When it first begins to happen, you kind of feel like you're imagining all of this. This isn't real, this isn't happening. And you just kind of go on. Second time you're kind of like, oh God. see her daily in different locations of the home. Soon, other strange activities started to happen around the house. My husband was working nights, and um, we were sitting in the living room, and we heard bumping going on upstairs. Upstairs, and my bedroom door was open. I heard a big boom, and my bedroom door was closed. There was no drafts, there was no windows open or anything. I always felt like we were being watched. At nighttime, you would hear noises downstairs in the basements, like clanging go downstairs and off in the corner, you would see a shadow in the corner. It looked as though a, a man that was hunched over who was hovering and his back was turned to you. He scared me. He scared the crap out of me um, because he would never show me his face. I mean, he just stood there lurking. You don't know what they're capable of. You don't know if by interacting with them, if that's gonna put your family in danger, put them at risk. I felt like I was going crazy. Until now, the activity had been limited to manifestations, but that was about to change. 
when it happened the first time. I remember waking up in the middle of the night. I would feel as though I was being choked. And I just felt like there was something that was had its hands around my neck and was holding me down, and I couldn't yell out. I remember screaming in my dream, and I remember yelling for my husband. Um, but in all actuality, I wasn't. He never heard me at all. It became a nightly thing. Spirits can physically attack an individual. If you're dealing with a more malevolent entity, the idea is to torment you, to make you weak, and to keep you that way. Malevolent energies want to be in control. And Kristen wasn't the only one in danger. kids would tell us that they hear things and that they saw things and that they felt things. Searching for answers, the couple discovered that the house was an old railway house that had a secret past. The house was built, it was a slave, a slave home. And the upstairs was the master's quarters. Off of the side walls, um, there were little rooms and they were cubby holes where the slaves would go and hide when the masters were entertaining guests. Well, you still had access from Rebecca's room into one of what was the slaves' quarters. <laughs> Becca would say that a man on fire would come out of that cubby hole that used to be the slave quarters. <laughs> First, she kind of she kind of made it sound like it was a dream. Um, Mom, there's a man in my room. It started off, he was only coming like maybe like once a month. And then it became two to three times a week. And then it became a nightly thing that he was coming to her. <laughs> He would encourage her to go with him. He wanted her. And he was, he was gonna get her. An apparition of a burning man was threatening to take Kristen Whitesell's daughter away with him. He wanted her, and he was, he was gonna get her. It scared her pretty badly. Immediately, as a mother, you're going into protection mode. Is he trying to take her soul? Like, what's he trying to do? And all I could think is, you're not taking mine. It's not happening. She's mine. And I told her, you tell him no, that you're not going anywhere. You stay right here. Um, I can't protect you if you're gone. There's no greater fear than the fear that your child is not safe in their own home. Fearing for her family's safety, Kristen calls in paranormal investigators. A lot of times, spirits can be attracted to loss or mourning. Demons can come around because they follow someone. A lot of negative energy can happen. To get started, we took in our EVP recorders, our K2 meters, and our DVR system at the time. My husband and Jeremy were downstairs in the basement. 
We had motion detectors on every floor, and from there, we just began asking questions. Who are you? What is your name? Why are you here? All of a sudden, this real deep, nasty, maniacal man came over our EVP recorders just laughing at us. <laughs> it was very overwhelming and kind of frightening. Voices um, on the EVPs, they were mocking my husband. Jeremy, you there? Something's moving upstairs. Our motion detectors would go off, and we'd go up to see what was causing it. And as soon as we went upstairs, Jeremy, Jeremy, the motion Jeremy. detector downstairs in the basement would go off. Like, almost like it was playing games with us. Come in, come in, Jeremy. And all of a sudden, we just see a shadow just go from the front door into where we are Did you hear that? really fast. I, and you can edit this out. I remember him saying his exact words, oh, they did not stay in that basement very long. I don't think that their feet touched the stairs. He had to be scared, <laughs> quite honestly. He had to be. Who wouldn't? This investigation and client, to me, is one of the most active places I've been to. A part of me believes that it's just negative spirits from the railroad days. But another part of me believes that it could be demonic. With the paranormal activity getting more intense, Kristen and Ken decided to get the house cleansed. When we conducted the cleansing, we had two Wiccans with us, and they conducted the blessing. And they went into every crack and cranny of that house with uh, salt and oils. According to them, they were able to kick out the real maniacal spirits. Although the house was cleansed, the family couldn't live with the memories of what they went through and decided to move. You can't force a child to feel safe again. It definitely was the scariest period of my life. Um, you're not in control. It's time to cut our ties and go. My aunt had passed away, and normally that's who I would go to, to talk to, but she wasn't there. It's hard to recover from something like that. I'm, I'm never gonna go back there. I haven't been back, and I don't plan on ever going back. There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. We just sat there with our jaws dropped. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. When spirits are intent on doing evil. The basement is super old and creepy. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Story number 14 featuring Mandy, take one. My name is Mandy Lynn, and I am co-owner of Liberty Tattoo in Libertyville and here in Antioch. Um, we took over the building in May of 2007. When we first saw the space, you know, we'd realized the capstone on the outside said it was built in 1904. There's a lot of history in the building. When Mandy and Eric took over the space from a previous business, they didn't know renovations would stir up something terrifying. We would close at the end of the night. You know, we'd get in the next day and there's paintbrushes missing or rollers missing or... The art that we bought came with glass in them, so we decided to put them behind the counters 
um, and bolted them to the wall with the wiring to the frame, like um, secured them to the wall. The first plate glass picture had fallen off the wall and was down on the ground and the glass was busted everywhere. We just chalked it up as not being hung properly. The next day when the second one was down, um, we knew that something else was going on. And then it was the last picture that had glass in it, had come down and was broken. We put it upright. There's no reason why it should have just fallen off the wall. If they hoped that would be the end of the strangeness, they were wrong. When we opened for business, and the first thing that we noticed is that there were large male bear footprints on top of our display cases that are three and a half feet off of the ground. I was trying to rack my brain who would have been walking around barefoot on the floor, which would have been more reasonable than on top of the counter. Mandy and Eric's employees were also affected. The boy employees just were terrified to come into the basement. We have stuffed supplies down here that I'd have to send them downstairs in the basement to get, and they would fight over, no, you go, no, you go, I'm not going into the basement. The basement is super old and creepy. There's a certain area uh, where the concrete is dirt and it was either dug up or never filled in and we found that to be very unusual and wonder what's buried there you know the first time i saw the hole in the floor i just was trying to figure out why you would pour concrete everywhere else in this basement except for that one space and what was particularly special about that one spot mandy and eric discovered that they weren't the first people to encounter paranormal activity on the property Actually, one of my neighbors used to work in the space. She came in, and we had metal ladders leaned up against the front door to the basement. And she said, you need to be careful, because there's plate glass in that door. And I said, no, it, it's just wood. It's just painted. And she said, no, we painted over the glass, because Lloyd used to stare through the window, standing on the stairs and peer through that window. And that was directly behind the counter where all the employees sat. <laughs> So she said, we just painted the windows because it was freaking us out looking over there and seeing him standing there. It made me a little creeped out knowing that he was here. To me, it was very obvious that he likes women quite a bit. Even with myself, he would stand behind me and breathe. Even with me sitting in my chair, you could just feel him behind me. Uh, but there were multiple times where customers, female customers, would be across the room looking through flash, the tattoo flash racks, and there's no one behind them, and you could watch them go. You know, and I'd say, are you OK? And they're like, was there someone just standing behind me? And I'm like. The racks would just open one leaf at a time, very, very slowly, all by themselves, until a particular sheet of flash was shown, which had a bunch of angels on them. Usually it was a female client would turn around in a panic and look at us, and we'd smile and wave and nod, and yeah, I see it too. I'd... After a while, it, it got to be a little bit much, so we put in cameras. One day, our employees called us and said, what the hell happened here last night? And he said, there's a sign ripped off the wall. One of the pictures is down off the wall. And the plant, which is a very large plant and a very large planter, was tipped completely over. Um, and my husband and I reviewed the security tapes. At about 9.30 in the morning, all at the same time, the sign to the handicapped bathroom fell off the wall, ripping off the drywall sheeting with it. 
fell off the wall. The picture dropped off of the wall and the plant planter just tipped over. There was no one in the studio. Like our studio was not even open yet. The alarm was still set. The spirit may destroy somebody's belongings or hide them. Mostly it's to get their attention, to let them know they're there. Um, or that if they want something and you're not paying attention to them, they're gonna get your attention one way or another. Soon Mandy would start seeing ghosts. There is a little girl in here, a little girl spirit. The first couple times I saw her, she was just very playful. She would hide between the couches. She would play all over the studio. I, I always have been a believer of paranormal. I've experienced too many things, seen too many things, felt too many things for me to say nothing else is going on. But the little girl wasn't the only spirit. And the others weren't harmless like her. One day I was taking a nap. new tattoo parlor was full of unexplained activity. Strange presences, ghosts, and falling objects. But no one had been physically attacked, yet. And as I was sleeping, I could feel that I was being pulled by my feet down across the couch. And when I opened my eyes, I realized that there was no one there. There was just no one there, but I could feel myself being pulled down the couch. And that's when I freaked out. And my husband came flying into the room, and he's like, what the hell is wrong? And I'm like, that thing just drugged me down the couch. And he's like, are you OK? And I said, yes. Are you hurt? No. But a little freaked out that the thing can actually move me. The attack prompted Mandy and Eric to bring in paranormal investigator Bob Jensen. So we came in here looking to see if we had any real high EMFs. We also used the audio recorders, digital recorders, to see um, what kind of audio we would be able to pick up down here. Uh, with different pictures that we took, most of them came up on the full color spectrum camera that we had anomalies that would pop up. We had a couple that showed up near a floodlight. There was actually a figure standing there. <laughs> The pictures themselves were captured at the far end of the basement. Seeing the sheer size of Lloyd was very unnerving. To I very much get the feeling that he's a sexual predator. And then to see him in that form was made me very, very uncomfortable. It definitely has a uh, male physique to it. And there was a series of photographs. It looks like he's standing. And then the next picture looks like he's going into a crouching position. Uh, a couple more photos. It looks like he was sitting on um, almost like a crate or a box. It's creepy as hell. I mean, this was like a more primal form, just a male shape, but very large, very powerful shape. There was also audio evidence of paranormal activity. On the audio recordings, one was a little girl's voice. Um, the little girl's voice was warning us. She said, be careful, he's coming. You know, be careful, he's coming. She kept saying, be careful. Bob decided to research the history of the building in an attempt to find some background on the entities. There were claims that there might have been um, different crimes that were committed at this particular property. But the crimes against women that might be tied in with this particular location definitely goes back to the 19-teens um, and to maybe up until the 1930s or 1940s. For sure, finding out the history and that um, there was possible rape and killing down here made a lot of sense because there's one particular spot in the basement that it's very hard for women to be near without feeling very uncomfortable. And when you ask every single one of them, kind of, what do you feel? And they feel like uh, victimized sexually. A 
With this building, a lot of these field stone, there's also limestone and quartz. And limestone and quartz have been uh, reported to actually hold on to residual hauntings. This is definitely a good catalyst for holding on to and retaining a lot of information that's happened over numerous, numerous decades. With minerals such as quartz and limestone, things like that, I'm not sure if it's an attraction for spirits, but they can use the energies from those things. It can also trap energy as well. So if a foundation is built upon these things, it's, it could fuel uh, more paranormal activity. Terrified of what Lloyd might do next, Mandy decided to take action. After the investigation, we asked a couple of our friends who are spiritual healers and um, work with energy to come into the space and help us try and clear out the energy that was here. We had a couple of people come in that used sage sticks and smudge sticks and just asked the entities that if there was something that they needed or if there was some help that we could give them to move to another place. The cleansing worked. I don't think the little girl was here any longer at all. I think Lloyd hung out a little longer. It took him a little longer to move on. I find it very important that we had the space cleansed and the spirits cleared because I don't know if I would have been comfortable staying or any of the other employees would have been comfortable staying much longer. They will never know what evil acts Lloyd committed in his earthly life. But not all spirits are like that. Some can turn evil if they think the living are encroaching on their territory. Story number 18, featuring Tammy, take one. in 2003. The feeling we got when we went in, it was just a positive feeling in the beginning. We just kind of knew that that was the place to be. It was a small community. We knew um, we were going to try and have a child. Tammy's positive feelings about the house did not last long. Probably about a week after we moved in, and my husband was alone in the house for the first time. He said that he heard yeah. um, a banging on the wall coming closer and closer. Hello? Tammy Northcutt and her husband Jerry had recently moved into a new home. Within the first week, they were hearing strange noises. He said that he heard a banging on the wall coming closer. There was nothing there. Next, it was Tammy's turn to start hearing things. In the middle of the night, um, I got up because I heard arguing, and I didn't know where it was coming from. But the, we've got a vent that's in our living room, um, a heater vent. And um, 
you could tell that it was coming up from there. We would go down in the basement to find out what was going on. We could never see anything. It was just constantly just there, you know, but there was nothing, there was nothing, you couldn't see anything, but you could hear it. When we um, were in the bedroom, um, we would hear violin music whenever the um, heater would kick on. It was beautiful classical music, but um, we just never knew where it was coming from. At first, we were really afraid of, you know, what is going on, because we didn't know what was going on, what was happening. The objective for spirits making themselves known could be a number of things. It could be they have a message they want to pass on. Others don't know they're passed on, so they're trying to interact. They're trying to be a part of the living world. Unsure of where to turn, the couple suffered in silence until help came from an unlikely source. There was a shop um, downtown Janesville. We, we met um, the couple. We were talking about the house, and they overheard us talking. And they said, we can help. They said that they could come bless the house. They blessed the house, and the things stopped for a while. The house seemed finally to be at peace. 18 months later, Tammy and Jerry had their first child, Connor. As soon as my son was born, it started up again, the knocking. The cabinet doors in the kitchen, um, you can hear open and close. And um, well, the basement door started opening and closing. My son's door was opening and closing. It started to kick up again. The mysterious events in the house continued until after Connor's second birthday. Then they became more and more sinister. Connor started seeing something on his bed that he referred to as Mr. Raider. He would tell me that I need to get Mr. Raider off the bed. I would look, I could not see anything. But I knew he wasn't making it up. And you could just tell just how scared he was. Soon, Connor began to experience another unwelcome guest. An old woman would appear and shake his bed at 2 AM. That's when he would come running to our room about 2 AM. It got to the point where he just refused to go into the room. Not being able to do anything about it, because I could not see what he was seeing. Um, I could only listen, and I could only comfort, but I couldn't fix it for him. So that was really upsetting for me. Spirits can be drawn to young children. Young children don't have the same blocks as adults. They're more creative. They're more open to what's going on around them. They don't have so many hang-ups and so many blocks. So it's easier for a spirit to communicate with a child because a child will just take it at face value and interact. My husband's mother had passed away before Connor was born. But we do have a picture of her. And he kept on looking at her picture and he asked me to tell her to stop waking him up in the middle of the night. However, Tammy was powerless when events took a worrying new turn. I 
heard the door close and Connor was in the room. Connor? And I was frantic. Connor? I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get the door open, and I just, I, my son was in there, and I had to get to him. And I was actually going to call the fire department to have them come remove the door. I was, I was so scared. And the door clicked, and I reached and I turned the knob, and it opened, and I was able to get him out. After that, um, we took the handle off the door so it could no longer latch. Frustrated and unable to explain the strange events in their home, Tammy and her husband reached out for help a second time. I've been investigating since the 90s, about 1997. They were scared. They really were. Our first investigation there probably produced the most evidence out of any single one investigation we've ever done anywhere. <sighs> Throughout the night, we had what we call Class C EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. But there were some times that we got what we call Class A EVPs where we could hear exactly what it was saying. Stop saying that. Stop saying that. Get out. Get out. Come get us. Stop saying that. We had something we thought growled at us. And all of a sudden, we hear, our first impression was that we were dealing with something very negative. This thing is saying, I'm the boss here. A few days later, the entity took things to the next level. I felt somebody choke me. There was, there was pressure on my neck. <laughs> Tammy Northcutt and her husband had started to investigate the strange events in their home. Their son Connor was being traumatized. And now, things were about to escalate further. I felt somebody choke me. There was, there was pressure on my neck, and it felt like there was hands around my neck, like I was being strangled. Baby, hey. And it was almost like I was being pushed into the bed, but, um, and then I felt like a release and I was able to sit up. But um, it was, it was awful. It was an awful feeling. And, I, and that frightened me. I was, I was ready to pack up and just leave right then and there. Tammy asked the paranormal group to come back. This time, they brought Paul, their most gifted psychic. He came over, and he was getting messages already from before he even got to our house. He drew a picture of our house. It was amazing that he drew it before he even got to our house. It was incredible. The first thing Paul picked up on was that the house had once been a seedy drinking den. He's talking about this, this place being, you know, where there's drunk people, and he makes the sound of one guy that just continually goes, arr, arr, arr. And I about fell off my stool when he did that because it sounded just like what we heard and I was floored. He also said there's another guy that likes to play tricks and he's hitting the wall or the ceiling, causing knocking. 
And we had rhythmic knocking in our evidence. And Paul couldn't have known any of that. Our biggest question was, who was saying, come get us? And who told us to get out? I was telling him about where Connor was seeing Mr. Raider. I, I showed him the room. And he told us it wasn't Mr. Raider, it was Mr. Reader. And he, and in the 1930s, um, there was like a traveler's lodge that sat where our house is now. He said Mr. Reader owned the hotel. And Paul's theory is, is that Mr. Reader is hanging out in the master bedroom area. And he's not a very nice guy. And he's probably the one that told us to get out. It seemed like it was Mr. Reader who was threatening Connor and Tammy. From what we found out with um, Paul, Mr. Reader um, felt that women were second class citizens, basically. He, um, I feel it was him trying to get me out of the room. I think he was trying to scare me to get out of the house. And it worked. He started talking to Mr. Reader as he was explaining to Mr. Reader that this is a different time, women are equal. The light started to brighten up in the room and it felt lighter in the room. And now I don't have that negative feeling anymore. That's gone. All right. Paul had cleansed the negative spirit, but still had some questions. He asked Jerry um, what the word, the name Dell meant. And he said, well, that it's Della, that was my mom. She had passed away. And that's um, who was following Connor around. The female spirit who had been waking Connor in the night, Tammy's mother-in-law, wasn't trying to frighten Connor, but instead to protect him. It was her voice that Tammy heard amongst the arguing in the basement. I actually kind of felt a little comforted knowing that she was looking out for him. First of all, we tell the people that we work with that they have to take control over their house. So Tammy, for example, would tell whatever was there, this is my house, get out. Well, she's learned now that there's certain spirits she wants to keep there, but you have to take control over your own place. Every once in a while, you'll still hear the door slamming in the back and the uh, heavy footsteps going down the stairs. Um, but knowing um, what I know now because of Paul, um, I do feel better knowing that um, it's just, you know, basically just the sounds of the men going into the bar, because that's where the basement was the bar. Um, and kind of knowing that um, I'm not going to get harmed, I'm not going to get hurt, I think makes me feel more comfortable. One of the more unusual reasons for ghosts harboring evil intentions toward the living is that they died in tragic circumstances and they want their living victims to suffer the same fate. Paranormal Survivor 2, Michael's Haunted Apartment, story number four. Take one. It was 2005, and a couple friends of mine, uh, longtime friends, bought a building that had had a fire. Uh, and they decided to renovate it. After his friends finished renovating the burned out building, they offered to rent Michael one of the apartments. When I moved in, it felt cozy. It was, 
it was a comfortable little place. I thought something I, I could live in for a while. I actually uh, had my stepson who was living with me at the time. My kids would come over on the weekends. Um, so it was a small apartment. But that was it, just him and I. That feeling of coziness did not last long. The strangeness in this apartment started about three days in. We started hearing the cabinet doors in the kitchen. And like someone was opening them just enough so they tap, tap, tap. check it out, could never find out what was going on. Um, I had an exterminator come, and because I thought maybe there was mice or something, but there wasn't. Uh, so I had no explanation for it at that point. It was shortly after that, other things started to happen. Stereo would blast on at 3.20 in the morning, every single morning, and it would be full blast. I thought maybe my son was goofing around with me and turning it on. Teacher. But then with everything else that was going on, I started to believe him that he wasn't. It would be so loud that, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to get kicked out of here. What's going on? You did this? My son was 12, about 12 years old at the time. He was scared. He was, he was a little terrified about it. I mean, he doesn't even to this day, doesn't really talk about it much. The electric would go on and off. It would flicker. And um, just weird things we'd hear banging on the wall and just there was no reason for it. I was the only apartment on that end, so nobody could bang on the wall. So we started to figure out that something strange was going on. There was three different times that I would try to look up the history of this building to find out what might have happened. And every time I would type in to start looking, my computer would drop off. Nothing else would die, all the rest of the power stood on, just the computer would go off. It was a brand new computer. I brought it into the service guy three different times. He finally yelled at me and told me don't come back because there was nothing wrong with it. Something in the building was hampering Michael's attempt to investigate its history. Michael Vero was having strange experiences after moving into a building that had been renovated due to a fire. At first, I didn't make any connection to the fire at all. I just thought, I thought our minds were playing with us. So I thought that, you know, we were missing something that, you know, at some point we were gonna say, ah, that's what it was and laugh about it. I had rented a movie, and in this movie, in the end, there was extras, and it showed how to do EVP. So we thought, well, let's try it. EVP, or electronic voice phenomena, are believed to be a means of recording communications with the spirit world.
one night after recording, and we picked something up. At first was like growling. We'd hear growling on it, like uh, uh, kind of like demonic type uh, growls. And my son at the at, at one point said, "Go to the light. Go to the light." You know. Get away from the light. You could hear like a man's voice, a demonic type man's voice. I started picking and poking and trying to make them mad. And I said, uh, oh, I'm going to have a cigarette. I had said, uh, do you want a, a cigarette? I said, you can't have any. Um, you're dead. And when we played the tape back, this little girl on the tape said, so who cares? And it was as clear as day. So who cares? And I'm thinking a little girl on the other side that don't care. This is dangerous. just stuck up on end. I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, this is real. I invited a, a woman over to uh, watch a movie, have some dinner with me one night, and I never told her anything because you know, I wasn't sure exactly what was happening. And a picture of my kids, it came off and it flew across the room and then slammed against the radiator. And we kind of laughed it off and played it off. And um, I walked her out to her car. And uh, walking her out, I started telling her what's been going on. And you know, she acted like she was interested, but I think she thought I was crazy. And when I walked back into the apartment, a horseshoe came off the wall that I had screwed into the plastered wall. It came off the wall and it just skinned my head. I mean, just thrown at me. Like somebody was, you know, like somebody was angry and just threw it at me. At this point, I'm not feeling too good about the apartment at all. I'm now worried about my kids' safety. Um, when all the kids were over, I had four kids, so there was times when um, they would be camping out in the living room floor. And that's where you may come in. If you drive the tank, APC, or other heavy-wheeling vehicle across the tracks and other than prepared crossings, you may be knocking the rail out of a plane. That's a good part of the train. Whatever you can, make sure you take the heavy vehicle over. And uh, there was a few times that they would hear like banging on the floor around them, and you know I didn't know what to tell them. So we started all sleeping together, um, camping out on the living room floor together. My stepson walks in the room and he says, Dad, do you see this? Because I heard a lot of clicking, but I didn't pay attention to it. I looked up and the mouse on the computer was moving. Michael Vero and his son had discovered a paranormal entity in his apartment. And it was gaining strength. I looked up and the mouse on the computer was moving and it was clicking stuff. And we just sat there with our jaws dropped. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. Was the house finally ready to give up its secrets? Spirits being made up of energy can manipulate 
electronics quite easily. A computer is no different. I've done two cases where it has happened. I also worked another case where spirit actually were able, things were actually typed out on the computer. And sure enough, there was a picture of the newspaper. The building was, you know, burnt up, the fire trucks in front of it, and there was a little story on it. Talked about how the fire started and how the smoke poured through the building, and that there was uh, two deaths in the building. There was a little girl and her father who lived in my apartment. And when the fire broke out, the little girl hid in my closet. But she hid in there. The father apparently died in the hallway. She died in the closet of the building. At that point, um, the computer went out again. Uh, I felt very uneasy when I read that. It seemed like they were getting more comfortable with us. And they were doing, you know, more and more was happening as as we went along. I don't care what you want, I want you gone. I started to provoke them. I would just say horrible things to them, like, you know, you're dead, you don't belong here, your life's over, get out of my apartment. I'm gonna call somebody in here, we're gonna get you, you're gonna go. I threatened to get a priest in there. I threatened to bless the place and all these things. And every time I did that, the lamp would get real bright. I mean, almost where you're waiting for the bulb to blow up. I mean, that's how bright it would get. Then it would go back down to them again. And so I could tell I was starting to touch some nerves somewhere. Michael was losing his patience and the events were escalating. This letter A that formed on the wall was in a ball of light, like a spotlight. And in the middle was a dark, shadowy A on there. And it turns out the little girl that lived there, her name was Angela. People who die suddenly and tragically often don't necessarily realize that they've passed on. Therefore, they're going to go back to the place that's most familiar to them. I had goosebumps all over my body, and it scared the hell out of me. The last straw came almost two months in, in this apartment. I woke up one morning, and I smelled something burning. That's what woke me up, and I noticed it was too bright. I looked, and the blinds were gone off the window. I sat up and looked, and clear across the room, these blinds were laying on my electric heater, melting. And I was the only one home that day. These blinds were screwed into the wall, the wood frame of the window, and uh, you would have to take off caps you would have to take off four screws, and then you would have to lift them off to take them off. And I didn't hear any of that happening while I was sleeping. I started packing. I said, that's it. It's, that was the end of it. I packed up that day. Uh, I packed up quick and left. I have no doubt in my mind it was connected, and I think I ticked them off enough where they were willing to bring me with them, because that's, obviously, they were trying to burn the place down again. I mean, that's sort of, I mean, why else would you put plastic on a heater? After that, my friend Frank, who owned the building, he decided he would move in, he would take my apartment. He lasted there about a month. And then a month later, the building was up for sale. And I tried to talk to these guys. Why? He said they, had, they fixed it up. Why'd they sell it? They, they won't tell me. I think I know, though. There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. And it would keep coming, creeping up my leg. When the unsuspecting send an invitation to evil. Never in a million years did I think that 
it would happen in my home. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. After years of dating, Sika Groves and her boyfriend Dave were starting their life together in Dave's parents' basement. We went to visit the antique store to pick up something special, something that we thought would be our own. Everybody else had given us things, so we really wanted to get something that we thought was unique and sort of said who we were. When I first saw the washstand, it just stood out because it was a classic, probably about 1870s Victorian washstand. But it was just really unique and really different, and we fell in love with it. Little did Sika know that the washstand had brought something else along with it into her home, something a lot less welcome. It wasn't so much there was a change in the atmosphere of the home, but it was just strange things started happening. At first, it was just lights going off and on and or cupboard doors opening. Those kinds of things that you sort of think, maybe somebody left the light on or left the cupboard door open. But then you start to wonder because you're the only one home. But I didn't say anything at the time because I thought maybe they're gonna think I was crazy. I just remember going into the kitchen and there was this huge ripping sound. And it just sounded like a huge piece of fabric being torn, but really violently torn. And there was nobody home. I was the only one there. I was petrified and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God. I looked in the bathroom and I looked in the bedrooms and there was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary for me at the time. I think that it was probably about two months or so after we'd purchased the wash stand that we thought that perhaps that was sort of the gateway for the spirit to come in. Why we didn't get rid of it? Because I didn't believe it. You know, something could manifest itself in a piece of furniture. It wasn't long before the strange activity escalated and more people experienced it. We were sitting at the table in the kitchen and the coffee maker just shifted out into the middle of the table and then back against the wall. And then it did it a second time and we all were you know, just sort of jumped up and was like, oh my God, what, what's going on? Like, what's happening to us? Several months after moving into their new home, Sika and Dave decided to start a family. But the joy of their baby son's arrival was short-lived. 
an evil atmosphere seemed to permeate the home, and Sika and Dave began turning on each other. I was exhausted from the whole thing and exhausted from just, you know, had a newborn baby, new child, and, you know, a marriage that was going down the toilet. So I said to my, my, uh, my husband then, um, I can't deal with this. I am done! We are over! The marriage over, Sika moved into her own place with her young son, but she took the washstand and her troubles with her too. I took that washstand everywhere with me, still not really believing that it was the source of the problems. There's a conception that spirits can only attach to a location, where in fact they can attach themselves to a person, a place, or a thing. But to them, it's something important, something that connects them back to the world of the living. If it's an angry spirit, it can just start wreaking havoc throughout the house. This house was when a lot of activity started, a lot more than, than what we had had previously. Sika's son, now aged five, started to play with an imaginary friend. By this time, my son had given him a name. I'd go upstairs and he'd be in his room talking and I'd be like, who are you talking to? And he'd go, oh, it's Lenny, mom. Like it was nothing. And then he'd go, don't you see him? He's wearing a white shirt and black pants. And I'm like, no, I don't see him. So what I did say to him is I'm like, don't talk to him. Don't talk to him. Just, you know, if he comes and bothers you, you come and tell me. I had bought my son this teddy bear that could tell stories. And you put a little cassette tape in and it would tell stories. And there was a couple of times where the bear just started going off, like talking, and the tape would start to play. like the tape would go and it would go slow and then it would speed up. And I thought maybe it's being worn, it's breaking. So I just took the batteries out of the bear. And it, it came on. Even without the batteries in it, the, the bear came on. I didn't want anything interfering with my child, right? I mean, I'm a mom. And once again, the evil influence of the washstand started to cause trouble in Sika's personal life. 
It started to escalate when I started to date again. Um, anytime a new guy would come over to the house, um, things would start to happen. Sika Groves had tried to escape the paranormal activity that plagued her by moving house. But she had unwittingly brought along the very thing that was causing it, her beloved washstand. Anytime a new guy would come over to the house, um, things would start to happen. They would say, something's touching me, something's poking me. There was a point where I felt comfortable with the guy that I was seeing staying over. The first night that he stayed over, it was maybe 4 o'clock in the morning, and I could hear a little toy cell phone that my son had going off in the hallway. And so I got up. I got up out of bed to see if my son was up. There wasn't anything there. The noise stopped as soon as I opened the bedroom door. I mean, my son was fast asleep in his bed. I headed back to the bedroom, and when I walked into the room, it was dark, but I could see that my boyfriend was just lying stiff in the bed. and staring at the ceiling, and he was shaking. And I was like, what's wrong with you? What's the matter? And he's like, it's sitting on the bed, it's sitting on the bed, it's sitting on the bed, it's sitting on the bed. And he was petrified. He was so scared, he got up and he left. Honey, where are you going? He just, you know, up and left. It was 4.30 in the morning, and he wouldn't stay. Where are you going? Well, I was mad. I mean, I was angry just because of what had happened, right? And I was really mad. And I was like, why are you doing this? You stop doing this. You know, you're ruining my, my life. I think that was really the crux of when I felt like I have to do something. My boyfriend's mother had suggested that we bring somebody in that could do feng shui. You know, she sort of said, maybe you have bad energy flow in the house and there's things that they can help you realign and realign the energy. And if there's bad things there, they can, you know, make them leave. And I'm thinking, okay, it sounds crazy enough that it just might work. This, this. The feng shui expert immediately zeroed in on the washstand as the object that had brought the spirit into Sika's life. And she says, you're a magnet. You attract them. And I was like, what? No, what are you talking about? I didn't attract any. She says, that's why it's here. It might have come with the furniture, but it's here because of you. The best way to remove a spirit from a house 
when you're dealing with an object, maybe an antique that you, you have purchased somewhere, it would be a good idea to get rid of that antique, not to give it to someone else that you don't like, but to get rid of the object altogether. And that way you're getting rid of the attachment to that object, whether you bury it, some people want to burn it, but just get rid of it altogether. It's just a better way to do it. Only then did things get back to normal. I just says the was sticking. My son wasn't seeing him anymore, and things just weren't happening. For me, mentally, it made a big difference. Not every spirit can be gotten rid of so easily. In some cases, a paranormal entity can spread like an infection from one person to another, causing terror and chaos in its path. had an interest in the paranormal, but, uh, you know, I never ever thought that I'd ever experience one. It all started when Susan Hayes was having coffee at her friend's house. There she experienced something chilling. I could sense this entity and it would start out like a coldness in the bottom of my foot, like actually like it was entering my body. And it would keep coming, creeping up my leg. And I would just close my eyes and recite the Lord's Prayer over and over again. Our Father, our heaven, I kept redoing it. And it would just kind of go away again. Okay. Susan's friend told her she too had begun to experience strange things. And they all started when she let a mutual friend rent a room in her house. There was a girl that they let stay for a few weeks. She was in between residences. And uh, she had went in there one night and heard her chanting. Susan Hayes had experienced strange sensations while at her friend's house. But that wasn't the only weird thing going on there. Um, there was a girl that they let stay for a few weeks. She was in between residences. And uh, she had went in there one night and heard her chanting. She peeked in the room and she was doing some type of a ritual on the floor. And she just suddenly moved out about a few weeks later. When you're dealing with ceremony and rituals, depending on the intention of that ceremony, if your intention is to be ill-willed or to just open the door to anything, you can invite anything into the house, even the evil spirits, and most likely the people you don't want to come into that room. Susan and her friend decided to cleanse the house of whatever entity the boarder had ushered in. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and his words was in my tongue. We just kind of 
went online to try to find out what we should do. So we just kind of tried to handle it ourselves initially, but you know, it was honestly a big mistake. So as soon as we started reading the Bible and smudging, the little wooden case just slid right across the front of us. Needless to say, we kind of screamed and, and ran out the door. It terrified us quite a bit. I knew that she had summoned something into their home and they had only tried to help her. So I was very upset. About two weeks after my friend's family just decided to move. They just had had enough and they decided not to try to fight it. I was just in my room, just relaxing, watching TV. And all of a sudden I felt that cold, horrible, evil sensation again that I felt over at my friend's house. And I immediately knew it was there. I just knew. And I was terrified. It seemed that the entity from her friend's house had now attached itself to Susan. Soon the paranormal activity got worse. There would be scratching in the walls you could hear. Um, another time I could hear crashing up in the attic. So it would just it would just do anything it could just to disturb you in the middle of the night. It was antagonizing me so badly that I honestly thought I was going to lose my mind. I had just bought in the house, so I was not going to move out. So I just, you know, I was determined to get rid of this thing. Stop it! Susan knew she had to call in an expert. She contacted paranormal investigator Michelle DeRoche for help. When Sue sent me an email, I immediately felt drawn to her. Right off the bat, I could feel the desperation in it. When I reached out to Michelle, you know, I just gave her a vague message. I think we have a ghost problem. Hi. Hi. Michelle brought along a friend who was a psychic to help with the investigation. Yeah. This is Tyler. Hi, nice he, uh, he, he walked into my house and my cat went right to him, which was unusual in itself because my cat always hid from company. <coughs> the cat starts meowing at him like, meow, meow. And he starts answering it. He's like, oh, thank you, thank you. And I'm like looking like, what? He says, oh, I can communicate with animals. And then the cat kept beckoning Tyler to follow. And you know, you're just like, what? And uh, the cat showed him where the same woman who had done the ritual at the other house had hidden things in my home as well. While visiting Susan's house, her friend's lodger had put an evil hex on Susan too. small pieces of mirror throughout the house, which I guess I found afterwards can act as a portal or a, you know, an entry place into to my home. Yeah. 
we had found jars of urine hidden up in the rafters as well. From what I gather, that was a way that she could kind of hold claim to my home. A lot of that has to do uh, more with the occult, you know, working around the black arts. They will leave things like that on the premises and they will take something out of the home. It's like an exchange almost. Terrified of what malevolent entities the hidden objects were bringing into her home, Susan decided to get it cleansed. He basically did a smudging um, ceremony, you know, where he would come in with a, just a big sage smudge stick. Michelle and the psychic were unable to completely remove the spirit in one session, so they gave Susan instructions on how to keep it at bay until they could return to remove it for good. Michelle instructed me to uh, just to be very diligent, smudge, try to smudge daily. She gave me some exercises to do, uh, like salt baths, stuff like that, so that it, like, it personally couldn't infest me, because it certainly did try all the time. And we taught her basically how to kind of keep her environment calm. Michelle had calmed the activity in Susan's house, but in doing so, she had provoked a spirit that was not yet finished with her or her family. Investigator Michelle DeRoche had taken the first steps toward ridding Susan Hayes' home of sinister forces. But before she could return to finish the job, she had no idea the evil would infect a new victim much closer to home. I was 14 years old when she started doing the investigations. I didn't believe in much of anything until things started happening to me. I could hear her calling my name. I can't see I went over to her room and I said, what's wrong? She goes, I can't see. I'm like, what do you mean you can't see? She goes, I can't see. Mom, come here, I can't see. What's going on? I can't see, Mom. Nothing? No, I can't see anything. Like, I couldn't make out shapes. I couldn't make out anything other than the fact that I could tell, you know, the sun was out. I could tell that it was a little bit lighter of a darkness than, you know, complete pitch black. OK. All right. It really isn't uncommon for a medium who has cast out an evil spirit to have that evil spirit come back in some way or form and try to get revenge because that spirit will not be happy that it has been forced to move on. Brought her in, and he's like, her eyes look healthy. I, I don't even know what, what to say, but let's get all the tests done and let's see what's going on. They took pictures of the inside of her eyes. Everything was healthy. Even had her see a psychologist. So we explored everything, mental, physical. Nobody had any answers for us. Um, I was really worried, and I didn't think it would come back. I couldn't go to school. I missed my whole first semester. It's your job to protect them. It's your job to make sure bad things don't happen to them. It was terrible, just terrible time in that respect. Unable to find a medical cause, Michelle's doctor had another theory. He said, 
I'm just gonna throw this out there. Could you maybe have worked on something recently that might have caused this? It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me. I have been working professionally with the paranormal probably for the last, I would say, 12 years. Never in a million years did I think that it would happen in my home. Michelle quickly organized a seance at her home to contact whatever had taken away her daughter's sight. It was the same being. We were set to go back and we were gonna finish the job. And I basically, I said, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you take my daughter's sight? All it said was, it's their way. I said, fix this. And I'll stay away. I won't go back. If you leave her alone, I'll leave you alone. Michelle had offered a deal. If the spirit returned her daughter's sight, she would not return to Susan's house to cleanse it once and for all. I gave my eyes a good rub and it was like, it was never a problem in the first place. It was the weirdest, strangest thing. It just came back. And I was like, mom, my eyes are they are working. I can see. Mom, I can see. She goes, hey, I can see. I'm like, like, wow. I stayed true to my word. I never returned. Never returned. And Susan Hayes, using the techniques Michelle taught her, has kept the evil at bay ever since. Usually people don't willingly invite evil entities into their homes. But when Tammy Deans became obsessed with the spirit world, she accidentally opened the door to dark forces. to St. Marie and it was downtown. I was living with my daughter and I had a lot of overnight guests during this time. Tammy and her friends began experimenting with a spirit board. I don't even remember where we got it from, but we started out with just a regular board that you can buy. I was always interested in that kind of thing and it intrigued me. I wanted to know if it worked. There were four of us that played on a regular basis. But I didn't realize how serious 
it could become. We thought it was just a game. It started out with just dead grandparents, things like that. We wanted more out of it, so we started asking for things like Elvis and um, graduated from there to asking for the devil. We, if, if it was dead, we asked for it. Their curiosity quickly turned into an obsession. It was giving us yes and no answers to our questions. And from there, it just kept telling us a story. And as we got into it more, we started taking notes so that we could, you know, keep track of what was being told. Soon, it wasn't just messages the group were getting from the board. Who are you? We asked for, you know, the certain spirit to come in. What do you want from us? You would see the candles going out. <sighs> or making weird smoke patterns, I guess. I was scared, yes. That was when I didn't understand what was going on. Everything seemed to just be different in the air, and it's not so much that you could see it, it was the fact that you could feel where it was. We would hear a lot of knocking noises. We would hear growls continuously. Deans and her friends had been using a spirit board to speak with the dead, but the messages from beyond had become more frightening. We would hear a lot of knocking noises. We would hear growls continuously. I just could feel my skin crawl and my hair stand on the back of my neck. The shadow figures were there pretty much nightly. They would come and go, at least one, sometimes two or three, and they were huge. It wasn't necessarily a human form. We would all be sitting at the table and there's nobody else in the apartment with us except the baby in the crib way in the other room. But this figure would move where we knew we weren't moving, so that we knew that we weren't making it. At first, it was non-belief that we were seeing the, the shadow figures. Um, it really, everybody was kind of looking at each other, looking for an explanation. The excitement was really high, but it was also very fearful. In the wrong hands, the spirit board can bring up anything that you don't want. When you have a negative entity that comes through and you have an open invitation to that negative entity, that's who's gonna come through and not always a loved one. All this paranormal activity was taking its toll on Tammy. Once we were done playing the spirit board, I had to go back to my regular life for the next few hours. And it was very hard to ignore the fact that there was 
all this activity going on in the home that I was living in. But my obsession took over. We weren't into drugs or alcohol. It was, this was our obsession. This was our addiction. There was one particular night, and it's still unbelievable. My friend that was playing with us, she was sleeping on the floor. And she started dreaming and, and flailing around. We were trying to wake her up, and she started um, literally talking in what I believe to be tongues. At least 10, maybe even 15 minutes it took for her to finally come around. And when she woke up, her eyes were bloodshot, and she didn't remember anything about the dream or us trying to wake her up. I really thought that she may have been possessed at some point. It definitely scared all of us. Once you have opened that door with the spirit board, there can be a lot of horrible consequences. Uh, the spirits can become dangerous, and there are even many cases of possession as a result. Using a spirit board is just inviting all kinds of trouble you do not need. The possession didn't stop Tammy and her friends from using the spirit board, but nothing could prepare them for what would happen next. We were looking in the window, or out the window, and you could see them outside. Two different spirits were dueling, I guess you could say. unbelievable when I talk about it. It was very frightening. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. It was one thing to see them in the apartment, but to know that they can go outside actually scared me even more. Afraid of the demons they had unleashed, Tammy realized they had gone too far. Demons turned out to be the least of Tammy's problems when evil forces started to take over the thing most precious to her. Tammy Deans and her friend's obsession with the spirit board had invited paranormal entities into her home. One night, Tammy woke up to find her daughter, Billy, acting strangely. Billy? I went to go into her crib to lift her up, and her eyes scared the living daylights out of me. Everything okay? Knowing that as a mother, I'm supposed to be picking her up and taking care of her, but I'm so afraid by the, the look on her face and how she was staring at me with black eyes. It was very 
scary to know that something else could control me as a mother where I didn't feel like I could protect her. Knowing that we were playing with such evil things, I was very worried that something would happen to her. I do believe that we released something, but the story needs to be told because there's other people out there that are just as young and innocent and maybe stupid, if you want to call it, as we were. I'm hoping that through me, they can learn the lesson. The next morning, Tammy moved out and cut all ties with the group. Though we all live in the same city, none of us talk anymore. We don't want to have anything to do with each other anymore. She vowed never to touch a spirit board again, and the paranormal activity stopped. If you're going to do it, have great respect. Don't play with it. There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. It's just so shocking. Things like this aren't supposed to happen. When spirits send messages from beyond the grave. It was very scary. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Deadly Dreams, story number 13, featuring TJ. Take one. In 1985, I lived in Tampa, Florida. I had a very vivid dream one night. Uh, it was the most intense dream I had ever had in my whole life at that point in time. I could see the whole thing. My brother was riding a bicycle. A van with big side mirrors was coming down the road. head hit the side mirror and he flew through the air and he just laid there it, w it was like I was there and it woke me up I I woke up screaming I mean it was so real TJ was disturbed by the experience, but was relieved to wake up the next morning and realize it was only a dream. It wasn't until two days later, the dream I had came true. My brother had been killed. My brother was hit by a drunk driver, driving a van that he wasn't supposed to be driving. He didn't have a license. And he came up over the curb. And he hit my brother and killed him. He left my brother to, to die right there on the sidewalk. He didn't stop. It was a hit and run. I was scared to death because I didn't know what was going on. When I 
went back to Michigan for the funeral, they hadn't caught the gentleman that hit my brother. So they were still looking for him. And it was strange because there was a blue house maybe four blocks down that kept catching my interest. Something kept telling me, a voice kept saying, this house, there's something about this blue house. It wasn't until two weeks later, um, it came out in the newspaper that they had caught the, the gentleman that, that killed my brother. And they put his address <laughs> in the paper, which was kind of a shock. And when we went to that address, lo and behold, it was the blue house. He was hiding in the house. He wouldn't come out. It was suddenly clear to TJ that her visions were not dreams. I'm sorry. They were premonitions. I honestly believe my brother was telling me, this is where the person is. He's right here, he, you know, listen to me. I was very scared because you don't know how to talk to people about these type of things. One of the easiest ways for a spirit to communicate with a person is through their dreams while that person is asleep. They are more vulnerable at that point, more open, and so whatever the spirit is trying to communicate is easier, so it really is very common. TJ's deadly premonition about her brother was not to be her last. premonition dream of a friend of mine. Um, she came to me and told me that she wanted to say goodbye. She knew she was going to be passing. I came home from work, and the person I lived with said, I have some bad news to tell you. And I said, I already know, Stephanie passed away. And she was just in total shock. She's like, how did you know? And I'm like, she came to me last night and told me she was going to be passing and she just wanted to say goodbye to me. And I felt like I was cursed because all these people are coming to me telling me they're dying, they're leaving me. This is how I felt. The nighttime visions kept on coming. <laughs> It made it hard to go to sleep. I didn't want to because it was like, am I gonna have another dream tonight? Is somebody gonna be gone tomorrow? So it was really hard to sleep. TJ's dreams continued on and off for over 15 years. Pat was my significant other for 23 years. In 2006, we decided to go separate ways. TJ and Pat remained friends, and Pat even moved into the upstairs apartment. One night, several months later, TJ had another of her special dreams. I woke up from having a bad dream about Pat. I visually seen her laying down, uh, half on, half off her bed. And she was gray. And it scared me. That morning, because she lived, uh, Patricia lived above myself in a different apartment, she came down to have coffee. And I asked her, I said, are you feeling OK? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. But she didn't look, you know, herself as, as far as, you know, she looked extremely tired. That night, TJ was watching television when she heard a noise from the apartment where Pat lived. 
It was very scary. And I ran out the door and up the stairs. Pat was laying there half on, half off the bed, gray. And it just shocked me to see that because that was my dream. I was scared to death because automatically I thought of the dream and I thought, did I do this? Because I dreamt it, you know, it, it, because it, as I said, it's scary to dream it and then to see it. She had lung cancer and it was in its final stages. We may not be able to understand, but, but people who have a very close rapport in life continue that connection after death. And it's important that we listen and pay attention to what that spirit may be trying to tell us because that bond is still there trying to help us. TJ told her new partner, Angel, about her deadly dreams. At first, I was a little skittish about it, you know? but I didn't doubt her any whatsoever um, until it happened to me. TJ had been getting messages from spirits in her dreams, usually warning of the death of someone close to her. At first, I was a little skittish about it, you know, but I didn't doubt her any whatsoever um, until it happened to me. Angel's uncle, Uncle Mandy, I called him Uncle Mandy. He was my buddy. Loved to hear his stories. And one night, he come to me in a dream. And I'm thinking, oh boy, here comes Uncle Mandy. And he's like, TJ, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell my angel that I love her. He says, I want you to tell Angel, thank you for loving me. She's always going to be my favorite niece and I love you both for all the time you've spent with me. It was my time to go. And then I woke up. And it was probably four o'clock in the morning. And I got up because I knew what this dream meant. He had been sick. We'd been to see him a few times. I went to the kitchen table and I sat down and started drinking coffee and waiting for, for Angel to wake up, thinking to myself, I know how she's gonna take this. That's her favorite uncle. She loves him to death. How, how am I gonna sit here and tell her? that he came to me in a dream. TJ was drinking coffee and she had this real down look on her face. And she said, told me, she says, you need to sit down and tell you something. And she says, I had a dream about Uncle Mandy. He came to me. first words came out of my mouth was, don't tell me he's dead. And immediately she looked at me and the tears started to flow because she knew what my dreams meant. And I started to tell her, I got out. He wants you to know he loves you and that you're his favorite niece and Angel's phone rang.
And it was my aunt, my Aunt Donna. And she says, Angel, Uncle passed away last night. And I told her, and I said, I know. She said, how'd you know? I said, because TJ told me. It was very hard to have to sit and tell Angel that somebody that she loved so much was going to die, that he had died already. I think what was a comfort was to me was that Uncle Mandy trusted me enough to come to me to tell me what he wanted his last message to his niece to be. And after that, I realized I have a purpose, and that is listening to the voices that wish to speak, you know, they want to be heard still, the spirits. What at once I thought was a curse as a gift today. The burden I felt 25 years ago has lifted. I don't feel that burden anymore. I have a purpose. I know what my purpose is now. Sometimes messages from the spirit world are delivered with love, but not always. Sometimes they come not as a gift, but as a curse. Survivor 2, Jennifer Spirits, take one. We moved there uh, when I was around three years old. As I got older, I started noticing things. Doors sounded like they were closing, opening. You'd hear the door playing as day, just open or close. And we would go into the back of the house, and the door would be either all the way open or all the way shut, uh, just the opposite of what we left it. It wasn't just the doors that seemed to have a mind of their own. My mom and I were at home by ourselves. We had uh, the lights going off and on. Soon the strange activity in the house began to get more frightening. My mom uh, was, she always sat every morning, she would sit at the kitchen table and uh, drink her coffee and read the paper. And she kept saying something out of the corner of her eye. Things have been happening in the home of Bill Salzman and his mother. But the activity was about to escalate. She finally looked up the hallway, and there was a man standing there in a brown suit with, uh, there was no face, it was just the body. As she looked at it, it moved off and just disappeared. She was really scared about that. 
Yeah, we named the ghost John not so much as a joke as it's just we wanted to put a name to it and it got to the point where when we would hear things that we would just say, oh, it's just John. One of our neighbors asked us if we realized that someone had passed away in our house before we moved in and we're like, no, we didn't know that. And they said, yeah, you, the gentleman passed away in your kitchen. He said he had a heart attack there. And uh, we're like, do you know what his name was? And they said his name was John. So that, you know, gave us chills. The activity continued, but did not get worse, and the family learned to live with it. But 20 years later, a tragedy would change things, and not for the better. My father passed away in 2001, and my mom had lived there by herself at that time. She said that the presence of John seemed to increase. She would actually feel about it, somebody touch her, um, and she just couldn't explain any of it. And it got to the point to where she wanted to sell the house. And that's when I decided to buy the house. In 2006, Bill moved back into the family home with his daughter, Jennifer. When Jennifer was six years old, we noticed that she would uh, look up at the hallway and just stare. He was more of a, like, in a black suit, I guess, and it was black hair, and I could see his face more in detail, like, his eyes were kind of, like, slanted, I guess. And he wore glasses sometimes. We would watch her, and she'd start talking and waving at somebody, and then she would smile. And uh, we couldn't ever figure out. We'd always go and look, and we never could see anything or figure out what she was doing. Sometimes it would be standing in her closet. Other times it would be standing at the foot of her bed. It never did anything or said anything at that time. It would just stare at her. It was more of dark shadows just standing there watching me. And it was just kind of creepy. I think children and young adults are more apt to see spirits because they still have that ability. They haven't grown out of it. They're much more sensitive. There's an innocence there. And they don't know that it's anything unusual or wrong to see a spirit from the other side. The older Jennifer got, the more intense and disturbing the activity became. There's a little kid at the end of my bed. She was wearing a little white dress. I think her hair was more long, kind of a medium brown color. I was really freaked out about it when I saw her. At this little stand, I would do my hair in, and she would just be there. Turn around, it's gone. I know she sat at the end of my bed, just in a little ball one time, and that really scared me. It was probably happened like every other day. I kind of covered up my head and just hid under the blankets. Like, I was just relying on my blankets to save me, I guess. The activity plaguing Jennifer continued to get worse. Come join us. When I turned 14, it escalated. Ever since she moved into her grandmother's old house, Jennifer had been visited by spirits, but the activity had taken a darker turn. 
when I turned 14. It escalated. Go join us. Kill yourself. It was like a big band of them just standing around my bed. They were starting to talk to me. I didn't know what it was, so I was just scared and didn't know what to do. I didn't want to be there alone. Sometimes I just stay in my room because I didn't want to go past them. And so I would holler for my parents to get them in there. My parents were like, it's just you. Your mind's playing tricks on you. But I was like, I can hear something. You don't understand. Come here. The spirits returned on a regular basis, always with the same message for Jennifer. They wanted her to join them in the spirit world. You shouldn't be there. There were about four shadows around my bed just talking, and I could hear them. I could hear them very clear, and I didn't know what to do. I was just kind of sitting there, like, having a panic attack, just crying, and... You should be on this side. Come here. You shouldn't be there. Kill yourself. They were just telling me that I should kill myself and you don't belong here anymore and come join us. They were all like talking at the same time, but I could understand all of them. It lasted for about an hour. It went from like five in the morning to six. Come here. You should be on this side. You shouldn't be there. Kill yourself. And I called the police and had them, I had told them what was happening, about how these voices were telling me to kill myself. It was just horrible. It was terrifying and something you could not understand. I was woken up and my wife tells me, hey, you're gonna have to get up. The ambulance and fire trucks on their way to our house. And she was, uh, Jennifer had had thoughts of suicide. And so she called 911. I didn't know what to do at that point. I went into the emergency room and there were like few psychiatrists that came in. They were talking to me. Jennifer was in the hospital for eight days total. Um, I felt more relieved when I went in to the hospital because there weren't any voices or anything. I got a lot of help from all the people that were there. I had like 10 people talking to me and they didn't find anything. It's not a case of mental illness hearing spirit voices. Maybe years ago they might have thought that, but people have the natural ability to hear voices from the other side. Before Jennifer came home, we ended up contacting a Heart of Illinois Paranormal Investigators. I've been working as a paranormal investigator since approximately 2007. It was oppressive. It, it was a really, when you walked in the bedrooms, there was really a heavy feeling, Jennifer's bedroom being the worst. We detected multiple spirits in the house. There was mainly one in her room, and it was male. And he, he was angry, and he wanted us gone. And her, her room was very oppressive. I mean, it was just, the feeling in there was really heavy. I wouldn't have wanted to sleep in there either. He was just completely evil. And I think he was just getting stronger. Janice immediately began a cleanse to rid the house of the evil spirits. We went through the house with sage, holy water, and blessed salt. And we would put salt on the window or window sills and the corners and the closets. And we, we said prayers for the spirits to leave. And we always say the Lord's Prayer after. And we put holy water 
cross is like on the windowsills and the doorway when we leave. And then we go to the next room, do the same thing through each room. Jennifer's room, you know, was a little hard. Because the spirit didn't want to leave. After they'd performed the blessing, uh, it got very quiet in the house. There, to this day, I haven't had anything, no noises or anything happen throughout the house. When I went home, when I got home actually, I was kind of nervous because I didn't know if they were still going to be there. When I got there, it was so different. I mean, there was nothing. It was so quiet. My daughter actually at one point said that it, uh, it kind of feels weird because nothing is happening. My room was just so quiet, but I do listen to my music still because I don't want to hear anything just in case. spirits might send messages to the living to try to destroy life, there are other entities whose messages are aimed at saving lives. Paranormal Survivor 2, Robert's Phantom Fighter, story number 15, take one. I met Ronnie in the ninth grade, and we ended up being pretty good friends. Ronnie was a joker. There was a party, he was like the funniest guy. He was just that all-American kind of guy. A keen boxer, Ronnie also liked to fight outside the ring. Ronnie was a scrapper. He was that kind of guy that could handle himself. Ronnie was fighting a kid. We noticed that he was Every time he got hit, he was doubling over. And we ran up to him. We noticed that he was bleeding everywhere. And the kid that he was fighting with had a, a knife in between his fingers, like a, a little short blade. And every time he was punching him, he was actually stabbing him. So Ronnie didn't, uh, he didn't make it. It was hard. It was hard. He was a, you know, Ronnie dying was a, it was a hard hit. It's at that age, you're not, you know, you're gonna live forever, you know, and here's this guy that we all looked up to. 20 years later, a family emergency brought Robert back to his roots. Uh, my stepdad developed cancer and to make it easier on my mom to help out, I ended up renting Ronnie's mother's old house because it's directly across the street from my mother's house. Robert had fond memories of the house, but strange things started to happen. My wife, she had come down to visit me and she had bought her daughters with her. And so we were, we were sleeping in, in the room. And the bed started shaking. And when I say shaking, it's violent. It's not just a little bump on the bed. I mean, it, it's, it's a big, heavy bed. When I felt like the kicking of like the head, uh, the footboard, I, it woke me up and I was like freaked out. I was scared and I woke Robert up and I was like, I felt that. It just felt like when you opened your eyes, you would see someone at the foot of the bed, maybe hitting the bed, but there was never anyone there. The bed-rattling wake-up calls happened every night for weeks, each time at 3 a.m. I wasn't comfortable there at night. It was, like, scary. I slept real close to him. 
During the week, Robert was alone and had grown tired of being awoken at 3 a.m. I had worked um, a pretty long day, and I just, for some reason, I happened to fall asleep on the couch. Since moving into the home of his late high school buddy, Robert Johnson had been woken by strange activity every night at 3 a.m. For some reason, I happened to fall asleep on the couch. He didn't realize it at the time, but that decision saved his life. I heard a loud series of bangs, three loud bangs in the house. Um, and I woke up and I noticed that it was really dark in the house. So then I noticed I couldn't breathe. At that point, I realized it was, I smelled fire, it was smoke. So I dropped to the floor and when I, when I got on the ground, I could see the fire pretty much everywhere on the, on the back towards the bedrooms and coming down the hallway. Um, at that point, I realized my house is on fire, so I kind of crawled towards the door and threw some clothes out, and, and that's, how I, that's how I got out of the house. I lost everything. The house had a faulty electrical service. They actually tracked the fire down to one breaker to exactly right where it happened. The fire inspector told me that if I would have slept in the bedroom, that I, I wouldn't have made it because it, it went up so quick. He was pretty shaken up from the fire. He tried to, like, you know, be strong and tough about it, but, yeah, he was pretty shaken up about it. I had spoken to my sister, um, who also knew Ronnie, and she was like, oh, my God. She was like, you've been waking up, being woken up at this time every night, Rob. That means something. And she was like, I think that it was Ronnie trying to get you out of the house. She said, I think that he was just getting you prepared to get up and go every night, every night, 3 o'clock, to get you up and out and moving. I believe wholeheartedly that it was Ronnie just getting me out of there, making sure that I was going to be OK. Spirits become guardians of people on a daily basis, especially the loved ones, especially your family members and your friends. It's not uncommon to have a friend of yours you haven't seen for quite a few years that become your spirit guide and help guide you through there. And you'd find out for a reading for a medium or even going to see a psychic or even a visitation, you may see that person through a dream or physical state. With nowhere to stay, Robert moved in with Tina, but the nightly wake-ups continued. sleep with our doors closed and you could hear the doorknobs. the doorknob turning and you could hear it and I was like Robert you hear that are you awake sometimes at your door you'd actually feel the door moving which could be explained away maybe the window was open but not the doorknob there's no way the doorknob's gonna twist back and forth and then the familiar terror returned. We still have the bed shaking. You would be laying in bed, and the next thing you know, your whole body's moving back and forth. The bed's, like, shaking. The 
bed shaking, I would see like a large dark black shadow in the corner of the room and it just gave off like just the scariest vibe. Spirit attachment is very common. If a person in, in, is in a, in a situation where they're in a house that's active and that spirit has an attachment to that person, when they move from house to house, it's not uncommon for that spirit to also move from house to house. Soon the shadow became more physical. We've seen full shadows move from one room to the other. And you just look up and it's like something nonchalantly walks by. And you're like, wow, would you look at that? I was eating and you just heard like the loudest thud. And when I felt it move, my fork flew out of my bowl and I was speechless. My daughter was like, oh my God, did you see that? And I was, I couldn't even speak. It's just so shocking. Like, things like this aren't supposed to happen. This is what you see in movies. This is not what you see in your day-to-day -day life. But that was not the worst. One night I was asleep and <laughs> it, it felt like something punched me in my face. I felt my whole head move back into the pillow. I woke up, there was, you know, red mark on my face. I, I knew I had been hit. Something hit me in the middle of my sleep. Why is this happening again? And my wife was just beside herself, like, I can't believe that all this is going on. We decided that we had to, we had to reach out to someone. It was, there was just too much. I needed an explanation. I needed to know, I mean, how do you protect your family from something that you can't see? from something that you can't touch. Tina and Robert both seemed pretty scared by what they were experiencing. Like most investigations, we set up our four camera DVR system. Uh, we set those up in locations where the client has told us most of the activity is taking place. There's an application we use called Ghost Radar. Uh, it can give you voices through it, which are considered EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. Spirits can try to use these things to communicate. I had no expectations. I just, in one side of the corner, I wanted them to find something, and on the other side, I was like, this is just nonsense. It's, what are they gonna find? After being attacked in his sleep, Robert Johnson called in paranormal investigators to find out who or what was to blame. During the night investigation, we collected a, a, a lot of different data. One was a female voice. One was the voice of a, it sounded like a young girl or a young child. And uh, another was a male voice. One thing we did notice that was kind of strange um, we would, two of us would go into one room to do an investigation. We started asking some questions. And then we had another ghost radar device in another room, which we'd hear start talking that nobody was in. And this, I mean, it hadn't been talking all night. And then all of a sudden it starts to talk. So we'd wait a few minutes, we'd go in that room, and it would switch back to the other room. It was almost like it was playing a game with us. He was definitely able to confirm that things were really happening, that there was definitely spirits in the home. Something was starting to tell me that maybe we're dealing with Robert's friend who had passed away. I sat, just sat on the edge of the bed and just told Sarah I was gonna meditate. 
and I did. I just closed my eyes and began to just meditate and asking in my head, whoever might be there, show yourself to me or communicate to me. And I have this strong vision. It's like me looking at you. Um, taller gentleman, dark hair, well-built, chiseled features. Jack rushed to tell Robert about his vision. I said, and he was wearing a light blue shirt and dark slacks. He goes, what did you just say? I said, he was wearing a light blue shirt, dark slacks. And he told me, he goes, that's what he was murdered in. When he was killed, that's what he was wearing. It was pretty crazy. And it was just, you know, he was telling me these things, and I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, it's, it's, it sounds like Ronnie. I believe Ronnie was trying to communicate with Robert by using physical force, because they had always done that at, in their teens. Always just hitting each other, fighting together. And I really think it was Ronnie who had hit him that night. It was the next morning before Jack completed his investigation. I did do a clearing of the house. And um, we did ask anything that was negative to leave. I did tell Ronnie he could stay. If he was there, he could stay because he's Robert's friend. And I knew he wouldn't be there to do any harm to Robert. I feel OK if Ronnie's there. Maybe he's making sure that things don't get too crazy. After Jack left, you felt that heaviness go away in the house. It didn't feel scary. You, you, you felt totally different in the house. And um, that was a good feeling to have that heavy feeling go away. Do I think that Ronnie's still with me? Yes. There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. <laughs> I'm so scared. When spirits possess the living. So much pain, so much death. Yeah! I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Uh, story number 16, possession of Trish. I started having nightmares in the year 2000 about a house that made me feel so much anxiety I would wake up crying. I couldn't see the outside of the house. I don't recognize the house. But I was seeing a little girl wandering around. And I was seeing um, people who were hung. But I wasn't sure what it had to do with anything. I had no clue. I had the nightmares two or three times a week for about six months. It scared me. I started seeing a counselor over those nightmares. Six months after her nightmares began, Rose and her daughter Trish moved, renting a beautiful, historic home. It was a very large house with five bedrooms, probably over 100 years old with a huge backyard that led right out to the Detroit River. 
We just walked in the door, Trish and I. We knew right then what we'd done. We were wrong. Trish looked at me and said, Mom, we shouldn't be here. And I said, I know. The feeling was just a lot of anxiety, uh, sorrow, just sadness. And I couldn't explain why. From the moment we got into that house and we stepped in the door and realized that this is the house from my dreams, we were feeling this anxiety. I wanted to pack everything up and just leave right away. But there was nothing we could do. We couldn't leave. We just spent every penny we had to get in there. We felt stuck. We weren't sure how we were going to get out, but we didn't want to be there. Despite their fears, Rose and Trish took a look around. We did a walkthrough of the house, got to the top floor, which was the attic. I just had an intense feeling of sadness come over me. At that point, I dropped to my knees and I started to cry, and I couldn't stop. I couldn't explain why I felt that way. Trish started crying, and she couldn't stop. She barely knew who she was. Uneasy, but penniless and unable to leave, Rose and Trish decided to stick together in the place they felt safest. The anxiety was throughout the whole house, but we stayed on the main floor, which, like in my dreams, that was the only place we were safe. And that is exactly where we slept, together. Nothing could have prepared them for what happened on their first night. There was screams, there was stomping, there was doors slamming. Shadows coming down the stairs, you'd hear the footsteps. It, it was so scary. I tried to stay away from the upstairs, tried to keep her down. Despite the shadows and the noises, Trish found herself drawn to the attic. I'd see a little girl upstairs in the attic. She looked to be five or six years old, wearing a white nightgown. I would always find her upstairs in the closet. She looked like a real person. I knew she was a ghost. As soon as she'd go missing, I would find Trish upstairs. She would be bringing anything that a child wanted to this little girl. But I couldn't see her at all. She was just lonely. She wanted someone to keep her company. So I would bring her toys a few times a day. Sometimes the spirit, in its attempt to reconnect with the world of the living, will use some sort of trickery and make it seem like it is your friend. Spirits look for the easiest targets. Children, they want easy prey, someone they can easily take over and control, furthering its agenda and getting more of a hold on you. I tried to keep her from going to see that little girl. It was an obsession. As well as the little girl, there were other, more evil manifestations lurking around the house. I would see black people hanging from the rafters. They'd gone a noose. Um, There's dead bodies hanging. She was telling me, they're right there, mother. They're right there. And I couldn't see them. It, it, it was bad. 
As the days passed, Trish's personality drastically changed. Trish was doing really strange things. She was in a daze. It was like she was not even there. I couldn't let her do anything in the house. She'd put something on the stove and leave it there, walk away. She didn't know who she was. I had gone weeks without sleeping, without eating. I couldn't. I wasn't tired. None of it was affecting me. I do feel as though something in the house was taking me over. It was probably about three in the morning. I felt drawn to the young girl in the attic again. I couldn't figure out why. Almost like I had no control as to what I was doing. I was worried about Trish going up and talking to the ghost child. I felt this little girl was more of a threat. I was afraid that she would completely take over her and there would be nothing left of my daughter. I was so scared that my child would never be the same. Trish's condition continued to worsen. There was times when she wanted out of the house. Mom, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. I said, yeah, we gotta get out. And I was searching for a place. There's other times when she would say, we're not going anywhere, we're staying right here. We're not leaving. We're not leaving! Not! That's when I knew it wasn't her, because I know when she was in her normal self, she wanted out. A spirit can affect a person in many different ways. They may stop eating, they may have trouble sleeping, they may start engaging in self-destructive activities, they lose themselves. A spirit doesn't possess a person for good intentions. They are taking over this person's body, their personality, and I don't consider that good in any way. Protective of her daughter, Rose desperately searched for a connection between the new house and Trisha's disturbing behavior. Started doing a bit of research and found out they had caught some people who were involved with the Underground Railroad coming across and hung them on this on Canadian side behind our house. Then Rose made another horrifying discovery about the girl Trish kept seeing in the attic. We couldn't understand why a little girl would be involved in this and found out that uh, a preacher had gotten his daughter pregnant and uh, he drowned that child behind our house in the river. That was in 1840 and that's what worried me. I didn't want this child to take her over to go down to the river and do what happened to her. I didn't want my daughter to drown. Terrified her daughter would be lured to the river, Rose kept a vigil over her for weeks until one fateful night. I'd waited for my mother to fall asleep. And I walked in the pitch black down to the Detroit River, drawn there with this little girl. Come with me. Trish Sterling had been possessed by the spirit of a little girl who was leading her toward the icy water of the Detroit River. Trish's mother had no idea she had gone. I walked in the pitch black down to the Detroit River, drawn there with this little girl. Come with me, follow me. It was like somebody else was using my body, almost like I had no control as to what I was doing. I had woken up and she was gone. 
I searched for her all over the house, went through all the rooms, and I, I panicked. Rose was terrified her worst fear had come true. Right away, I thought about the river. I can't recall why, but I was in the water. I can't recall why I was in the water, but I, I ended up back at the house. My mother found me. She was soaked. She was soaked from head to toe. She said, I went into the river. I knew it was the spirits. I knew that the spirits had taken control of her. She said that the little girl took her down there, that she wanted to go to the river. I was just so glad that she was still alive. She was very upset. My mother was very upset when she'd found me in the basement and knew I had gone down to the river, because that was her worst fear. I knew I had to take her to the hospital. I knew I had to get her out of that house before it killed her. She was in the hospital for, for about a week. Whatever had a hold of me, I, I had trouble trouble getting rid of it. It still followed me. It scared me. That's That house scared me. I didn't want to go back. While Trish recovered from the traumatic experience in hospital, Rose packed up and moved out. When my mother told me she'd found us a place, I was obviously very thankful. Living in that house was uh, basically living a nightmare. Eventually, Trish was able to shake off any lingering traces of the presence that had possessed her. After everything I had gone through, I didn't want to ever experience that again. In some instances of possession, spirits take control of the living to get them to do what they want. But in other cases, entities completely enter the body of the living, who take on their personality and behavior. Story number 12, The Wolverton. We purchased the house in April 2008. Country setting, old traditional 1800s architecture. I was just sold before I was even inside the house. It just drew me in. Roseanne said, I want to buy the house. Immediately. She just said, this is the one. The house was the former home of a prominent local family. And as David and Roseanne would soon discover, the house was alive with history. The real estate lady and the owner had arranged champagne and orange juice. The woman who owned the house started talking about uh, spirits. It's been great living here, except for the guilt ghost. And at that point, she said he frequently visits me um, at night. And immediately, my wife got a little bit paranoid. But I was told, don't worry about it. She doesn't know. She's just had a few glasses of champagne too many, and I let it go. Despite the ghost story, David, Roseanne, and their seven-year-old daughter, Eilish, moved into Wolverton Hall. Their son, Perry, and his fiance also stayed over for the first weekend. It was a decision he would come to regret. 
Perry and Lisa had sat on the bed, and it was at that point she said Perry just looked over to the doorway and mentioned there was the, a man standing there. And it was at that point she said his whole demeanor changed. He went quiet, his face was expressionless. She then asked him, Perry, you okay? <laughs> screaming. So much screaming. He got upset. He started crying. So much blood! Talking about people. They were in pain and he couldn't help them. Blood. He was crying and convulsing so bad, just so upset. He was really in trouble, um, physically, emotionally. For me to see this, I was just like. He just kept going over about so much pain, so much death, so much uh, misery. We just couldn't get a hold of him. Shortly after moving into Wolverton Hall, the Weber's son, Perry, was overcome with terror. He just kept going over about so much pain, so much death, so much uh, misery. <laughs> just pain. I had never seen anything like it. That went on the whole night till 7.38 in the morning. So much death. <laughs> Something had just taken over and, and he was in another place and he couldn't get back. And eventually he passed out and went to sleep. He was just so exhausted. Since we moved to Wolverton, things started to change. Suddenly afraid for her family, Roseanne searched for answers. My neighbor next door to me who's been in Wolverton for about 30 years, she said to me, um, I have a book you need to read about the Wolvertons and the sons who went to the Civil War. The book detailed the history of the American Wolverton family, after which the house was named. It included the writings of their son, Daniel, who fought in the US Civil War. So I read the book and there was a chapter, it was a letter from Daniel. He was in the middle of a battle and word for word, what he expressed to his sister Rose in the book was exactly what my son had said um, during his convulsions. So much blood! I just got to chill. Roseanne started to believe that Perry had been possessed by the spirit of Daniel Wolverton. Perry wasn't the only one affected. Eilish, my daughter, uh, it was almost like you'd be talking to her and she's not there. Eilish. It was very strange. Eilish also appeared to be under Daniel's spell. She would say that she was the mother of her imaginary friends. They were her children. And you're in my house. It didn't stop. It just didn't stop. And it was at that point she would say to me, Mom, there's a man over there. Yeah. 
and I would just respond, okay, do you want mommy to get rid of them? And she'd go, yes. It happened all the time. Soon, Eilish's behavior became even more disturbing. One night, we had decided we were going to go up to the big bed and, and, and make some popcorn and have a TV night. And I went to get into the bed beside her, and she said, no. Really, really angry, frustrated, no. No, Mommy. She had told me, you can't come into bed. You can't touch my children. And I asked her, where are your children? She goes, they're here. My three children, they're dead. I asked, did you hurt your children? She responded, no, they're their father with a hammer. Scary, all I can say is scary. It wasn't long before another member of the family became taken over by the spirits in the house. I'm a pretty laid back guy, but living in the house, the pressure started really developing. Um, Are you kidding me, Rose? It started to escalate. Have you seen this place? Uncontrollable anger, unexpected, um, verbal. Um, to myself and to Eilish. One minute he'd be okay, next minute he, he just became something else, someone else. And what do we have to do with this? Do not tell me to calm down! You're just, it was like somebody shook up a bottle of Coke and you're ready to, to blow up. You calm down! Some days were really bad. You just feel like, um, punching somebody. That's how bad it got. He would throw things, furniture, televisions. Anything he could damage, he would damage. This went on and on, and it got worse and worse. And you're like trying to control it. Couldn't. I would just leave the house. I'd just have to get out. The intensity was just overwhelming. Spirits can very often change a person's personality and have them behave in ways they never would have dreamed of otherwise. And these can be quite destructive, both to themselves and the people around them. When you lose your self-control to that extreme, and it's never been in your nature, very worried, very, very worried. That got my attention, and it was at that point I decided I'm, I'm going to get some, some medium, some paranormal help. When we pulled up to the house, we noticed a male spirit in the top window. So I knew that we were dealing with some pretty strong activity if it was there right off the bat to greet us. The home was a very old home, and old things tend to attract spirits. It had a very angry, violent feeling. And instantly, I start having this vision of their daughter and this male energy, this spirit standing, just glaring at her with absolute anger and, and hatred. The spirit in the house didn't take kindly to Sam and Christine's investigation. I was coming down the top stairs, and I felt these two hands on my back, and they pushed me. I freaked right out. Ridding a malicious spirit intent on possessing the current inhabitants of its former home proved to be a dangerous task for paranormal investigator Christine McGee. I was coming down the top stairs, and I felt these two hands on my back, and they pushed me, and I went down, just slid right down, and I screamed at the top of my lungs.
after they did their paranormal evaluation. They had called us all into the living room. They sat us down, Eilish, myself, and David, and, and they had validated the negative energy. It's real. So that gave me some sanity. For the first time, I, I cried. I cried. Due to the aggressiveness of the negative spirit in the home, we had to get rid of him immediately. And they'd said there was a negative energy and it was feeding and fueling on David. It was getting his energy from David. It did not like children and it did not like women. It wants to hurt. If a spirit has died in a violent way, it may be very angry that its life was cut short. It may become very vindictive and try to take out its frustrations, vent its anger on the living. Spirits from the past can get trapped in the present because there's some regret, some emotional trauma that has made them lose their way. There's a process of crossing over where we invite the light between the corridors between here and there to open up. And when that happens, then we will walk a spirit in so far, and then they go the rest of the way. But not all of them go nicely. Some of them go kicking and screaming. It would prove to be a difficult task, removing the malevolent spirit of Daniel Wolverton. The negative energy was communicating with me, telling me, you can't do it. You can't get rid of me. Making me feel ill, making me feel sick. <gasps> Trying to force me to stop. The male entity was so angry. My main concern was just getting him out and getting him as far away from that family as we possibly could. We suggested smudging, burning of sage. We did a full home cleansing in which we sealed the home itself with salt from the Dead Sea. This is a very strong barrier that keeps out negative spirits. He was trapped in and just reliving death over and over and over again. We forcefully crossed him over and sent him into the light where he could find peace. The paranormal investigators successfully crossed over the spirit of Daniel Wolverton. The next day, it was a relief. It was like somebody had just lifted a weight off of our house. First time I could honestly say I was at peace again. Just happy, normal people living in a beautiful, normal house. We'd finally resolved the problem. Since the cleansing, the haunting spirit of Daniel Wolverton has been neither seen nor heard from in Wolverton Hall again. It's not always easy to identify who the possessor is or what they want, but that doesn't make it any less frightening. Story number three, featuring Heidi. I moved in 2001. It was just me and my son. Jamie was eight when we moved in there. It was a three-story, and there was an attic. At first, it seemed like the perfect home. It was close to two weeks before I started noticing strange activity. It started with weird noises. We'd hear things up in the attic. And at first I thought it maybe it was just like mice, so I ignored it, but then it became louder. We could hear what sounded like physical running across the ceiling. 
inside. We thought someone was breaking in. Terrified by strange noises in the attic, Heidi and her son felt under attack. We could hear what sounded like physical running. When we heard that, we thought someone was breaking in. So we went to our neighbors and we asked them if they could look in the attic and see if there was someone in there. And they checked everything out and said nothing was up there. They didn't hear anything. There's nothing up there. I'm sure we heard something. When they came down and said there was nothing there, I was a little nervous. There may have been no explanation for the strange noises coming from the attic, but that didn't stop them from happening. Every night about 11 o'clock, we would hear the noises in the attic. It would almost be like clockwork. It would always seem to start with pitter-patter of running, and it would go from one end to the other, back and forth. Then it started to sound like noisy furniture. It would be like scraping across the ceiling. The only consolation was that the strange activity had been confined to the attic up to now. Things started being out of place. I had a, a roll of these wax candle apples. And I'd come home from work, and one apple would be lit, sitting perfectly in the middle of the kitchen floor, or it would be like, you know, off to the side by the closet. I instantly felt fear. It was going on every single day. There was not a day that something did not happen. The situation grew worse. The constant disturbances weighed heavily on Heidi and her son. I, I was scared at that point. I couldn't sleep at night. My son started having night terrors. He was getting scared to sleep in his room. Unsure what was tormenting them, Heidi insisted her son stay by her side. When we went to bed, we would sleep with our bedroom door shut and we'd keep the TV on all night long. But morning brought new and unsettling evidence that the presence was dangerous. Oh, I would wake up with these bruises here. Sometimes I'd have scratches on my neck. Sometimes I would get odd bruising on my legs. It would happen, I would say, at least once a week. The bruising scared me because I didn't know if something was physically gonna hurt my son too. I felt threatened, but I was scared. Desperate for answers, Heidi called her landlord about the threatening events occurring in the house. Passed away here. My landlord said that the previous owner of the building had died in the attic. And when he had said that, these three loud bangs right over us, boom, boom, boom. It was like something was trying to get my attention. I was so frightened. I never went into the attic after I heard those noises. That was when I started to think something more spiritual was taking place. Afraid to be alone with just her son in a haunted house, Heidi was relieved to find a roommate. My neighbor had mentioned to me that 
her boyfriend's friend needed a place to stay, would I be interested in renting out the attic? And I said, I wouldn't mind, but I don't know if he would mind the ghosts. She explained to me things that had happened in the past, and I didn't believe it whatsoever. It's your typical Midwestern attic. It's old, creaky, but, you know, things like that didn't bother me that much. Soon after, David's feelings drastically changed. Things would be moved. Uh, strange things, like uh, my pants would be out of my dresser and stacked on top of my dresser. It was almost as if somebody was cleaning my apartment, so to speak, while I wasn't there or arranging it how they wanted it to be. Things were out of place. I started to become concerned. The unusual activity continued for weeks until one morning. I was just cleaning up, milling around the attic, and I heard a man's voice, a deep, low voice, screaming at the top of his lungs, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you! I had a couple of knives laying around that I still had from the military, and I just picked it up and ran down the steps because I thought somebody was attacking Heidi. <laughs> After months of torment by the mysterious presence in the attic, David thought his roommate was under attack. I had a couple of knives laying around that I still had from the military, and I just picked it up and ran down the steps because I thought somebody was attacking Heidi. I could hear David running down the stairs from the attic, and he was just in a panic and he had a huge knife in his hand. And he said, did you just get home? And I said, yeah. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes, why, what's wrong? Why do you have a knife in your hand? And he said, you're gonna think I'm crazy. Right before I got home, he heard what sounded like someone beating me up. The shocker set in, there's nobody there. He instantly felt fear. He knew something wasn't right. A spirit is able to mimic the sounds of someone screaming. It is so close that we often get confused when we hear it. That could be a sure sign that the house is haunted. It's the presence of that entity that you may be feeling. That's the point where I started to think, oh boy, what did I move into? David moved out a few weeks after that incident. I didn't want him to move. The threatening activity in the house continued to dominate Heidi's life. And soon, her new boyfriend, Scott, would experience the torment, too. On our first date, I just told Scott all about everything that was going on, and he thought it was pretty interesting. I'm like, for me to believe you, you know, I want to see something, I want to hear something. I said, every night at 11 o'clock, you're going to start hearing things in my apartment. We had the TV on, and we were talking, and it was around 11 o'clock. And all of a sudden, he heard the noises. And these noises are loud enough to drown out our conversation and the television. Of course, my reaction to this noise was immediate, like, well, who is up there? He insisted on going up in the attic. It's like I'm not believing anything yet, but these noises are for real. I went up there and looked around, and it kind of started to freak me out a little bit. There's nothing in this attic. Nothing. Nothing to explain these noises. The mysterious noises grew even more intense. 
when he would stay overnight, you would hear banging on the attic door. The first time that I truly got scared, and something pounded on that attic door, and it wasn't a light knock. This was a heavy bam, bam, bam. Uh, yeah, I, I was scared. I jumped and I ran. Legitimately, I pretty much lost it. Nothing could have prepared Heidi or David for what was to happen next. There was a time that I was staying over and we had gone to sleep. And then Heidi sat up straight in bed, just sat straight up. Yes, okay. And I remember seeing her and she was going like this and she was speaking, yes, okay, okay, yes, okay. Yes. Okay. Babe, is everything okay? Yes. Okay. And then she walks out of the room. Heidi seemed to be under the influence of something beyond her control. She grabbed the lipstick and wrote scripture on the mirror. Psalm 93, when my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at my presence. Put the lipstick down, went straight back to bed and laid right back down. Right back into a deep sleep was very disturbing. I'll never forget it. I don't have any recollection of that at all. Not at all. I wasn't familiar with the Bible and the fact that I did something legit on the mirror, that frightened me. I, I think that something was trying to get control of me. That's what really scared me. When a spirit possesses somebody, their ultimate goal is to become human again, or human-like again, to try and attain that awareness in the physical world, to get that acknowledgement that they still exist. And they'll do pretty much anything they can to whoever they can. And a lot of times, those individuals suffer in the end. It was just too much. It got to the point where every time we entered the house, daylight or nighttime, something was going on. This is not how you live. This is not normal. We gotta get out of here. I really didn't have a choice between everybody being so scared and becoming so, so frightened. It just, it was time to move and pray because you don't know what's gonna happen the next day. Terrified, Heidi and her family vacated the premises, leaving the house and the spirit behind for good.